This is Audible. Harper Audio presents A Wild Pursuit by Eloisa James. Eighteen, in which curiosity runs rampant. Rhys Holland, Al Godwin, was in a pisser of a mood, as his butler put it below stairs. Got some sort of note from his wife, he did, Leek confirmed. Rosie, the downstairs maid and Leek's niece, gasped. I saw pantomime on my last half day, where the husband poisoned a love letter, and when his wife kissed it, she died. Maybe the countess saw the pantomime as well, and she's poisoned him. He deserves it, then, grunted Leek. He found Earl Godwin difficult to work for, and he didn't like the irregularity of the household. On the one hand, his master was an earl, and that was good. On the other hand, the man had a dastardly temper, not to mention the fact that his fancy piece was living in the countess's quarters. And there's something to clean up there as well, so you'd better get to it. Don't tell me he spilled coffee and all them papers again, Rosie said, scowling. I'm finding another position. If he doesn't pick up those papers, how can I clean with that much muck about my ankles? Don't you touch his papers, Leek said. It's worth your life. Anyhow, it's not coffee this time. Twas a vase of flowers the strumpet was foolish enough to put on his piano. It's a wicked temper he has, Rosie said with relish. How the strumpet puts up with it, I don't know. The strumpet was Alina McKenna, erstwhile opera singer, and inner Maratha of the bad-tempered Earl. The term strumpet wasn't truly pejorative. Both Leek and his niece rather liked Lena, as she called herself. Not that one could truly like a woman of that type, of course, but she wasn't as hard to work for as a great many more virtuous ladies, and Leek in particular knew that well enough. He shrugged. Thank the Lord the master's taken himself off, at least. Where'd he go? How could I know? Something in response to that letter from his wife, I've no doubt. Time for you to go about your duties, Rosie, before the strumpet makes her way home. The only reason Rosie's mum allowed her to work in such a house of ill repute was due to her uncle's presence. He took his responsibilities seriously and did his best to arrange her duties so that she rarely encountered one of the inhabitants of the house. I'd best go clean the sitting room then, Rosie said. It was a rare moment when the master wasn't in there, pounding on one of them three pianos he had, and now there was likely water all over the floor. A moment later she flew back downstairs, finding her uncle polishing silver. I found the note, she said, the note from his wife. He'd crumpled it up and left it right there on the piano. She stuck out her hand. Leek hesitated. Go on, Uncle John. You've simply got to read it. You know you do. I oughtn't to. Mum will just murder you if you don't, Rosie said with relish. And that was true enough. Rosie's poor mum, Leek's only sister, was stuck in the house caring for Rosie's little sisters. She lived for stories about the goings-on at the Earl's house that Leek and Rosie brought from the great house. That and the discarded gossip papers that the strumpet read and threw to the side. Leek passed his lips to indicate disapproval, and then flattened the piece of paper. It's from the Countess, all right, he confirmed. Looks like she's staying in Wiltshire somewhere. He peered at the direction. Can't really make it out. Perhaps Shambly House? That can't be right. Never mind where she is, Rosie said dancing with impatience. What did she say? Where's he gone to, then? Reese, Leek read. I've contracted pleurisy. If you wish to see me alive, please come at your earliest convenience. Rosie gasped. No. Leek was reading it again. That's what it says, all right. I'm thinking it's a bit odd. What is pleurisy, anyhow? Likely some awful, awful disease, Rosie said, clasping her hands. Oh, the poor Countess. I only hope she's not deformed by it.
You've never met her. Are you crying? For Rosie was wiping away tears. It's just so sad. Here she's probably been pining away for her husband and longing for him to come back to her. And now it's too, too late. Use your head, girl. If you were the owl's wife, would you be pining for him to return? Rosie hesitated. He's very handsome. Her uncle snorted. Like a wild boar is handsome, maybe. Face facts, Rosie. You wouldn't like to be married to the man, would you? Well, of course not. He's awfully old, and so messy, too. The Countess was better off without him. Funny, though, about that pleurisy. Pleurisy. What is pleurisy? Mum would know, Rosie said. Neither of us has a half day for another fortnight, her uncle said dismissively. But you could go over this afternoon, uncle, Rosie pleaded. You know you could. The master's gone to Wiltshire to his wife's deathbed. Her eyes were huge with excitement. Leek hesitated and looked at the paper. That's our own mistress dying. We must needs know why. What if people ask? I don't see what difference it makes. If she dies, the only thing we need are blacks. That is, if the master even sees fit to go into blacks for her death. Mayhap he and the strumpet will carry on just as usual. Oh, no, they wouldn't. Rosie clasped her hands again. Perhaps this will be enough to reform him. He'll... You're dreaming, lass. Now up you go to the sitting room, and I'll see how I do with the polishing. If I can finish this lot, I'll nip over to your mother's. It wasn't until that evening that Rosie and her uncle met up again. Theirs was a small household, due to a combination of the Earl's unconventional habits and the reluctance of decent servants to stay in a house of iniquity. Supper in the servants' dining room was merely cook, Rosie, uncle, and three footmen, not one of whom was quite as intelligent as he might have been. The scullery girl and shoe black ate in the kitchen. Rosie had filled Cook in on all the details of the afternoon before Leek made his way to the head of the table. Rosie waited while he said a brief grace and then burst out. What is it, uncle? What is pleurisy? Did mum know? Your mum is a keen woman, Leek said, taking some roast beef from the plate handed him by James, the third footman. Tuck your hand under the plate, James. You don't want us to have to stare at your fingers, do you? Put us right off our food, it would. James curled his fingers under the plate, and Leek nodded at him. She did know what pleurisy was, and that's a fact. I thought pleurisy was some sort of thing children caught, Cook said. Cook was a sturdy woman with bright red cheeks and a generous smile, who'd once cooked for the Prince of Wales and never forgot it. She was a genius in the kitchen, or so the prince had said. Earl Godwin had to pay her one hundred guineas a year to keep her in his house. That's right, Leek said, nodding. You're another shrewd one, just like Rosie's mum. It's a disease children catch. In fact, my sister had never heard of an adult with it. But the Countess isn't a child, Rosie said, perplexed. I do know someone who caught measles, and it killed him, Cook said. Mr. Leek, what do you think of this lamb pie? Frustrated by the complete lack of visitors to the house, Cook had taken to serving up dishes for the staff, as if Prinny himself were expected to sit down with them. Have to keep my hand in, don't I? Or so she justified it. And it wasn't as if the master noticed anything wrong with the household bills. Rich as Croesus he was. I'm liking it, Leek said, chewing with proper gravity. There's just a touch of allspice, is it? Correct, said the cook. I like a man with a knowing mouth, that I do. She beamed at him and then turned to Rosie. People die in the strangest ways. There's no telling what might happen to a soul. Why, I just heard the other day that a man was riding his horse across the moors, right in the daylight, mind, and—
19. Yours to woo. It took two days, two whole days, for Esme's heart to form a hard little shell that stopped her from thinking about the Marquis. He was gone. That story was finished. True, his mother was still in the house, sparring with Arabella, and occasionally flinging an insult at Esme, but her presence was irrelevant. Sebastian was gone, as Miles had gone, and as men always went. She decided to stop thinking about him, forever. Of course, that didn't stop her from waking at the first light of dawn and brooding. It's a very good thing that Sebastian took himself off to France, Esme told herself, because I was in danger of believing his protestations and vows of love. Oh, fool I, he didn't love me enough to defy me when I told him to leave. He just left, probably thinking she'd be waiting when he returned from a leisurely exploration of French vineyards. Why on earth cry for such a man? A potent, useful rage was filling the empty spaces in her heart. It was his fault that she was forced to entertain his mother. And it was his fault that she was carrying an elephantine child. Never mind the irrationality of that. And it was his fault that she was husbandless and in the awkward position of not knowing who'd fathered her own child. Altogether, her situation was all his fault— and the only pity was that he was no longer there so she could blister his ears with the truth of it. And if Sebastian were standing in my bedroom at this very moment, Esme thought, I would tell him that his attempt to imprint himself on my skin didn't work, that the only result of his exertions was an aching back and a desire to never see him again. She set her jaw to stop hot tears from running down her cheeks. Of course, if his memories of that night were anything like hers, Sebastian might have trouble believing her. The solution would be to flirt madly in front of him. Perhaps do more than flirt. Why should he think, as he clearly did, that she was some sort of light skirt who would allow him to waltz in and out of her bedchamber at will? Marriage would be the perfect solution especially if she married long before he wandered back from France and thought to pick up where he left off. Perhaps she would marry Fairfax Lacey, since her aunt had been kind enough to bring him to the house for precisely that purpose. Helene wasn't acting at all lover-like toward Fairfax Lacey, and Esme had seen enough surreptitious lovers to recognize the signs. Or the lack thereof— so there was nothing, nothing, to prevent her from taking such an eligible husband. Moreover, her mother would appreciate her marriage. Esme suspected that the only way on earth Fanny would receive her in public again would be if Esme remarried a man of the highest character. Sebastian certainly wasn't in that category. Not that she ever considered marrying him. Fairfax Lacey had a reputation for high moral fibre, and he was handsome too, in a sort of well-bred fashion. He didn't have Sebastian's raw beauty, but Fairfax Lacey would make a perfect husband, a perfect, respectable husband, whom her mother would adore. He would never leave her on the verge of giving birth. That was the crux of it. Sebastian didn't seem to realize how frightening it was to give birth. He just didn't care enough to be frightened for her. Esme cried over that for a while, and then, infuriatingly, found herself crying over her mother's similar lack of concern. Nobody cares, Esme thought savagely, conveniently forgetting Arabella and Helene. Not Sebastian, not Miles, not her own mother. She didn't make it downstairs for luncheon, having dissolved into a humiliating, childish pit of despair. But by late afternoon, the hard little shell was back in place. Of course she wouldn't die in childbirth. She would be just fine. There was nothing she could do about the fact that Sebastian didn't love her as much as she wished. Better to forget it, push that fact away, not think about it. She rang her bell, 
and asked Jeanie to prepare yet another cucumber poultice for her eyes. By the time Esme descended the stairs in the evening, she'd managed to channel an ocean's worth of rage and grief into one question. Was Stephen Fairfax Lacey indeed appropriate husband material? She didn't think he had Sebastian's ability to overlook her belly. He was unlikely to be attracted to her in her condition. But she could certainly make up her mind whether he was suitable for a life's worth of dinner conversations. And so it was that Stephen Fairfax Lacey, who strode into the dining room, hoping against all hopes that a certain lady had decided to woo him, bound to his utter surprise that his hostess appeared to have made that decision instead. And Lady Rawlings, nine months with child or not, was a formidable wooer. Naturally, she was seated at the head of the table, but she placed him to her right. And Stephen had no sooner seated himself than Lady Rawlings leaned toward him with a very marked kind of attention. There was a sleepy smile in her eyes that would make any man under the age of seventy think of bed, nay, dream of bed. Yet it wasn't until Lady Beatrix Lennox was ushered into a seat across from him that Stephen began enjoying himself. As B sat down, Esme, as she'd asked him to call her, was showing him the intricate figures on the back of her fan. And he glimpsed something in B's face, just enough to make him draw closer to Esme and bend his head over her fan. He was, after all, an old hand at campaigning. Romeo and Juliet, are they? he asked Esme, peering at the little figures painted with exquisite detail on the folds of her fan. Exactly. You see, one of Esme's curls brushed his cheek. There's Romeo below the balcony, looking up at Juliet. B, would you like to see it? The workmanship is quite elegant. The Marchioness Bonington was sitting at Stephen's right. Goodness, what a hen party! she said briskly. Why on earth didn't Arabella even out the numbers when she issued her invitations? Esme looked up, and her tone evened to a polite disinterest. I can't say, Lady Bonington. I believe that Earl Godwin will arrive tomorrow. His presence should ameliorate the situation. Humph, Lady Bonington said. The least said of that reprobate, the better. So what's on that fan you are regarding so closely, Lady Beatrix? B blinked down at the fan. Romeo and Juliet, she murmured. There was something odd happening here. She glanced across the table while pretending to examine the fan. Esme's impending child was hidden beneath the tablecloth, which meant that she looked like any other gloriously beautiful woman in London, except there were very few women who could match Esme. And to all appearances... Esme had decided to seduce Stephen Fairfax Lacey. Ha, ah, Stephen. In fact, Esme presumably had decided to follow her aunt's advice and marry, not seduce, Stephen. Of course she wasn't thinking of seduction, given her delicate condition. The realization gave Bee a most peculiar, sinking feeling. Esme's hair was caught up in a loose topknot, Fat, silky curls caressed her shoulders and cheeks. She wore a gown of French violet silk, cut very low in the bosom and very short in the sleeves. But, more importantly, she was burning with a kind of incandescent, sensual beauty. "'Romeo and Juliet, did you say?' Lady Bonington barked. "'The balcony scene,' B explained, pulling herself together and handing over the fan." She didn't want to woo Stephen. Therefore, it hardly mattered if Esme decided to do so. I've always thought it was an absurd scene. How oh, so? Stephen asked, one dark eyebrow raised. B blinked, trying to see what it was about the man that drove all the women in his vicinity to hanker after him. He was handsome, but she'd seen better. Somewhere. He was waiting for a reply, so she shrugged. Romeo stands below, wailing up at Juliet like a pining adolescent. That seems a bit harsh. He is in love. He only met the woman twenty minutes earlier, 
but you're right, he thinks he's in love. The funny part, to my mind, is when Juliet suddenly says, Do you plan to marry me, and if so, where? Esme grinned. How extraordinary! I read the play, of course, but I never realized that Juliet proposed to him. If that thy bent of love be honorable, Lee quoted, thy purpose marriage, send me word tomorrow. Juliet bluntly asks him to marry her, although he hasn't said a word on the subject previously. Esme's eyes flicked to Stephen with a meaningful laughter that made Bee's stomach twist. She was so beautiful, it was almost too much to bear. Bee could paint her cheeks the color of the rainbow, but she can never reproduce that flare of raw sensuality that Esme had just tossed in Stephen's direction. I saw a hilarious parody of the balcony scene once, Esme was saying, her voice a glorious husky alto. Oh? Stephen bent toward her, his eyes bold and appreciative. Naturally, Bee thought. Given the pick of the three women in the house, Helene, herself, and Esme, what man wouldn't choose Esme? This Juliet almost threw herself off the balcony in her eagerness to join Romeo, Esme remarked. Her eyes seemed to be speaking volumes. B considered pleading a sick stomach and leaving the table. The Marchioness Bonington had been examining the painted fan. She put it down with a little rap. That sounds very unlike Shakespeare. Do share it with us, Stephen said. If he got any closer to her shoulder, he could start chewing on her curls, B thought, just like the goat. I only remember a line or two, Esme said, and her crimson lips curled into a private smile for Stephen, so seductively potent that B felt it like a blow. Romeo stands below the balcony, bellowing at Juliet, Esme continued, and she says, Who's there? Stephen had just caught a tantalizing glimpse of Bee's eyes. She looked pained, stricken. That was too strong. He deliberately returned Esme's smoldering gaze with one of his own. And what does Romeo reply? He pitched his voice to a deep purr. Esme flashed a smile around the table. I do hope this won't embarrass any of you. I doubt it. Lady Bonington said sourly. After the astonishments of the last month, I consider myself fairly unshockable. The scene takes place in the early morning, if you remember. Juliet says, Who, Romeo? Oh, you're an early cock in truth. Who would have thought you to be so rare a stirrer? Esme said it with dulcet satisfaction. There was a moment of silence, and then Stephen roared with laughter. I'll warrant you Romeo clambered up the vine as fast as he was able. She wouldn't allow him to do so, Esme said. Her eyes were sparkling with mischief, and she had a slim hand on Stephen's arm. The next line was something like this. Nay, by my faith, I'll keep you down, for you knights are very dangerous if once you get above. Stephen laughed again and then tilted his head toward Esme and murmured something in her ear. Obviously, it was a comment meant for her alone. Likely something about getting above. Bee chewed very precisely and swallowed her beef. Perhaps Arabella would allow her to return to London on the morrow. It wasn't that she was jealous, because she wasn't. It was just that no man could resist Esme, and certainly not Stephen, who had frankly told her that he hoped to marry. Slope was bending down at Esme's shoulder, interrupting her tete-a-tete -tete with Stephen. B looked back at her beef. She liked Esme. She really did. My lady, Slope said quietly into Esme's ear. We have an unexpected guest. All right, Esme said, only half listening. She'd forgotten how much fun flirting was. She was actually enjoying herself. She hadn't thought about wretched... Wretched Sebastian for at least a half hour. Arabella was right. Stephen Fairfax Lacey was charming, and he had a ready wit. He was fairly handsome.
she'd almost decided to marry him. Of course, first she had to make certain that Helene didn't want him for herself. Slope, seeing that the unexpected guest in question had followed him into the dining room, although his mistress hadn't yet noticed, straightened and announced, The Marquis Bonington. Esme's head jerked up. There he was. No gardener ever wore a pearl-grey coat of the finest broadcloth with an elaborately tied cravat of a pale icy blue. He looked every inch a nobleman, from the top of his elegantly tousled hair to the tips of his shining hessians. There were murmurs all down the table. The scandalous Marquis had returned from the continent, or from the garden, if only they'd known. She met his eyes, and there was a flare of amusement in them that made her smouldering rage burst into flame. No doubt he thought to simply return to her bedchamber. Without giving a thought for her reputation, for her child's reputation, for her future. Ah, Bonington, his mother said. There you are. She sounded as if he'd been to a horse race rather than exiled to the continent. But he waited, as polite as ever, for his hostess's acknowledgement. Esme's hands clenched into fists. How dare he think he could simply come and go in her house, just as he had walked into her bedchamber at Lady Trubridge's house? Lord Bonington, she said, inclining her head. How can it be anything other than a pleasure to see you, after so many months? She reached over and put a hand on Stephen Fairfax Lacey's shoulder. He had broad shoulders. She was almost certain that he would be as good a lover as Sebastian. He certainly would be less exhausting. Fairfax Lacey looked up, and Esme smiled down at him brilliantly. Marquis Bonington has joined us, just at the very moment I was to make an important announcement. May I introduce my fiancé, Mr. Fairfax Lacey? There was a moment of utter silence in the dining room. Then Sebastian went into a low bow, the kind with a flourish and a good deal of gloved violence. His eyes were pitch black in the candlelight, but Esme wouldn't have been surprised if they'd burned straight through her. I seem to have arrived just in time for a celebration, he said, and the sardonic note in his voice was clear for all to hear. Esme swallowed and tightened her hand on her new fiancé's shoulder. She had always been impetuous, but this was, without a doubt, her wildest moment yet. What a delightful surprise, the Marchioness Bonington crowed. Obviously, she saw her son's freedom within reach. Yes, indeed, Helen chimed in, giving Esme a darkling look that said, clear as day, I have use for that man, remember? Even little Bee seemed shaken, although she said nothing. And to Esme's endless relief, her brand new fiancé also refrained from expressing his surprise. 20. Twenty minutes later, privacy at last. You needn't really marry me. After all, it's not as if you asked me. My thought precisely. In fact, no one need even know that we were engaged. We are not engaged. Would you mind terribly if we just pretended that we are? Stephen Fairfax Lacey was perplexed. Even after some twenty years of being an eligible bachelor, he seemed to have reached an unexpected peak of desirability. Lady Rawlings. Oh, please, you must call me Esme. After all, we're... Engaged, he put in. He couldn't help smiling a little. In that case, you must call me Stephen. Thank you, Esme said, with evident relief. But I insist, Esme, that you tell me why we are engaged. Esme fidgeted and rearranged her fingers. Stephen had seen that look before many times. It was the look that a member of Parliament wore, who had been courted away by the other party, who had to disclose that he'd already given a crucial vote away. Esme? Perhaps you are aware that Marquis Bonington and I 
Ah. She looked agonized, so Stephen came to her rescue. Of course, I am aware that you had an unpleasant experience at Lady Troubridge's house party last year, during which your husband, unfortunately, suffered a spasm and died. Esme nodded. You put it remarkably concisely. Stephen waited. Esme looked at him and then away again. I was having an affair with him, with the Marquis, she clarified. Stephen thought for a second. In that case, I believe I understand why the Marquis has returned from the continent. He has just discovered that you are carrying a child. He wishes to compensate for what happened last summer. Marquis Bonington believes that marrying me will ameliorate his guilt. Guilt is an interesting concept, Stephen said. I wish I could induce guilt in more of the men I deal with on a regular basis. But I don't wish to marry a man who seeks to assuage his guilt. And when I saw him, I panicked. Stephen was beginning to enjoy himself. While he had never begged for any woman's attentions, they had never stood in line and begged for his, either. I gather I appeared to be a useful solution to your problem, he suggested. I'm truly sorry to have used you so, but would you greatly dislike pretending to be my fiancé, merely until Marquis Bonington returns to the continent? I'm certain we can arrange it so that no one outside this small party discovers our brief engagement. His mother is, naturally enough, anxious to turn his thoughts in another direction. Perhaps she will manage to convince him to leave by tomorrow morning. He need feel no further guilt when he thinks I am marrying such an estimable man as yourself. I bow to your greater knowledge of Marquis Bonington. I must say that I would not have judged him as one to easily give up. I would describe him along the lines of a terrier with a bone. I don't want to be that bone, Esme said despairingly. I know I'm not looking my best, and I'm not a very appealing fiancé under the circumstances, but if you would play a devoted future spouse in front of the Marquis, I would be endlessly grateful. His laughter echoed around the room. Stephen stood up and kissed Esme's hand, and then helped her to her feet. Since you are my future wife, perhaps I could take the liberty of telling you that you look exhausted. May I escort you upstairs? Oh, thank you, Esme said, taking his arm. They encountered no one, and Stephen saw his presumed wife into her chamber with an unmistakable sense of relief. In fact, he actually leaned his head back against the corridor wall, closed his eyes, and wondered if he'd been caught in a dream. It seemed impossible that he, a staid, proper, boring member of the House of Commons, was pretending not only to be carrying on a flagrant affair for the benefit of one woman's husband, but also to be passionately in love with another woman, a drama to be played out before her lover. He had a rustle of silk. Of course it was B. She seemed to be everywhere, with her painted eyebrows and her red mouth. And the rest of her, those far too intelligent eyes, curved little body and sultry looks. Time for bed, he said and he let a deliberately suggestive tone slide into his voice like cream. Good night, Mr. Fairfax Lacey. She appeared to be walking toward her chamber. He stretched his leg out so that she would have to step ungracefully across him to continue down the corridor. Sir, she asked. The very tone of her voice had changed. Where was the impudent suggestion? Where were the smouldering looks that she practiced on him so regularly? Because he knew quite well that she didn't feel desire, she issued such invitations as a matter of course. Will you let me pass, please? She was getting nettled now. But Stephen was surrounded by women begging him to pretend to be their lover. What he wanted was just one truthful request, and the fact she'd refused to woo him for two days bothered him more than it should. I should like to read more of that poetry you brought with you, he said. I can lend you the book, if you wish, or you can find it yourself. I left it in the library, since it seems to become an object of curiosity for all.
Her eyes were shadowed, and he couldn't read them. He reached out and slipped his hand under her elbow. God, but he was consumed with lust. Even the sleekness of the bare skin of her arm made him leap to attention. She shook her head, frowning. I think not, Mr. Fairfax Lacey. A further introduction to poetry, he said, his voice as persuasive as he could make it. I gather you wish me to accompany you to the library. He nodded, not that he'd actually thought it out. Why? She stared at him, and for once her eyes were neither sultry nor inviting, nor even particularly friendly. You, a newly engaged man, must have many places to be. Because, he said through clenched teeth, because of this. He folded her into his arms, and his whole body throbbed with gratitude. She smelled like an exotic perfume tonight, some thick, heavy flower of the Nile. He spread his fingers through her hair, cupping the back of her head, and pulling it gently back so he could reach her lips. He could see the perfect oval of her cheek in the dim light. He could see the darker, glowing red of her lips. Black lashes fringed her eyes. But none of it mattered, because he couldn't see those eyes well enough to read them. Did she feel even a fraction of the desire that pulsed through his body? Was she almost trembling? Or was this all the fantasy of an aging man, caught off guard by a young woman's seductive beauty, believing... He refused to think too hard. Instead, he pulled her head closer to his, closed his mouth on hers, plunging inside. He never kissed like this. He prided himself on consummate expertise, on dancing over a woman's lips, coaxing her to give him her inner sweetness, to reward him with her lips, her mouth. It was all a foretaste of his future treatment of her body. He was a thoughtful lover, cherishing his partner's pleasure as his own. Not with B. His heartbeat pounded with the same rhythm as his tongue. As for technique, what technique? It was all he could do to stay upright, to control his hunger. Yet she melted in his arms with a fervor he had never awoken in a lover before. If he was rudely plundering her mouth, she certainly wasn't fainting at the intrusion. Her arms were around his neck, and she was... She was offering herself. Yet after a second, she stepped back in a swish of silk, and he released her. Where are you going? She smiled over her shoulder, and it was the same smile Cleopatra gave Antony. Antony had no hope of escaping. Why should he? I am not interested in wooing you, Mr. Fairfax Lacey, as I think I've made clear. And I might add that my lack of interest is all the greater, since you are now engaged to marry. I'm... But he stopped before he said not. Instead, he smiled at her, an imitation of all those smiles she gave him, a sexy dance in his eyes. Too much competition, he asked softly. V paused and turned her nose in the air. I don't compete. He leaned back against the wall, and it was happening again. Around B and only around her, he felt in his body, if only in fragile control of it. He deliberately spread his legs. They felt muscle-hard, as did other parts of his body. Her eyes widened slightly. In one stride, he had her pinned against the opposite wall. God, he loved the fact that she was tall enough for him— so many women felt like fragile little dolls in his arms. B, he growled, looking down at her. Mr. Fairfax Lacey, she said pertly, but she didn't try to move away, not even when he brought his mouth down on hers, without apology, without warning, without pleading. Instead, she just gasped and shuddered in his arms as his mouth drank from hers, came to her again and again with savage tenderness. He kissed her until he knew she couldn't pull away and give him that Cleopatra smile.
Gone was the seasoned beauty, wise in the ways of the world, and quick with her seductive invitations. If he didn't know better, he'd have said she was a pure innocent. It was in her eyes, in the way she trembled in his arms, in the way she clutched his shoulders. I do wish you'd change your mind, he said. His voice didn't come out that siren call of the polished politician. No, it sounded deep, dangerous. The voice of a man who would seduce a young, unmarried girl, who instructed her to woo him. The kind of man who had a mistress and a fiancé, and wanted yet a third woman. Stephen reveled in it. He ran a slow hand down her side, and then swiftly, before he or she could think better, slid that hand around her sweet little bottom and pulled her hard against his legs. She gasped, and her arms spun tighter around his neck. For one blissful second he pressed her into the wall, letting her know just how primitive their joining would be. Then he snapped back and dropped his arms. Because should you decide to compete, he said, I think you would find it worth your while. His smile was wild and tender and utterly unpolished. It was all B could do not to gasp, yes, plead, beg, woo, whatever he wanted. Her body was throbbing, liquid with desire, beating through her legs. Even her toes tingled. He wasn't like the gentleman she'd toyed with in the past. He was a man. More, he was a dangerous man, the sort of man who didn't think twice about taking on a fiancé and a mistress in the same week. What would she be? The third woman? She couldn't drag her eyes off him, though, off his broad shoulders and off those wicked, wicked laughing eyes. How had she ever thought he was proper? He was some sort of a satyr. She licked her lips and watched his eyes narrow. If he reached for her again, she would do whatever it was he wanted, the wooing he demanded. How humiliating! If she did that, begged him in so many words, there would be no escape from all the words her father flung at her, no escape in her own mind. They all crowded together, wanton, short-heeled, soiled, doxy. No. B swallowed hard, pushed herself from the wall, and started down the corridor without a backward glance. She couldn't look back. 21. In which a Marquis pays a call on a lady. As Esme prepared for bed, she wondered exactly how much time she had to herself before Sebastian Bonington joined her. Because he would— no matter how many future husbands she pretended to have. She didn't have to wait long. She was barely tucked into bed, with Jeannie sent back to the nether regions of the house, when her door opened. Esme was propped up against the pillows, wide awake. She was unable to sleep very much these days. Her back and her belly seemed to be competing to make her uncomfortable. Sure enough, he had that disapproving look that he always used to have— back when she was married to Miles and flirting with Bernie Burdett. Esme frowned. She never liked it when he played the Holy Willy then, and she didn't appreciate it now, either. What are you doing in my room? she demanded. He walked slowly over to the bed. Thinking about corporal punishment, he said, staring down at her. Hell-born brat! I can't leave you alone for two days without finding you've attached a male to your skirts. Esme held on to her anger. She was the angry one. He had left her when she was on the verge of having a child. But he did come back, a little voice reminded her. I could have died while you were gone, she said. Her voice sounded petulant and childish. In childbirth, she qualified. I talked to your midwife before I left, and she had no expectations that she would give birth before a week at least, he said, still staring down at her. There was something in his eyes that made her feel uncomfortable, as if she'd disappointed him.
Midwives don't know everything, she said shrilly. He folded his arms across his chest. I sent my mother to look after you. Your mother, she gasped. Your mother is here to make certain that I don't marry you. I told her I was a gardener here because I knew she wouldn't be able to resist calling on you. I had to visit my estate, Esme. I've done as much work as I could from afar, but I needed to be there, if only for a day. He ran a hand through his hair. I stayed up two nights so I could return to you as soon as possible. But it seems you had no trouble occupying yourself. Esme shot him a swift glance. Sure enough, there were weary circles under his eyes, and a bleak note in his voice that clutched her heart. I thought you'd left me, she said, pleating the linen sheet with her fingers. That you... But I'd obeyed you, he lifted her chin. Because you did tell me, in no uncertain terms, that you never wanted to see me again, Esme, that I would ruin your reputation. And so you will, Esme managed. Not with my mother here, he said. There was nothing she could say to that. Of course he was right. The very presence of the formidable Marchioness Bonington would stop all gossip about his presence on her estate. But I see I didn't need to worry, he said ironically. It seems you made other plans for the protection of your name. I can't marry you, Sebastian, she said in a low voice. I want respectability. Our marriage would be the greatest scandal to reach the Ton in years. Your mother said that, and she's right. I don't want to be infamous Esme any more. Please understand. I understand, all right, he said. That was definitely disappointment in his voice. Esme swallowed hard. Her back was aching, and he was angry at her. And he was right. She shouldn't have made that pretense of an engagement with Fairfax Lacey. Suddenly, he pushed her over a few inches and sat down on the bed. Back hurting. And at her nod, he said, Roll over. Esme rolled to the right, and those big hands started rubbing her neck and shoulders. The relief was so great that she literally forgot everything else for a few moments. Sebastian had miraculous hands. Somehow, he was ironing away all the pain that crouched in her spine. A half hour later, she rolled back, propped herself up against the pillow, and eyed Sebastian. He had to leave her bedchamber. Women in confinement did not entertain gentlemen to whom they were not married. But she had to try to explain her own stupidities first. I thought to marry Mr. Fairfax Lacey because... He interrupted her. Well, are you sure that you remembered to warn poor Mr. Fairfax Lacey of his impending marriage? Of course, I would never suggest that he looked disagreeably surprised. But he seemed to me disagreeably surprised. Esme raised her chin. He was merely startled by my public announcement. We had thought to wait until after the child's birth. Sebastian didn't seem angry any more. I haven't even said hello to that child yet. He spread his hands on the soft cambric of a night rail. He's all lumps and bumps. I don't think there's any room in there. The midwife told me today that he is, well, ready, Esme said. She felt a pulse of worry. The child seemed impossibly large to her. But Sebastian looked up and grinned. Don't worry, he'll slip out like a greased pig. That is so vulgar, Esme scolded. Look at this, he said, disregarding her. If I push on his little foot, he pushes back. They watched for a second and then burst into laughter. Oh, no, Esme said, clapping a hand over her mouth. My goodness, I hope no one heard that. They'll think you're entertaining your future husband, Sebastian said, shrugging a bit. Although no one here would give a bean who you were entertaining. I have to say, Esme, I've heard about your aunt's house parties for years, but this one takes the cake.
Who's that extraordinarily luxurious looking girl with all the paint on her face? Lady Beatrix Lennox, Esme said. And don't say anything cruel about her, because I like her hugely. The scandalous one, daughter of the Duke of Wintersall. Exactly. Sebastian gave a little whistle. Quite a gathering. You were certainly right when you thought it might endanger your reputation. My aunt invited a few of her friends without my knowledge, and one thing led to another. And what about you? If anyone finds out you've returned from France and are attending this gathering, the ton will dine out on it for days. Not with my mother here. And I don't give a hang if they do, Sebastian said, rubbing her tummy all over. Face it, sweetheart. You're not made for the respectable life. You collect scandals the way other women collect china. I have some trouble envisioning you as a dutiful wife of a party member. He leaned over, his face just an inch from hers. A dark blonde curl fell over his forehead. She could smell him, all that potent, clean-smelling male body. What are you doing in my bedroom? Esme asked, quite annoyed to find that her voice was breathless. Paying a respectable visit to my future wife. His eyes were the blue of a mountain lake. Except no mountain lake ever had that smoky look, way down deep, that made her want to squirm. Surely you aren't expecting your estimable fiancé to visit your chambers this evening. Since I intend to be your next fiancé, I've every right to be her. Besides, I feel a certain discontent with my performance. I must not have imprinted myself on your skin, given that you leaped directly into another man's embrace. She couldn't squirm because he was hovering over her. Certainly not, she said, pulling herself together. Return to your own room, if you'd be so kind. I'm sure you did a very good job of... of imprinting yourself on my skin. More than adequate. Now, I'd like to ask you to leave. She put her palms on his chest to push him away. He was warm and big, and somehow her palms just stuck and forgot to shove him off the bed. He lowered his head and just kissed the top of her ear. I'd rather stay with you. His lips slid to her mouth. He tasted of cognac and Sebastian. Just a kiss, Esme told herself, as his tongue touched hers. She couldn't help it. Her mouth opened with a gasp. He tasted so good, so male, so comforting and intoxicating, all at once. He moved so they were lying side by side. We're not going to make love again, she managed to say. My back hurt all day after you left. I'm sorry about that. And he actually sounded sorry. Except he had his hands under her night rail, and that wasn't her back he was stroking. Esme gave up. Her body melted the moment his fingers slid up her thighs. So she buried her hands in his hair and let herself stroke circles down his neck with her tongue. He pushed her leg up to give him better access, and she didn't protest, just jerked at his shirt so that he reared back and stripped it off, giving her all that honey-sweet skin to kiss and lick and touch. They didn't say much for a while, there being no need for speech. Esme was gasping and moaning, and when she absolutely had to make a point, her voice came out in a husky mixture of a moan and a squeak. Sebastian, please! We can't, he said. You're back. His voice sounded strangled, deep and hungry. He repeated what he was doing, and Esme clutched him feverishly. I don't care about my back. But he knew her. He knew her body. He knew everything. She couldn't stop now, not when he was stroking her like that, hands so smooth and rough at once. It took his mouth to stop the scream that tore from her chest. The shame of it, Esme realized in the early dawn, was that she'd promptly fallen asleep in his arms,
having given no thought to his pleasure. When was the last time she'd slept straight through the night, without waking over and over, because her back hurt? His tousled hair was the colour of guinea coins. He was lying on his stomach, and the sheet was pulled to his mid-back. All Esme could see was a flare of his shoulders. The babe seemed to be asleep. Sebastian was definitely asleep. As she watched, he gave a little humph, almost a snore, and lapsed into deep breathing. He'd stayed up at night so that he could come back to her. She had to push down the fierce joy she felt. Respectable widows didn't feel this sort of thing. It was too much temptation for any woman to endure, even a widow bent on the respectable life. She scooted the linen sheet down onto his legs. His back curved down to a sweet spot with two dimples and that little brown mark that wasn't hereditary, according to his mother. It looked like a small star. She would have leaned down to kiss it, but an awfully large stomach was in the way. So she contented herself with finger kisses, walking her way over all those muscles, circling his dimples, climbing back up that taut pair of buttocks. He shifted under her fingers and groaned a little in his sleep. Sebastian made her feel more sensual than she ever had in bed with a man, as if her mere touch were enough. Before, it always seemed that men were interested in her breasts, in her legs, in all the parts of her that she'd been born with, not in the way she touched or kissed, not in what she thought they ought to do next. The very thought had her heart racing. She spread her hand and cupped one of his muscled buttocks. Suddenly he made a noise in his throat and turned onto his back. Her fingers slid away and ended up on his stomach. He was still sleeping, lashes dark against his cheek. It was almost frightening how much she desired him. A lady shouldn't feel such a dark, pounding wave of lust. That was certain. What she should have done was wake this slumbering god and sent him on his way. Because she needed him to scoop up his terrible mamma and leave her house, so that she could have her baby and begin her life again. Despite herself, her fingers trailed downwards. He was magnificent. When she looked up, he was looking at her. And he didn't seem to be sleepy any more. 22. The Infernal Circle When Dante was writing The Inferno, making up all those circles of hellish occupants, the gluttons, the adulterers, the... the whatevers, he should have included the sewing circle. To Esme's mind, they deserved a circle all their own. Admittedly, her memory of the Inferno was rather foggy, but weren't the gluttons sitting around eating and eating as punishment for a life of overly rich dining? In Esme's version of hell, overly righteous women would have to sit on small, upright chairs and sew seam after seam in coarse white cotton, while Mrs. Cable read improving literature aloud. They had been sewing for about fifteen minutes, when Mrs. Barrett de Croc smiled genially at Esme and said, "'That child of yours won't want to wait much longer.' Esme looked down at her vast expanse of stomach, suppressing a wince as a foot made its presence known just under her ribs. "'The midwife has suggested that it's only a matter of a few days.' They don't know everything, Lady Winifred said comfortably, putting down her sheet. Esme had noticed that everyone except Mrs. Cable took every opportunity to stop sewing. The midwife for my first child told me every day for a month that today was the day, Lady Winifred continued. Consequently, I refused to actually believe that I was in labour when the time came. Is Lady Withers going to join us today, my dear? Arabella is such an amusing woman, and so brave. I know the loss of three husbands has been a true source of grief in her life, but she never seems disheartened, Mrs. Cable said very frostily. I doubt that Lady Withers has risen at this hour.
but Arabella pranced through the door at that very moment, blowing kisses in every direction. Ladies, she announced, I come to you on an errand of mercy. Arabella took a few moments to seat herself. She was wearing a morning dress of celestial blue muslin, which opened down the front and pulled back to reveal an underskirt of sprigged muslin. She looked charming, effortlessly elegant, and, to Esme's eyes, unmistakably mischievous. "'Surely you heard who arrived at this house last evening,' she announced, once she had arranged her gown to her satisfaction. Even Mrs. Cable looked up from her seam. "'The most disreputable man in all England,' Arabella trumpeted. Esme groaned inwardly. "'The Duke of York!' Lady Henrietta exclaimed. "'No, no, slightly lower in rank,' Arabella said, obviously enjoying herself hugely. "'It seems quite overheated in the morning room, Esme, my dear. Perhaps that fire is too high for the season.' She took out a small blue fan and began fanning herself. "'I'm having trouble keeping myself on the cool side as well,' Lady Winifred said, eyeing the fan. "'We've entered that time of life, I suppose.' Arabella dropped the fan as if it had bitten her. "'Who is it?' Mrs. Barrett Strucrock said eagerly. "'Who arrived last night?' "'Bonnington,' Arabella said after a magnificent pause. "'Has returned.' "'It was a good line.' and if it weren't for the fact that Esme's own life was being paraded before the gossips, she would have applauded Arabella's dramatic turn of phrase. There was a collective intake of breath. Lady Winifred was obviously amused. Mrs. Barrett de Croc was shocked. Mrs. Cable was so horrified that she covered her face with her hands, as if she'd been faced with a devil himself. "'He's reformed!' Arabella dropped into the silence that followed. I doubt that very much, snapped Mrs. Cable, seemingly unable to contain herself. Astounding, yet true. Arabella picked up her fan again and glanced significantly at the ladies. He's come back to England to prostrate himself at my niece's feet. As well he might, Mrs. Barrett de Croc said rather sourly. After all, he did— but her voice trailed off when she realized that mentioning the fact that Esme's husband had died grappling with her latest guest wasn't entirely well-mannered. Esme looked down at her sheet and very precisely put another crooked stitch into the hem. That foot was still in her ribs. Oddly enough, she didn't feel the pinched sensation that she usually got at the very mention of Miles. Poor Miles! She placed another stitch. Dear Miles, prostrate himself, Arabella said with pleasure. As you say, Mrs. Barrett de Croc, Bonington is at least partially responsible for the death of poor Lord Rawlings, although his doctors had said that Esme's late husband was liable to die at any moment. I lost a husband to a weak heart myself. It's a terrible circumstance. At any rate, Marquis Bonington is overcome with contrition, quite beside himself. Everyone looked at Esme, so she tried to look like a grieving widow. Far be it from her to diminish Arabella's performance. Why was it that whenever she was supposed to look miserable, she felt cheerful? The Marquis has certainly expressed his repentance, she agreed, placing another stitch so as to avoid Mrs. Cable's piercing glance. Really, sewing had its uses. How can Bonnington possibly think to alleviate Lady Rawlings' situation? Mrs. Cable demanded. What's done is done. The man should stay on the continent, where he is less likely to corrupt others. Unless he's asked for her hand in marriage, Lady Winifred said, giving Esme a shrewd look. A ah, revolting proposition, Mrs. Cable said tightly. Lady Rawlings is not even out of a full year of mourning. Only think of the scandal. Oh, one can always think of the scandal, Lady Winifred said. But it's so seldom worth the effort. 
The Marquis, after all, has a very fine estate. My thought precisely, Arabella said, beaming. I do believe the man is genuinely overcome by penitence. He wishes to mitigate the evils he visited on her in any way possible. What makes you believe that his intentions are honourable? Mrs. Cable wanted to know. After his behaviour last summer. Esme felt a pang of guilt. She was hardly innocent when it came to the loss of Sebastian's sterling reputation, since he had fabricated a story of depravity in order to protect her reputation. His mother accompanied him to this house, which seems to bode well for his sincerity, she noted. The Marchioness Bonington is also staying with us. My goodness, Lady Winifred exclaimed. If Bonington persuaded his mother to accompany him, the man must indeed be serious. Lady Bonington is as stiff-rumped a lady as I've ever met. I sincerely hope that you informed him that marriage was impossible, Mrs. Cable told Esme. Esme suddenly remembered her supposed engagement to Fairfax Lacey. There was more than one reason why marriage to Sebastian was impossible— Rather than answer, she started sewing again. After all, the man forged a marriage certificate in order to take a lady's chastity, Mrs. Cable continued. The poor Duchess of Garton might well have been taken in by his depravity if it hadn't been for the happenstance of his stumbling into your bedchamber rather than hers, and that's not to mention his hand in your husband's death. Arabella leaned forward. From the look of pure pleasure in her eyes, Esme could see her aunt had prepared herself for just this moment. A woman of mercy does not spurn a genuinely remorseful soul, Arabella intoned. By doing so, she would be responsible for any lapses in judgment that followed. No, Esme's path is clear. She must aid and succour the poor, unfortunate sinner in his moment of contrition. The devil is full of all subtlety and all mischief, Mrs. Cable snapped. Axe. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, Arabella retorted, without even pausing for breath. Proverbs. Esme bit her lip, so she wouldn't ruin the moment by laughing. Mrs. Cable was flattened, trapped between the Bible and her abhorrence of iniquitous behaviour. Lady Winifred jumped in at this point. I quite agree with you, Arabella, dearest. It takes a truly charitable heart to recognise where the path of goodness lies. Arabella was obviously trying to look as if she had a charitable heart. To Esme, it looked as if she had wind. I don't support it, Mrs. Cable snapped. The man is a poisonous influence. You'll have to watch the young women in the house very carefully, Lady Rawlings. He may besmirch them, corrupt them, deprave them. No, Esme thought ruefully. He's only interested in besmirching me. Although she wouldn't argue with the idea that Sebastian was depraved, he had no sense of propriety in bed. Esme's cheeks grew hot, at the very thought of the liberties he'd taken the previous night. She wrenched her attention back to Mrs. Cable. A man like that is more than likely to seduce the maids, she was saying. There'll be no woman in the house safe from him. Too tired, Esme thought. He's definitely too tired for the maids. Arabella giggled. It's a pity I'm too old for the man. Mrs. Cable gasped, but Lady Winifred chuckled. Handsome, isn't he? I remember seeing Bonington riding to the hounds. Last year it was, before all the scandal broke. He looked as regal as a prince. A prince in a fairy story, she clarified. Not one of our own. Everyone accepted that. The royal dukes were more easily described as fat and friendly than regal. With pressed lips, Mrs. Cable backed down. Well, he won't accept Bonington's proposal, of course, she instructed Esme. But I do acknowledge Lady Withers' point about improving his soul. It is not ours to question why the Lord places a sinner at our doorstep. We must simply endure 
while we aid in the cultivation of a better life. I must try saying that to my husband, Lady Winifred murmured to Arabella. I endure, and he never seems to cultivate. Perhaps I could bore him into virtue by reading the Bible aloud. But Mrs. Cable heard her, and the sewing circle disbanded on an acrimonious note. 23. Various Forms of Advertisement Lady Rawlings's Rose Salon I suppose your mother felt she couldn't attend you, Lady Bonington said to Esme, with her usual lack of finesse. Fanny does have strict notions of propriety. My dear sister is very preoccupied by the fate of the poor, Arabella said, with a little snap of her teeth. She cannot be in as many places as she would wish. She wrote me as much, Esme put in. Though why on earth she always defended her mother, she didn't know. The Marchioness's expression showed exactly what she thought about Arabella's fib. Yet during the confinement of her only daughter, Lady Bonington said. Quite dismaying. You must find her absence painful, she said to Esme. Esme smiled tightly. Naturally, I am proud of Mamma's unfailing attention to those less fortunate than ourselves. To her surprise, Lady Bonington's eyes were not scornful. Esme could see a gleam of sympathy there. As you undoubtedly know, she announced, I am close friends with your mother. Perhaps the combination of my presence and your entirely acceptable engagement will be enough to change her mind. I fancy I do have some small authority in society, you know. She bent toward Esme with a fanged smile of a leopard about to spring. If I champion your re-entry into society upon your marriage to Mr. Fairfax Lacey, I feel quite certain that the ton will quickly dismiss the foibles of your youth. Esme gave her a weak smile. Obviously, Lady Bonington was offering her a pact. Marry Fairfax Lacey instead of her son, and the Marchioness would reinstate Esme in the good graces of her mother and society. She nodded, meeting Lady Bonington's eyes. That would be most kind. At that moment, the rest of the party entered the room. Sebastian strolled over to Esme. How are you? he said, leaning over her sofa and speaking in her ear with unmistakable intimacy. Stop that, she scolded, trying to avoid Lady Bonington's glare. Sebastian followed her glance. Ah, my dear mother is here. Now where's your inner Morato, Mr. Fairfellow? What is his name? I loathe double-barreled names, don't you? Hush, you monster, she said, pinching his arm. Under his laughter, she caught a spark of something. Jealousy, perhaps. She decided that her plan wasn't a failure, after all, so she held out a languid hand to Fairfax Lacey. Ah, there you are, she cried. It seemed ages since the men retired for port. A few moments later, B entered the salon to find that Stephen Fairfax Lacey was dancing attendance on Esme in a manner that could only be called lavish. They were snugly tucked into a small couch together, and as B watched, Stephen tenderly rearranged the cushion behind Esme's back. She felt a prick of jealousy. Apparently, Esme and Stephen had discovered a shared affinity for bawdy jokes. Stephen kept murmuring things into Esme's ear that made them both roar with laughter. They certainly looked like an affianced couple, but B couldn't work out what exactly had happened the previous evening. Why had Esme announced that she and Stephen were marrying? Presumably because they had agreed to marry, a sensible little voice in the back of her head insisted. But, and this seemed the crucial question to be, what was Marquis Bonington doing in the house, and what was his relation to Esme? As B watched, the Marquis strode over to join the lovebirds. Esme began sparkling, like a tree decorated with candles, and laughing, B thought uncharitably, like a hyena. B herself was dressed for attention, 
and she wasn't going to get that if she kept hugging the fireplace like a debutante wearing too many ruffles to dance. So she drifted over to the group and paused for a second until they looked up. Esme's face lit with pleasure. Be, darling, do join us. Mr. Fairfax Lacey is telling me abominable jests about cod pieces. Cod pieces, Be inquired, walking toward her. She was wearing a gown of slate grey silk. Slate grey was the kind of colour governesses wore, but this gown was cut with cunning precision to make it appear that she was a governess hiding the soul of a Jezebel. The bosom was as low as an evening gown's, but the addition of a trifling bit of lace gave the bodice a faint claim to respectability. What is a codpiece? Naturally, the gentleman stood at her arrival, so B nimbly slipped next to Esme, taking Stephen's seat. Stephen himself answered her question, one dark eyebrow raised. Have you not heard of codpieces, Lady Beatrix? Gentlemen wore them in the sixteenth century. Rounded pieces of leather, sometimes decorated with ribbons. Wore them? Where did they— B broke off, suddenly guessing where they wore them. Now she thought of it, she had seen portraits of men wearing codpieces over their tides. It was wicked of him to laugh at her in such a fashion, though. Life must have been so much easier for women in those days, Esme said, her voice spiced with mischief. One could presumably choose a man by the number of ribbons he wore. B, we must sit together all evening. Our gowns suit each other extraordinarily. Esme was dressed in a dark, silvery crimson gown, whose bosom was as low as B's, but didn't include any disguising lace. Given the fact that Esme was approximately twice as endowed in the chest area, B figured that the contrast was personally unfortunate. But it was better than watching Stephen nestle up to Esme's curves. So, would you insist your husband match his daily ribbons to your gown? Bonington asked Esme. There was a sardonic twist to his lips. To B's mind, something smouldered in the Marquis's eyes when he looked at Esme. And the same could be said for the way her lips curved up at his question. If she laughed a great deal while talking to Stephen, she got a husky undertone when she spoke to the Marquis that was utterly suggestive. Ah, what a dilemma, Esme said. I doubt my fiancé would agree to wear rosy ribbons were I to wear a pink costume. She threw Stephen a languishing look. Stephen sat down in a chair beside the settee. He was suffering from awareness of the fact that if he were indeed an Elizabethan gentleman, wearing little more on his legs than some thin stockings, he'd be grateful for a codpiece, because his body's reaction to B's outrageous gown would have been all too obvious. For you, Lady Rawlings, I would wear the colours of the rainbow, he said, pitching his voice to a velvety earnestness. How fortunate that you, rather than I, are marrying Lady Rawlings, the Marquis drawled, leaning back in his chair and crossing his legs. Lady Beatrix, would you demand that a man make an ass of himself? B could feel Stephen watching her. She gave the Marquis a look of liquid promise. B had a distinct preference for dark hair, but the Marquis's tawny golden brown hair could well nigh change her mind. I do believe I would insist on the removal of all ribbons. Oh, he asked. He had lovely blue eyes. If only she weren't so fond of dark eyes. You prefer a naked codpiece, Lady Beatrix? I would prefer that my husband not advertise, she said. Don't you agree, Esme? If a man wore too many ribbons, he might become the target of many women's attentions. B looked at Stephen, her face as innocent as she could manage. And the next thing one knew, one's husband would have virtually turned into a peacock, thinking that every woman within eyesight is longing for his attentions. Vixen, Stephen thought. Do you mean his eyesight or theirs? he asked. I shall have to take the idea of naked codpieces into consideration, Esme put in. Perhaps we should have a game of charades, 
There must be some Elizabethan clothing up in the attics. She turned to Stephen and said with a simper, But, darling, wouldn't you mind dreadfully if I stripped you of ornamentation? B thought Esme was playing a dangerous game. There was something wild about the Marquis, something ungentlemanlike, that made B a trifle nervous. And yet Esme was toying with him as if he were a mouse and she a kitten. But it was closer to the truth to see him as a tiger and Esme a mouse. For his part, Stephen was fairly certain that his courtship of Esme was piquing B's jealousy. There was a stormy something in her eyes that he liked. So he picked up Esme's hand and told her, I would strip myself naked, if you wished. Even in this state, Esme said, gesturing toward her non-existent middle. If carrying a child made every woman as beautiful as you, Lady Rawlings, England's population would be growing by leaps and bounds. Stephen kissed Esme's hand as he watched Bee out of the corner of his eye. Her hands were clenched into fists. Stephen felt a burst of chair. As long as he wasn't knocked into a corner by Bonington, his plan was a success. I do believe that most women would faint at the idea of gaining such a waistline, Esme was saying. The most beautiful things in nature are those about to burst into flower, a bud on the verge of becoming a rose, a tree dripping with ripe apples. And you are more beautiful than a rose, Lady Rawlings. Quite the dandy, aren't you? Marquis Bonington said to Stephen. There was a dangerous gleam in his eyes. I wouldn't have thought a politician would have so much address. You could do much worse for a husband, Lady Rawlings. I merely speak the truth when I feel pressed, Stephen said promptly, hoping that Bonington wouldn't lose control and floor him. Clearly the man had a prior claim. Lady Rawlings is so beautiful that one can hardly stop oneself from singing her praises. It was the most surprising moment of my life when she agreed to marry me. He sighed, a languishing expulsion of breath. The keen pleasure of that moment will never leave my memory. Esme blushed faintly, and B realized that Esme had, indeed, decided to marry Stephen, no matter what her previous relationship with Marquis Bonington might have been. Who could possibly choose to raise a child alone when she might have Stephen as a father? To B's annoyance, Stephen began kissing Esme's every fingertip. Now her stomach was churning with jealousy. Your eyes are the color of sapphires, Stephen said, his voice a low croon. And your lips are finer than rubies. B cleared her throat. Stephen looked around in a faintly irritated fashion and then said, Forgive me, Lady Beatrix, Marquis Bonington. You must forgive the flush of early love, the delight with which one greets his bride-to-be. I've never met a woman whom I wanted to compare to sapphires, the Marquis Bonington said, with an easy shrug of his shoulders. What appeals to me is a kind of willowy grace, an elegance of form. Esme stiffened slightly. Isn't it the poet Petrarch who compares his lady to a slender willow swaying in the breeze? That appeals to me much more than comparing my lady to flinty little gems. Petrarch loved a woman who was only twelve years old, Stephen said dismissively. I leave the younger set to you, Lord Bonington. I find young women tiresome. A woman who is a woman is the most appealing. He carefully didn't even glance at B. Unless he was much mistaken, a pale pink nipple was just visible through the lace of her bodice. One more look at her chest, and he would pick her up and stride right out of the room, and it wouldn't be his decoration that was stripped. B was having trouble biting back an unpleasant comment. Clearly, she was a member of the younger set whom Stephen professed to find tiresome. And, presumably, Stephen expected her to compete with Esme, though how she was supposed to do that, short of stuffing her corset with all the cotton in Wiltshire, she had no idea. The least she could do was to help the cause of true love. Lord Bonington, she said rather jerkily, 
I brought the most exquisite book of poetry with me, and you had not yet joined the house party when we read some of it aloud. Would you like me to introduce you to the work? I would be more than pleased, he said, rising and giving her an elegant bow. B didn't look to see what Stephen thought. He was probably grateful. After all, if she took Bonington off of Esme's hands, he had no competition to worry about. They walked into the corridor together. She took a deep breath and gave Lord Bonington the full benefit of one of her smouldering looks. There must be something wrong with her. He looked no more impressed than had Stephen. B blinked to hold back sudden tears. Was she... Was she losing her attractiveness to men? That was inconceivable. It was all she had. The library was just down the corridor from the Rose Salon. Esme's library was a snug nutshell of a room, all lined with books that gave off a sleepy, satisfied smell. B felt better immediately. The library had been one of the few places in her father's house where she'd felt happy. Lord Bonington walked away from her and looked out one of the arching windows that faced into the garden, so B followed. She still could hardly believe that he hadn't shown her the faintest interest. Perhaps, perhaps it had been too dim in the corridor. Perhaps he hadn't seen the expression in her eyes. It had rained all day. A silver layer of mist crept over the garden, drifting down to a blocky structure that B knew was a rose arbor. I gather you think that Lady Rawlings should marry Mr. Fairfax Lacey, Lord Bonington said abruptly looking at the garden, and not at her. I... And you brought me her to give them breathing space. B swallowed. She could hardly say that she'd brought him to the library in a weak effort to make Stephen Fairfax Lacey jealous, or to prove that she was still desirable. I do think that Lady Rawlings would be happier if she were married, she said, steadying her voice. Married to him? The scorn in his voice lashed her into speech. Esme would be extremely fortunate to marry Mr. Fairfax Lacey. He's a stick, Bonington said, still gazing out into the garden. No, he's not. He's quite handsome, and he's funny and kind, and he... he seems to care for her, B said. So do I. What could she say to that? She stood next to him, feeling the chill that breathed off the leaded window panes. Did she tell you to take me away? Did she send you some sort of signal? No, no, B said. It wasn't like that at all. I merely, I merely... He turned and looked down at her. After a moment, he said, We're in the same boat, then. She couldn't ask what boat that was, because she was afraid that she knew. Absolutely not, she replied stiffly. Are you saying that you don't wish to marry that proper MP in there? The touch of disbelief in his voice made her raise her head. I do not. There was a sceptical curl to his lip. I do not wish to marry anyone. She walked over to the couch and sat down, not bothering to tilt her hips from side to side, in the walk she had perfected at age fifteen. The man was not interested in her. That slow fire she saw in his eyes was for Esme, not for her. But he did follow her, throwing himself down on the couch. If I thought jealousy would help, I would have a go at pretending to be in love with you. But it wouldn't make any difference, Bonington said flatly. I'm sorry to say that the man appears enamoured of Esme Rawlings, and once she draws you in, it's damn hard to look at another woman. I am not interested in Mr. Fairfax Lacey, B insisted, more for the sake of her pride than anything else. He didn't even answer her. I expect he thinks you're too young. Too scandalous, B put in, unable to pretend any longer. Scandalous, hm? She nodded. She knew Marquis Bonington by reputation. Well, who didn't? He used to be considered one of the most upright men in the tall.
there had never been a whisper of scandal about the man, until last summer. Not even a shred. If he knew her past, he would spit at her and leave the room immediately. But he didn't seem to be reacting with condemnation. Didn't you sidestep with Sandhurst? Why on earth did you choose that odious mushroom? he asked. And she couldn't hear any censure in his voice. Just a kind of lazy curiosity. She shrugged. He had a lovely bow. He complimented me. He looked at her without saying anything. And my father loathed him, she added. I expect the noble public servant holds it against you, though. The Marquis's eyes were kind, too. As kind as Stephen's. What was it with these men? They didn't react to her best overtures, and then they made her feel like crying. Actually, Mr. Fairfax Lacey said that he wanted a mistress with less experience, she said, her wry grin crooked. He stared at her. Fairfax Lacey said that? She nodded. You're better off without him. Why on earth would you wish to be a mistress to such an intolerable lout? Or a mistress to any man, for that matter? He was looking at her so intently that B wondered whether he'd suddenly noticed she was a woman. Was he going to offer her a consolatory kiss? For all she'd drawn him to the library, she didn't want him to touch her. I suppose I don't wish to be a mistress, she said, dismissing the memory of Stephen's kisses. Nor a wife, either. Humph, he said, looking unconvinced. Well, then, where's that poetry brought me in here for? I shouldn't like to go back to the salon without having read some of it. Lord knows what they'll think we were doing. B smiled back, feeling an unwilling pulse of friendship. He got up and threw another log into the fireplace, and then walked back to the couch. Here it is, she said, plucking the book off the end table. He started reading, and his eyebrows rose. I suppose this is from Esme's personal library. No, she blushed. I brought it with me. Truly, some of the poetry is quite, quite unexceptional. B liked his chuckle. She drew up her legs and curled into her favourite position, the one she would never assume before a man, because it didn't emphasise how slender her limbs were. I like this, he said. Oh, fair boy, trust not to thy beauty's wings. She nodded. He looked over at her with a wry grin. I spent a great deal of my life trusting the wrong things. My title, for example. Your beauty, she said daringly. Not so much. I was convinced that I had to live up to the dignity of my title. I suppose I trusted my reputation too much. B's smile mirrored his. Whereas I simply threw mine away. Then perhaps you are the one who trusts your beauty overmuch. He put the book to the side. Shall we return to the salon, Lady Beatrix? She put her feet down and rose. He looked down at her, and B felt a faint blush rise in her cheeks. If I hadn't met Esme fast, you likely would have been the making of me, Lady Beatrix. I'm not suitable for someone who honours their reputation, she observed starting toward the door. A large hand curled around her hand, drawing it under his arm. Ah, oh, but it wouldn't have taken long for you to convince me of the worthlessness of reputation. Esme didn't even try, and I was ready to throw it away as soon as I met her. She looked a question as they walked through the corridor. She was married at that point. Now she isn't, be observed. And therein lies my trouble. I am of the fixed opinion that Esme should marry me and no other. He glanced down at B. I'm telling you this merely because I wouldn't want you to worry if I have to take out your darling Fairfax Lacey. Take out, B said sharply. What on earth do you mean by that, sir? He shrugged. I doubt it will come to violence. But no one is going to marry Esme but myself. 24. Waltzing on One's Deathbed
trying to not feel guilty because one's wife is dying is a difficult task. Damn near impossible, Reese finally decided. After all, they'd been married for years. Nine or ten, he estimated. He'd married Helene when she was barely out of the schoolroom. They were both too young to know better. Yet it wasn't entirely his fault the marriage failed, no matter what she said about it. But he never, ever thought of her as not being there, not there to send him nagging letters or curl her lip at him as they passed, not there to send him horrid little notes after he debuted a new piece of music, putting her finger directly on the weakest spot and not saying a word about the best of it. Damn it, she couldn't die. He'd been to Lady Rawlings's house a mere few months ago, and Helene had seemed perfectly healthy then. A little too thin, perhaps, but she was always thin. Not like Lena's overflowing little body, or curves and fleshy parts. Reese frowned. Surely it wasn't correct to think about one's mistress while riding in a carriage to greet one's dying wife. And was greet the right word? It was with a great sense of relief that Reese realized his carriage was finally pulling up in front of Chantal House. It wasn't that he cared for his wife, of course. He didn't. Hadn't the faintest feelings for her of that nature. It was merely natural anxiety that had his chest feeling as if it were clamped in a vice. His fists kept curling, and he could bellow with rage. At what? Helene, for growing ill? No. He had to be sweet, calm, tell her loving things. Because she was dying. His bitter-tongued, frigid little wife was dying. God knows, that should probably have given him a sense of relief. Instead, he couldn't seem to swallow, and he actually had to support himself on the side of the carriage when he descended, because his knees felt weak for a moment. He could tell by the butler's minatory gaze. Slope, wasn't that his name? That he probably should have changed his garments before leaping into a carriage. Instead, he ran a hand through his hair, doubtless dishevelling it more than before. "'I've come to see my wife,' he said brusquely, heading past Slope and up the stairs. He knew where Helen stayed when she was at Lady Rawlings's house. Not that he visited her bedchamber, naturally, but he'd noted the room. Dimly he realised that Slope was calling after him. Impatient, he stopped and glared down the stairs. What is it, man? The Countess is not in her chamber. She can be found in the Rose Salon. Reese blinked. Seemed an odd place to stage a dying scene. But who was he to cavil? Perhaps she wouldn't die until tomorrow. He all but galloped down the stairs, brushed by slope, and stopped. A typical scene of English country life greeted him. A stout peer was dozing in a low chair by the fire. A beautiful little tart of a girl was leaning over her embroidery, her lips painted a fantastic red. And there were a few other remnants of English nobility strewn around the room. But it was the piano that held his attention. He'd know her playing anywhere, of course. She was seated at the piano fort, and not by herself, either. They were playing one of Beethoven's sonatas, an E-flat major, and she was laughing. As he watched, her companion leaned over and kissed her on the cheek. Kissed Helene! True, it was just a brush of a kiss, but Helene blushed. Reese's body went from cold to burning hot and back to cold again, in the mere moment he stood in the doorway. Suddenly, he was aware of the butler standing just at his shoulder, of the wintry morning sunlight making Helene's pale hair look like strands of silver, of the very aliveness of her. They started playing again, and she was swaying slightly, her shoulder just bumping her partner's arm. Her face was glowing with joy, as it always did when she played. Always. Helene and he had only lived in the same house for a matter of months, but he'd never forgotten the way she looked when she played the piano. It was that joy that had made him fall in love with her.
the very thought shocked his senses back into movement. Fall in love? Ha! I see that the report of your demise was over-hasty, he drawled, in the nastiest tone he could summon. And Earl Godwin was pretty much an expert at giving offence. Helene looked up, and he saw her mouth form a little O. But the next moment she turned to her partner and said saucily, I'm so sorry, I almost lost my place, Stephen. And her fingers flew over the keys again, just as if he weren't there. Stephen? Who the hell was Stephen? Reese had a vague sense he'd seen the man before. He was handsome, in a pallid English sort of way. Damn it, he'd been rooked. Although it wasn't clear to him why he'd been called as audience. Why in the hell had his wife wanted him to jump to her bidding? He wasn't going to stand around and give her the satisfaction of gloating over his presence. For tuppence, he'd turn around and head straight back for London. But he'd been on the road for two days, and his horses were exhausted. Excuse me, an amused voice said, just at his elbow. Lady Withers smiled at him. She was a quite lovely woman of a certain age, and Esme Rawlings's aunt, if you weren't mistaken. Lord Godwin, she said, how splendid to have you join us. The Countess did mention that you might make a brief visit. For a moment her eyes danced over to his wife, cosily tucked against her piano partner. Who the hell is that? he snarled, jerking his head backwards, dismissing the fleeting thought that he might actually greet Lady Withers. She blinked, as if the room was so filled with gentry that she might have trouble identifying the pallid Englishman. Mr. Fairfax Lacey is a member of Parliament for Oxfordshire, and such an intelligent man. He also holds the honorary title of the Earl of Spade, although he chooses not to use it. We are all enjoying his company. Rhys was pulling himself together. He'd be damned if he showed any sort of husbandly emotion before a smirking Viscountess. And since he wasn't feeling any of those husbandly feelings, that should be simple. Unless murderous was considered a husbandly emotion. Then Helene was before him, holding out her hand and sinking into a curtsy. Rhys, I must apologize for my letter, she said, as tranquil as ever. While the midwife in the village did suggest I had pleurisy, it turned out to be something far more innocent. Oh? Well, you see, pleurisy starts with a red rash. But I had beard burn, as it turned out, she said, laughing slightly. Aren't I the naive one, then? I suppose you were so young when we married that I never encountered this problem. Her laugh was breathy perhaps a sign of nerves. But Rhys wasn't going to give her the satisfaction. Any satisfaction. He just looked at her, and the giggle died on her lips. You are still my wife, he began. She put a hand on his arm. This was not the naive girl he'd married, not the Helene he woke up with the day after they returned from Gretna Green, a girl who veered madly between shrieking tantrums and sullen tears. She was poised, cool, and utterly unapproachable. Only in name, Rhys. Another woman shares your bedchamber now. He looked over her shoulder. Fairfax Lacey was practicing chords. He played well. Presumably she wasn't sleeping alone in her bedchamber. A gentleman who planned to be at your side during divorce proceedings wouldn't sit at the piano while you face an irate husband, he said, his tone polished steel. You are hardly an irate husband, she said, shrugging. I asked Stephen to remain where he is. I hardly think you are interested in making his acquaintance. And who said anything about divorce? So you've taken a lover, Rhys sneered on the verge of crashing his fist into that sleek bastard's face. What is it all in aid of, Helene? Pleasure, she said, and the smile on her face burned down his spine. My pleasure, Rhys. He turned on his heel, and then back at the last second.
Who did that arrangement of Beethoven for four hands? I did. I've been rearranging all of them. He should have known that. The sonata sounded half like Beethoven and half like Helene. An odd mixture. Now we have that little discussion out of the way, Lady Withers said brightly, coming up from somewhere. Why don't I show you to your room, Lord Godwin? I do hope you'll make a long stay with us. Rhys turned like a cornered lion and snarled at her, then strode out of the room. As Arabella described it later to Esme, who hadn't been in the Rose Salon at the time, Earl Godwin acted precisely like the wild man of deepest Africa, whom Arabella had seen once in a travelling circus. All hair and such a snarl, Esme. Arabella paused, thinking about it. Honestly, Helen, your husband is quite, quite impressive. There was reluctant respect in her voice. Oh, Reese is very good at snarling, Helen said. She, Arabella, and Esme were cosily seated in Esme's chamber, drinking tea and eating gingerbread cakes. Esme looked up from her plate, her eyes sparkling with laughter. The important thing is he snarled, because you managed to tangle his liver, or whatever that phrase is that you keep using, Helen. Cardle his liver, Helen repeated, and there was a growing spark of happiness in her eyes. He did seem chagrined by our conversation, didn't he, Lady Withers? Chagrined is not the word, Arabella replied, stirring a little sugar into her tea. He was incensed. Absolutely incensed, purple with rage. I hope he's not feeling too violent, Esme said. I can hardly have my future husband mangled by your present husband, Helen. It would all be such fodder for gossip if the servants shared what they know. Helen thought about the difference between what the servants thought they knew about her and Stephen, and what the truth was. I do think you could have left Stephen to me, she told Esme, somewhat peevishly. What if Rhys discovers that you've claimed my lover as a future husband? I doubt very much that your husband will raise the subject with Stephen, Esme replied. Rhys already announced that he will stay one day at most, so Stephen only has to briefly juggle a fiancé and a mistress. He'll not be the first to do so. I can't tell you how many times I found myself at a table that included Miles and Lady Randolph Child. Miles always acted with the greatest finesse, and if my husband could do it, so can Stephen. Arabella chortled. Supper will be an interesting meal. Mr. Fairfax Lacey will face quite a difficult task. You, Helen, wish him to impress your husband with his devotion— and you, Esme, wish to impress the Marquis with Mr. Fairfax Lacey's devotion. Hmm, perhaps I could ask B to create a diversion by flirting with Earl Godwin. There's no need to go as far as that, Helen said hastily. And do you know, I have the strangest feeling that B might be having some feelings for Mr. Fairfax Lacey herself. There's something odd about the way she looks at him. Esme laughed. That would make three of us chasing the poor man. Arabella, are you certain that you have no use for Mr. Fairfax Lacey? Quite sure, thank you, darling, Arabella said, carefully choosing a perfectly browned gingerbread. It seems to me that the poor man must be growing tired. I dislike fatigued men. Still, it seems to be quite enlivening for him, she continued rather absently. The man was getting hidebound. He looked so cheerful this morning. And that, of course, is your doing, she said, beaming at Helen. Helen hid a pulse of guilt. She was hardly enlivening poor Stephen's nights, even though the whole house believed she was. Now Esme was smiling at her, too. Her sense of guilt grew larger. I'm very proud of Helen, Esme said. Arabella, you can't imagine how impossibly rude Reese has been to poor Helen over the years, and she's never staged even the slightest rebellion until now. Now that you've rebelled, Arabella asked Helen with some curiosity.
What will be the outcome? Are you wishing to continue your relationship with Mr. Fairfax Lacey? That is, if Esme gives up her rather dubious claim to him. I wouldn't call it dubious, Esme put in. Merely unexpected. No, Helene admitted. I don't wish to remain his friend. I knew that, Esme said. I watched the two of you. Otherwise I would not have claimed him as my own future husband. I assure you, Helen. Stephen Fairfax Lacey is good marriage material, Arabella said. I am never wrong about that sort of thing. All three of my husbands were excellent spouses. She finished her gingerbread and added meditatively. Barring their short lifespans, of course. I have to tell you something, Helen said rather desperately. I do hope you're going to tell us intimate details, Arabella said. There's nothing more pleasurable than dissecting a man's performance in bed. I believe it's my favourite activity, perhaps even more fun than actually being in that bed. She looked faintly appalled. I surprise myself, she said, picking up another cake. Ah, well, that's the benefit of being an elderly person. You're not elderly, Aunt Arabella, Esme said. You're barely out of your forties. I'm not really bedding Mr. Fairfax Lacey, Helen blurted out. Arabella's mouth fell open for a second before she snapped it shut. I thought so, Esme said with some satisfaction. You don't have the air of a couple besotted with each other. Helen could feel her face reddening. We didn't suit. I had that happen to me once, Arabella said. I won't bore you with the details, my dears, but after his third attempt, I called for a truce. A laying down of arms, she clarified with a naughty smirk. Well, who would have thought? Fairfax Lacey looked so... No, Helen cried, horrified by the conclusion Arabella had drawn. It truly was all my fault. I'm just not... She stopped. To her horror, she felt tears rising to her eyes. How could she possibly admit to a failure in bedroom activity when she was seated with two of the most desirable women in the tongue? You know, I find him quite uninteresting as well, Esme said quickly. It's something about the Englishness of his face. And his chest is quite narrow, isn't it? Moreover, I never liked a man with a long chin. Helene threw Esme a watery smile. It's not that I don't like the way he looks. I do. It's just that I found myself unable to countenance the prospect of bedding him. Her voice dropped. He was very kind about the whole thing. Arabella nodded. There are always men whom one simply cannot imagine engaging in intimate circumstances. Unfortunately, I felt that way about my second husband. But what really interests me, she said, turning a piercing eye on Esme, is what exactly you are doing, announcing your engagement to a man with an overly long chin. Or, to put the same question another way, what is Marquis Bonington doing in this house, Esme? Esme almost choked on the gingerbread she was eating. Expressing his repentance, she said hopefully. Don't repeat that poppycock story that I fed your sewing circle, Arabella cried. You managed to evade my every effort at a confidential talk last night by clinging to your new fiancé's arm, but now I would like to know the truth. Why has the Marquis arrived in your house? Helen leaned forward. I would like to know that as well, Esme. I accepted that his mother was likely here due to the circumstances of last summer, although it seemed extremely odd. Arabella interrupted, naturally. Odd? There's something deuced smoky about Honoratia Bonington's arrival. Esme sighed. You sound like a bellows, her aunt observed. Out with it. Esme looked up at her aunt for a moment. Arabella looked as delicate and sensual as if a wisp of wind would blow her away, and yet she and the formidable Lady Bonington 
were certainly forged of the same steel. So Esme told. But I don't wish to marry anyone, she finished. Least of all Lord Bonington. It wouldn't be fair to Miles, or to the babe. After a moment of stupefied silence, Arabella burst into a cackle of laughter. Want to just keep Bonington around for those lonely nights, do you? And you had him working in the garden during the day. Here I thought you were bent on a sober widowhood. Lord, Esme, even I never created a scandal akin to this one. What scandal? Esme demanded. You stopped the sewing circle from even considering the possibility, with all your quotations. Which took me a good hour poring over a Bible, I'll have you know, Arabella said. Esme, do you think it might be time to give up the sewing circle? Helen asked tentatively. Things are a trifle complicated in your life. Perhaps it would be best if you weren't under quite so close surveillance. It's part of my new respectability, Esme said stubbornly. I rather enjoy it. Not that I noticed, Arabella commented. You sewed a miserable seam. Some people are simply not gifted in that department. You know, Mamma makes shirts for the poor, Esme said. The whole shirt, even the collar and cuffs. Arabella was silent for a moment. Lord, Esme, I never like to think of myself as someone who could say ill of my own sister, but Fanny is dim-witted. She's spending all that time making up collars for people she doesn't even know, and her own daughter is alone in the country. She's got her priorities in a tangle. She reached over and gave Esme's hand a little squeeze. Don't go changing yourself into your mother. You've always had a merry soul. But Fanny has grown into a rather dreary adult, if I say so myself. That's not fair, Esme objected. Mamma has had a great many disappointments in life. Obviously, her daughter was foremost on the list. She is dispirited, Arabella said firmly, although it's good of you to defend her. Fanny spends all her time gazing at the world and pursing her lips. I've always been glad to have one relation with a grain of sense in her head. I can't afford to lose you to the ranks of straight-laced matrons. Your aunt is right, Helen put in. I have only the slimmest acquaintance with your mother, but the idea of you growing as prim and prissy as that Mrs. Cable is simply dispiriting. She's not a very nice woman, Esme. I know, Esme said. Believe me, I know. Arabella took a look at her niece and judged it time to change the subject. But while she and Helene chatted about the Venetian lace points that adorned Helene's sleeves, Esme sat in silence. She had promised Miles that she would be a respectable mother, yet Miles was gone. She thought never to make another scandal, and she could think of no scandal with the explosive force that her marriage to Marquis Bonington would have. 25. A Taste for Seduction The next morning, Bee stamped down the lane to visit the goat. She'd taken to visiting the devilish creature every morning, from the pure boredom of life. Of course, she could have spent her time flirting with the Puritan, but annoyingly, irritatingly, hatefully, he and Helene were learning to play a four-handed piece. The sight of Helene's pale braids bent close to Stephen's dark head as they whacked away on that pianoforte gave Bee a strange kind of longing, the kind that pinches your heart. It wasn't an emotion that Bee was familiar with at all. The one time they'd been alone together after breakfast, for the merest moment, he'd looked down at her with a rather wintry smile and said, I gather that you've decided not to woo me. She had answered, I never woo, hoping that he would kiss her or smile at her, the way he did at Esme and Helene. But all he'd done was bow and walk away. Bee had realized in that very moment watching his back,
that there was nothing in the world she wanted more than to woo the man. But Stephen showed little desire to secure any sort of relationship with her. How could he, in truth? He had no time. When he wasn't playing an instrument with his mistress, he was exchanging bawdy jests with his fiancée. Lord knows where he was at night. B ground her teeth together. She was making a regular occupation out of thinking about Stephen Fairfax Lacey, and then admonishing herself for doing it. She held out a branch she'd brought to the goat, and watched him chew it into kindling. In fact, Lady Beatrix Lennox was suffering from a mighty loss of confidence. First, Mr. Fairfax Lacey had refused her as a mistress, and taken Helen instead. And Marquis Bonington hadn't shown the faintest interest in her from the very beginning. B had to blink very hard to hold back tears. The goat was chewing so loudly that it was no surprise that B didn't hear anyone approaching her. Aren't you afraid to approach that Spencer-eating beast? said a voice at her ear. She was like some sort of trained dog, B thought miserably. All she had to do was hear his voice, and her knees weakened. The goat doesn't bother me, she said, not turning to look at him. What was the point? He was leaning on the stile next to her, seemingly unperturbed by her graceless welcome. We should introduce the rest of the party to this fascinating creature, he said idly. I don't believe that Esme even knows of his existence, whereas I find myself compulsively visiting the beast every day. B's heart hardened. I thought you and Lady Godwin were spending your time together, she said, being deliberately rude. Or is it Lady Rawlings who occupies more of your time? Not every moment, and never tell me that you're jealous. His voice took on that dark, sweet note that drove B to distraction. Absolutely not, she said, turning and facing him for the first time. He was... he wasn't so fabulously handsome. He had wrinkles on the edges of his eyes, and his chin was too long. God, how she hated a long chin. I'm glad, Stephen said. She couldn't read his eyes. Was he making fun of her? No, that was a look of concern. Damn it all. Because Esme and I... He hesitated. You needn't tell me, B put in. I can see the truth for myself, and I assure you that I haven't the slightest feeling about it, except happiness for the two of you. I'm glad to hear that. It was so unfair that his smile could make her stomach clench. Long chin, long chin, long chin, she thought to herself. Esme and I seem to have so many interests in common. Apparently he was feeling quite chatty, now that he'd cleared away any misconceptions B might have had. I had forgotten how much I enjoy wordplay and jests. Lovely, B said listlessly. She had been routed by a fleshy woman nine months with child. The fact that B genuinely liked Esme, and Helene for that matter, didn't help. Stephen looked aside at his little B. Unless he was quite mistaken, his campaign was working. She was lurid with jealousy. Do you enjoy jests? he asked. Apparently she was supposed to engage in a contest of bawdy jests, in order to obtain the great honour of being yet another woman in Mr. Fairfax Lacey's life. Of course, she wouldn't do such an ignominious thing. I know a few, she said, despite her best intentions. Do you know the ballad that begins, He's lain like a log of wood in bed for a year or two, and won't afford me any good, he nothing at all would do. There are quite a few verses. He laughed. Perhaps men don't care to repeat that particular ballad amongst themselves. His eyes warmed her to her stomach, sent pangs of warning to her heart. I am thinking of returning to London, Mr. Fairfax Lacey, B said, making up her mind on the spot. I must visit my mantua maker. After all, my favourite garment was eaten by this animal.
The goat rolled his eyes at her. Oh, he said. And then, are you then determined not to woo? How many times must you ask me? B snapped. The arrogance of the man was incredible. Incredible. B peeked a look at him from under her lashes. He looked almost, well, anxious. My besetting sin is arrogance, it would seem, he said. Although I had not realized it until recently, I truly apologize if I misinterpreted your interest in me when we played billiards together. No, you didn't, she wanted to shriek. Why wasn't he wooing her? Why wasn't he trying to seduce her? She peeked another look. It was no use. He had the longest chin in Christendom, perhaps, but she wanted to kiss him desperately. Or rather, she wanted to be kissed by him. And it seemed that there was still a chance before Esme scooped him into a forty-year waltz. But she couldn't quite bring herself to give him one of her seductive looks. She was feeling paralyzingly shy, and there they were in front of the goat, and— I'll think about it, she mumbled. What? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch what she said. He was leaning slightly against the fence. He looked like the most respectable, prudish Puritan in the world. Not her sort at all. Too old, for one thing, and too opinionated, and too... too desirable. I said, I'll decide today whether I wish to woo you, she said painstakingly. Oh, good. The infuriating man acted as if they were discussing a trip to see a Roman monument. B couldn't think of anything else they had to say to each other, so she made her farewell and then walked listlessly up the lane, swinging her parasol at a rock with a misfortune to be in her way. It was only in front of him that she pretended there was a decision to be made, and that was merely because of an instinctive feminine wish to protect herself. Tonight she would spend an hour bathing, two hours dressing, and even longer painting her face, and she would seduce that man by God, if he were seducible. 26. The experience that divides the ladies from the... women. Esme stared out the window of the drawing room. They were having a late spring flurry of snow. The white flakes were making the yellow crocuses on the side of the house look pale and betrayed. Or perhaps it was she who was betrayed. Or was it she who was betraying? The comedy of errors that made up this particular house party was astonishing. She and Mr. Fairfax Lacey, to all eyes, were apparently planning to marry. Equally well known to all was the fact that Helen was having an affair with the said Mr. Fairfax Lacey, although it didn't seem to have given Helen's husband even a qualm. The Earl was leaving the next morning, but as far as Esme could determine, he was thoroughly enjoying bickering with Helen over her reformulations of Beethoven, and had paid no attention whatsoever to Stephen Fairfax Lacey's lavish compliments to his wife. Today, the pain in her lower back was even worse than usual. She could hardly stand up. It hurt so much. The door opened behind her. Hello, she said, not bothering to look around. It was amazing how closely her ears were attuned to the sound of his step, rather than those of the other two dozen persons thronging her house. He stood just behind her and, without even being asked, pressed his thumbs sharply into the base of her spine. It felt so good that Esme's knees almost collapsed. Sturdy there, he said. How is that babe this morning? I received a letter from my mother, Esme said, turning around and looking up at him. Fanny is coming to visit, thanks to your mother's persuasive powers. Much though I loathe it, I am going to have to express gratitude to Marchioness Bonnington. Sebastian narrowed his eyes. Didn't Esme have any idea why his mother would have done such an act of benevolence? My mother didn't do it out of the kindness of her heart, he pointed out. I know, I know, 
The smile that spread across her face was genuine. But I am glad that Mama is coming. It must be because I'm having a child myself. And because Miles is dead, of course. Of course, Sebastian thought cynically. He was getting sick of Esme referring to her husband, as if he'd ever played a significant role in her life. Don't you see that your mother is coming here, solely to ensure that you do indeed marry Fairfax Lacey? he asked harshly. Once you disappoint her again, she'll drop you like a hot potato. There's always the small chance that I won't disappoint her, Esme replied icily. Sebastian snorted. Your mother is the sort of woman who would find something to criticize if you had taken on a nun's habit. I mean to be respectable, and I shall be, Esme said. But her heart wasn't in the argument. Her back hurt too much. You are pretending not to be in love with me. You're a hypocrite, Esme, and you're making a terrible mistake. I don't feel very well, Esme mumbled. It wasn't only because she didn't want to think about Sebastian's offensive comment. Her back hurt so much that she seemed to be hearing his voice through a fog, as if filtered through cotton wool. Perhaps I ought to go to my chambers. At that moment, the door opened, and a flood of chatting houseguests swept in. Lady Bonington took one look at Esme and announced, I do believe that Lady Rawlings is having that baby now. Well, you've done this sort of thing before, Arabella said to her, with a tone of mild panic. Tell the poor girl what to do. Don't be more of an idiot than nature made you, Lady Bonington snapped. Obviously she needs to retire to her bedchamber. I see no occasion for rudeness, Arabella replied, bristling. Esme took a deep breath. She was surrounded by a ring of faces. A second later, Arabella was pushed to the side, and Sebastian bent over Esme. Up you go, he said to her, with a tone of unmistakable intimacy. Before she could protest, he picked Esme up in his arms and started carrying her up the stairs, looking for all the world as if he knew directly where he was going. Oh! Esme gripped his arm as her entire body shuddered and seemingly attempted to turn itself inside out. She dug her fingernails into his arm. Call the midwife, Sebastian yelled over his shoulder. A moment later, he had her in one of the spare bedrooms, on a bed specially prepared for just this occasion. But Esme didn't let him put her down. Wait, she gasped. He started to lower her to the bed. Wait, damn it! She hung on for dear life as another wave swept through her body. Just then the door popped open, and in streamed Arabella, Helen, Marchioness Bonington, and three maids. All right, Bonington, Arabella said importantly. If you could just put my niece on the bed, we'll carry on from here. The midwife will be here directly. The silly woman had taken a walk to the village. Just try to keep that baby where it is until she arrives. All right, Esme. Don't be a widgeon, Lady Bonington said, marching over to the side of the bed. The babe will not arrive for hours. God, I hope that's not the case, Esme gasped. That's the way of it, the Marchioness said. Her tone was not unsympathetic. Esme let go of Sebastian's hand. He bent over her for a moment, pressed a kiss on her forehead, and then he was gone. She felt a bit like crying, except another pain rushed up from her toes and stole her attention away. Bloody hell, Esme said in a near shout, reaching out and grabbing Arabella's hand. The pain receded, and she flopped back on the bed, drained. Profanity will not ease the pain, Lady Bonington observed. My own mother told me that what distinguishes a lady from a lower being is that a lady accepts pain without rebuke. Esme ignored her. How many of these pains will there be? she demanded of the midwife as she entered the room. Mrs. Pluck was a thick-set woman who was cheerfully confident about the 
course of nature, as she called it. I expect you're in some discomfort, she said, bustling about with a stack of towels. But you've got the hips for a quick one. She chuckled in a wheezing sort of way. We must let nature take its course, that's what I say. My niece will dispatch this business with... with dispatch, Arabella announced, surreptitiously examining the red patches on her hand where Esme had squeezed her. Bring me a wet cloth, she snapped at one of the maids. Esme, darling, you're rather unbecomingly flushed. I'll just bathe your forehead. Took me all of six hours, Lady Bonington trumpeted. Esme immediately decided that she was going to birth her baby in less than six hours. She'd never survive an ordeal as long as that. Oh no, she moaned. Here it comes again. Arabella hastily dropped her wet cloth, and Esme grabbed her hand. The tidal wave came, swept her down and under, cast her up, gasping for air. I don't like this, Esme managed to say in a husky whisper. Never knew a woman who did, the Martianess said cheerfully from the side of the bed. All a lady can do is endure with fortitude, showing her well-bred nature in every moment. Esme responded with flat profanity. As the Martianess thought later, if she hadn't already known that Esme Rawlings was an appallingly ill-bred woman, she would have known from that moment on. The girl just had no idea how a lady behaved under duress. 27. Sweet William Giving birth in the presence of two elderly ladies of the ton was without a doubt the most uncomfortable experience of Esme's life. Arabella stood at her right, bathing her forehead every time one of the pains ended. Esme emerged from a swooping black wave of pain to find that Lady Bonington, standing to her left, was exhorting her to greater efforts, and Arabella, not to be outdone, was instructing the midwife to hurry things along. There's no need to hurry things along, Mrs. Pluck, the midwife, responded with a glimmer of irritation. The course of nature will do it, and Lady Rawlings has the hips for it, that she does. A little less conversation about my niece's hips, if you please, Arabella snapped. There's no need to be vulgar. Arabella, you're a fool, Lady Bonington announced, with her usual politeness. Esme took a breath, feeling the pain coming again. It was worse than she'd ever imagined, rather like being scalded from the toes up. She struggled her way back out of the pain a moment later, dimly hearing Arabella's congratulations. Her aunt seemed to have decided that Esme needed applause after every contraction, and Esme definitely agreed with her. Where? Where's Helen? she gasped at one point. Lady Bonington looked shocked. Naturally, we sent her out of the room. The poor girl hasn't had a babe of her own, you know. This is enough to put her off for life. Oh, no, Esme moaned. The next contraction was coming, sweeping up from her toes. Fortitude, darling, fortitude, Arabella said, taking her hand even more firmly. Esme clutched her hand. You've got the hips for it, Mrs. Pluck said from the bottom of the bed. And then, we're almost there, my lady. I told you this would be a ride in the park, didn't I? A ride in the park it wasn't, but Esme couldn't summon up the breath to argue the point. Instead, she let the pain wrench her bones from their sockets, or so it felt. Arabella was alternating between putting a cool cloth on Esme's head and wrapping it around her own hand. All right, my lady, Mrs. Plunk said loudly. Time to bring the little master into the world. Oh, daughter, Esme thought although she couldn't summon up the wherewithal to say so. But Mrs. Pluck was right. Squealing, indignant, fat and belligerent, William Rawlings entered the world in a burst of rage. Esme propped herself on her elbows, 
There he was, dark red from pure anger, kicking jerkily, waving his fists in the air. Her heart turned over with a thump. Oh, give him to me, she cried, pushing herself into a half-seated position and reaching out. He'll need a good bath, and after that I will check all his toes and make certain that he is presentable, Mrs. Platt replied, handing the baby to the waiting nursemaid. He seems to be a boy, Arabella said, ogling the baby. My goodness, Esme, he's remarkably well endowed, she giggled. He looks as if he has two turnips between his legs. They're all like that, Lady Bonington said with a tinge of nostalgia in her voice. My son was just the same. I thought he was going to be a satyr. Just a minute, my lady, Mrs. Pluck said. Just one little push now. A few moments later, Esme hoisted herself into a sitting position. I'd like to hold my son, please, she said hoarsely. Please, now. Mrs. Pluck looked up. Everything in good time, my lady. After we... Arabella reached over and snatched the baby out of the nursemaid's arms. Lady Rawlings wants to hold her son. She put him, rather awkwardly, in Esme's arms. He was still howling, fat little legs jerking out of the blanket. This isn't wise, Mrs. Pluck scolded. It's best if the baby is washed within the first five minutes of its birth. Cleanliness is essential to good health. There's time for many a bath in his future, Arabella said, bending over the bed. He's so plumpy, isn't he, Esme? And look at his gorgeous little toes. Esme had never felt anything quite like it. It was as if the world had narrowed to a pinhole, the size of herself and the baby. He was so beautiful that her heart sang with it, and yet he was remarkably homely as well. Why is his face so red? she asked. And why is his head this peculiar shape? The course of nature, Mrs. Pluck answered importantly. They all look like that. Now, you'll have to give up the baby, my lady. We have just a few more things to do here. But the baby had decided to open his eyes. Esme clutched him closer. Hello there, she whispered. Hello, love. He blinked and closed his mouth. His eyes were the pale blue of the sky on a very early morning, and he looked up at her, quite as if he were memorizing her face. I know you think you're smiling at me, Esme told him, kissing his nose and his forehead and his fat little cheeks. You just forgot to smile, didn't you, sweet William? Are you naming him William? Lady Bonington asked. I suppose that must be an old name in Lord Rawlings' family. His father, you know, she told the nursemaid, who looked blank. William's eyes were sweet and solemn, trusting Esme to keep him safe, trusting her to nourish and protect him, for years and years to come. A chill of fear fell on Esme's heart. Benjamin, her own little baby brother, had died. Of course, it wasn't the same, but sweet William was so enchantingly dear. He frowned a little as a drop fell on his cheek. What is it, darling? Arabella asked. Oh, no, the baby's getting wet. Shall I take him? He's the most beautiful baby I ever saw, Esme said. Hiccuping. I lo love him so much, but he's so little. What if something happens to him? I couldn't bear it. She's having some sort of reaction to the birth, Lady Bonington observed. Take some women that way. My second cousin, twice removed, went into a decline after her daughter was born. Mind you, that husband of hers was enough to send anyone into a decline. Esme swallowed and dried her eyes on the sheet. He has Mars's eyes, she said to Arabella, ignoring the Martianess. See, she turned William toward Arabella. They have just that sweetness that Miles had. Miles's eyes were that same blue, and Miles is dead. But his son isn't, 
Arabella said, smiling down at her. William is a fine, sturdy baby, with nothing fragile about him. I agree, Lady Bonington said promptly. I knew immediately that the baby was the image of your husband. Arabella threw her a look of potent dislike. Why don't you go transmit this happy news to your son, Honoratia? I shall, the Marchioness said. I shall. And may I say, Lady Rawlings, that I am impressed by your handling of this entire delicate matter? Whether Lady Bonington meant to refer to the process of giving birth, or that of identifying Esme's child's father, no one could tell. Mrs. Pluck took the baby, who promptly started crying again. He wants to be with me, Esme said, struggling to sit upright. He has a good, healthy voice, Mrs. Pluck said, handing him to the wet nurse. But the course of nature must take its course, my lady, she said, rather obscurely. Helene had come in and was peering at the baby as the wet nurse wrapped him in a warm cloth. Oh, Esme, he's absolutely lovely, she said. Does he look healthy to you? Esme asked the nursemaid. Fat as a suckling pig, the wet nurse said promptly. Now shall we see if he likes some breakfast? She sat down and pulled open the neck of her gown. Esme watched as William turned to the nurse and made a little grunting noise. He had those great blue eyes open, and he was looking up at the nursemaid. From Esme's point of view, it looked as if he were giving the woman the very same blinking, thoughtful glance he had given her. White hot jealousy stabbed her in the chest. That was her baby, her own sweet William. Give him to me, she said sharply. The wet nurse looked up, confused. She had William's head in position and was about to offer him her breast. Don't you dare nurse my baby, Esme said, her hands instinctively clenched into fists. Give me William this instant. Well, my goodness, the wet nurse said. You hired me, my lady. I changed my mind, Esme snapped. She was not going to have William think that anyone else was his mother. She would do everything for him that needed to be done, including feeding. The wet nurse pursed her lips, but she brought over the child. It doesn't come easily, nursing a child, she said. It's quite painful at the beginning, and there's many a woman who can't master the art of it, and ladies don't have the breasts for it, to tell the truth. I have the breasts for it, Esme said, with all the authority she could command. Now, if you'll just tell us how to do this, I'd like to give William his breakfast. If you don't mind my being blunt, Lady Bonington announced, that very idea makes me feel squeamish. A lady is more than a milk cow, Lady Rawlings. Oh, do go on, Honoratia, Arabella said impatiently. Don't you have something important to tell your son? Lady Bonington left the bedchamber, feeling a bit piqued. After all, Lady Rawlings was no relative of hers, and yet there she'd stayed for all of three hours, counselling her to greater efforts. It was quite likely due to her efforts that Lady Rawlings had managed to get through the bath so quickly. But, on the other hand, she couldn't have hoped for a better outcome. Lady Rawlings herself had identified the child's father— and that was all there was to it. Sebastian would have to acknowledge himself, free of responsibility now. He doesn't look a bit like you, the Marchioness told her son, with more than a twinge of satisfaction. He's bald as a belfry, just like his father. Miles Rawlings had hair until a few years ago, Sebastian pointed out. You wait until you see that child, his mother said rather gleefully. He is the image of his father. You needn't feel a moment's anxiety about whether you have a responsibility to him. You haven't. Lady Rawlings started weeping the moment she saw him, because the child has her husband's eyes. There's no doubt about it. Miles Rawlings has a posthumous son. Lady Bonington paused and looked at her son. He seemed a little pale. You're free, she said, 
rather more gently. He looked at her, and the expression in his eyes shocked her to the toes. I don't suppose she asked for me. No, his mother said, shaken. No, she didn't. She bit her lip as Sebastian turned about without another word and walked from the room. Could it be that he was more entangled with this woman than she thought? No. But it seemed that she had underestimated the amount to which Sebastian had hoped the child would be his own. I'll have to get that boy married off as soon as possible, the Martianist decided. To a girl from a large family, a woman who wouldn't be loath to have more than one child herself. Although if my future daughter-in-law shows the faintest interest in turning herself into a milk cow, I'll have to set her straight. There are some things that would never happen in the Bonington family, and that sort of ludicrously ill-bred behaviour was one of them. 28. In the Library Beatrix Lennox had made up her mind. She had dilly-dallied enough over the question of Stephen Fairfax Lacey. In fact, she had given him far too much importance in her life. She had never had the faintest wish to invite a man to her bed twice. Actually inviting one into her chamber was the best way she knew of to utterly blot out any future desire for his company. Dressing to seduce Stephen took her all afternoon. At the end, she was certain that she was utterly delectable. She was scented and polished and curled and coloured, every inch of her. She wore no corset and no cotton padding. Instead, she chose a gown that offered everything she had to the world in a burst of pagan enthusiasm. It was a French silk, shaded in a subdued blue-green colour, that turned her hair to flame. It was daringly low, and ornamented with ribbons of a slightly darker shade. There were very few covers at the table for dinner, of course. Esme apparently would not even rise from her bed for a matter of days or weeks. B paid Stephen almost no attention during the meal, allowing him to flirt as he wished with Helene, while Earl Godwin watched with a sardonic expression. She had no wish to engage in a noticeable competition with Helene. After all, just the previous evening, Helene had lavishly thanked Bee for her help in gaining Stephen's friendship. She would likely be somewhat startled if Bee snatched him back before her very eyes. When she sauntered into the salon after supper, the Earl and Countess were, naturally enough, already hammering away at the piano. Stephen's eyes darkened when he registered her gown. No matter how censorious the man might be about her face painting, he liked that dress. There wasn't a man alive who wouldn't like it. You look delicious, Arabella cried, holding out her hands. Trust my own bee to keep us from falling into country doldrums. If we spend too much time here, we're likely to stop dressing for dinner at all. Bee gave a faint shudder. The idea of wearing the same clothing through an entire day was intolerable. Bee, Helen called, looking up from the piano. Would you very much mind trying my waltz again? I would like to demonstrate it to Reese. Perfect. Bee turned around to find that Stephen was already at her side. His eyes were almost black, and she felt a surge of female triumph. Why shouldn't she woo if she wanted? Men had their way far too often in life, as it was. She dropped into a low curtsy, putting out her hand to Stephen. He bowed and straightened, kissing her hand. Then he paused for one second, gazing at her arm. B looked down. There was nothing odd about her arm. Are you quite all right? she asked. I had a sudden recollection of dancing with a young lady who shall remain unnamed, he said. She left marks of white powder all over my coat. B raised an eyebrow. This white is all my own. Their eyes caught for a second, and she let her smile tell him that the rest of her was just as white and just as unpowdered.
Then the music began. Helene had curbed the waltz's frenzied pace somewhat. It still rollicked, though. B was shivering with excitement. Now that she'd finally got herself to this point, she couldn't imagine why she'd ever wasted the previous fortnight thinking about it. Wooing. Wooing was like breathing for her. Why hadn't she seen that? She smiled at him and let just a hint of the desire that was pounding through her body show. Just a hint. He didn't respond, which was a little disappointing. All he did was swirl her into another series of long circles that carried them down the long length of the rose salon. B couldn't help it. The very feeling of his hand on her waist made her feel greedy. She edged closer. He seemed to push her away. Her heart was beating so fast that she could hardly hear the music. Have you joined the adoring hordes in the nursery? Stephen asked. And what would be the point of that? B wanted to shriek. Ladies such as herself never had children. They had men, not babies. She didn't want one anyway. William looked like a buttery little blob to her. The moment she peered at him, he started to cry, and the very sound put her teeth on edge. I'm not very maternal, she said. Stephen drew her into a sweeping circle. I don't seem to be developing a paternal side either, he said, once they were straight again. Helene is agog over that child. B didn't want to talk about Helene. She had to get this done. Mr. Fairfax Lacey, she said, and stopped. He bent his head, that dark head that was so beautifully shaped. Yes? If you would join me in the library, I should like to discuss a poem with you. His eyes were inscrutable. Yet surely he knew what she was saying. He'd told her to woo, after all. She managed to smile, but it was hardly a seductive triumph. Then she just waited, heart in her throat. I would very much like to finish reading you a poem, she said steadily, when he didn't respond. He raised an eyebrow. He looked ages older and more worldly than she. Perhaps he didn't feel the same sort of ravishing longing that she did. The Barnfield poem, she clarified. Ah. So when the waltz was over, she bid everyone good night and left the rose salon. She didn't look to see whether he followed, because if he didn't follow, she was going to cry, and then she was going to pretend that none of this had ever happened. In fact, she'd probably go to London the next morning and stay with friends. But he did follow. She walked into the library, Stephen behind her. He was mesmerized by the way Bee's hips swayed. It seemed to promise everything, that little swing and sway. Did you practice that walk? he asked, lighting the lamp with a candle from the mantelpiece. He had the oddest feeling of disappointment. She had invited him to an impromptu seduction. What else had he expected when he told her to woo? She was, after all, just what she appeared to be, remarkably available. He turned around, and she was smiling, nestled into the arm of a high-backed settee, like a wanton. What do you think? I think you're too damned practiced, he said bluntly. Her smile disappeared, and there was something uncertain in her eyes, almost diffident. He walked over. You needn't look like a little girl, denied a sweet. You can have any man you please. At the moment, I would like you. Trust B to go straight to the point. Her hair had the sheen of a feverish rose. Stephen had never felt anything like the lust he had at the moment. And yet, every civilized bone he had in his body fought it. She was a young, unmarried woman. He didn't succumb to such wiles. In fact, he realized with an almost visible start, he'd never been seduced. He had only seduced. It was a great deal more uncomfortable the other way around. She turned from him and picked up the small leather book on the table.
Shall I start with a poem which gave everyone so much excitement? she asked. There was a satin thread in her voice that made Stephen's entire body stiffen. Oh, would to God, so I might have my fee. My lips were honey, and thy mouth a bee. He couldn't stop himself. He drifted over to the settee. His will was strong enough that he didn't sit down, but he found himself leaning over the tall back, standing just at her shoulder. She looked up at him, a sparkling glance, and he found to his torment that this position merely gave him an excellent view of her breasts. They were a perfect white that had nothing to do with powder, not that snowy perfection. Then shouldst thou suck my sweet and my fair flower, that now is ripe and full of honey berries. Stephen could just make out the outline of Bee's nipples, puckered under the frail silk of her bodice. He gave in, reached a hand over her shoulder, and wantonly, deliberately, took one of her breasts in his hand. There was a gasp, and she stopped reading. But she didn't jump away or protest. That was disappointing, too. What a fool I am, he thought. Why not just enjoy what is being offered? Her breast was perfect. Somehow he'd thought it would be larger, fleshier. But it was flawlessly tender, an unsteady weight in his fingers. Full of honeyberries, he prompted. His voice was rough and unsteady. He supposed, dimly, that her other lovers had been more debonair, probably less. He couldn't pretend this was normal behavior for him, or normal desire, for that matter. Then would I lead thee to my pleasant bower, she said, and the quaver had moved from his to her voice. Filled full of grapes, of mulberries and cherries, then shouldst thou be my wasp, or else my bee, I would be thy hive, and thou my honey bee. He brought his other arm around her neck and took both breasts in his hands. She moaned, a throaty little sound, and dropped the book, arching her head back into the curve of his neck. He let his mouth play along her cheek. She smelled like lemons, clean and sweet, an English smell. Her ear was small and neatly placed against her head. In fact, her ear was like the rest of her, small, perfectly shaped, rounded, beautiful. He nipped it in anguish. Why did she have to be so, so beautiful and so available? Her arms were tangling in his hair, pulling his head closer to her mouth. The small gasps that fell from her lips didn't seem practiced. They sounded wrenched from her throat. God knows the hoarse sounds he kept swallowing were wrenched from his own chest. Her breast seemed to swell in his hands, and he hadn't even allowed himself to move his hands. B. His voice was hoarse and embarrassingly gruff. It sounded like an old man's voice. This time he managed to speak clearly. B. We cannot do this. Her eyes closed, and her arms fell from his hair. He lifted his hands from her breasts. What if someone walked into the library? He waited a second, but she didn't open her eyes. B, he asked. He was standing straight now, as straight as possible given the strain in his pantaloons. You may leave, she said. She didn't open her eyes. What? I'm going to sit here and pretend that you aren't a stick-in-the-mud Puritan, she said. I'm going to pretend that you actually had the courtesy to go through with the invitation that you ordered me to issue, if I remember correctly. Or is it a lack of guts that's the issue? That's incredibly vulgar, he said slowly. She opened her eyes. Mr. Fairfax Lacey, listen to me carefully. She seemed to be waiting for a response, so he nodded curtly. I can be far more vulgar than this, 
I am a vulgar woman, Mr. Fairfax Lacey. Her eyes were flashing, for all her voice was even. She was in a rage, and Stephen didn't know why that would make him feel better, but it did. Look at this, Mr. Puritan Lacey, she said, grabbing her bodice and pulling it down. Two perfectly shaped breasts, satin smooth, white velvet, fell free of her bodice. I am a vulgar woman, she said, emphasizing every word. I am the sort of woman who allows herself to be handled in the library by... He was at her side. No, you are not. His voice was dry, authoritative and utterly commanding. In one split second, he hauled her bodice so high over her breasts that it almost touched her collarbone. She narrowed her eyes. How dare you say what I am or am not? I know you, he said calmly, although his hands were shaking. You are no vulgar woman, B. Well, she said, obviously about to rush into a hundred examples, but he stopped her with a kiss. They drank each other, as if mana had fallen between them, as if kisses were the bread of life. You're worse he said against her lips a moment later. He felt them curve beneath his mouth, and he wanted her so fiercely that his entire body throbbed. It must be tiring being so much worse than vulgar, day and night. She could not answer, because his lips were crushing hers. And somehow his hands were back at her breasts. He brushed her nipple through the silk of her bodice, and she gasped. These must be your honeyberries, he said in her ear. That's so vulgar, she said, a hint of laughter in her voice. He yanked down her bodice, the mere inch that kept her nipple from the evening air, and flicked his tongue over it. She stiffened and clutched his shoulders so hard that he would likely have bruises. He did it again and again. Stephen, she whispered. Her voice didn't sound so practiced now. It was ragged and hoarse. Finally, his mouth closed over her breast. She arched against him, shaking all over. He felt a stab of pure arrogance. She may have slept with other men, but he couldn't believe that she reacted to them like this. Of course, that's exactly what every other man thought. I want to be courted, he said fiercely. What's the difference, she said. She sounded genuinely perplexed. I am not wooing you at this moment, Stephen said. I am seducing you. He ran a hand up her leg, past the sleek silk stocking and the slight bump of a garter. You need to learn the difference, B. His voice was rough with lust. His fingers trembled as they danced over the skin of her inner thighs. Closer, closer. She reached forward, pulling his hair toward her. Kiss me, she said, and her voice had an unsteadiness that sent his blood in a dizzying swell. So he kissed her, took her mouth with an untamed exuberance. At the very moment his fingers slipped into her warmth, pressed up and in with a strength that made her arch helplessly against him. She was ripe and plump, and it took every bit of strength he had to let his fingers drift where his body longed to be. To drive her mad, make her shudder under his hand, even as he drank her cries with his mouth. This is seduction, he said to her, and his voice was raw with it. He could feel the coil in her, feel the tension growing. She was so beautiful, trembling in his arms, coming closer and closer. Would you do this for me, he said fiercely. Her eyes opened. They were magnificent, drenched, beautiful. Of course, she choked. She reached out for him. Please. It's seduction. It's glorious. He made his fingers still, just stay there in the melting warmth.
Then, just as she was about to stir, he moved again. She gasped, and her body jerked against his. He stopped, and then pressed hard again. Stephen, don't, she cried. Don't, don't. He let his fingers take a rhythm then, and allowed himself, finally, to return to her lips, beautiful, dark, and swollen, not with false colours, but with kisses. She was writhing against him now, panting little bursts of air, a scream building in her. He could feel it, could feel an answering shout in his own chest, a desperate longing. She shuddered all over and clutched his shoulders so hard that he could feel her fingernails bite into his flesh, even through his coat. And then she was pliant in his arms, a sweet, curved, womanly body. He whispered into her hair. That was a seduction, B. There was silence in the library, and then she said, I think I guessed that, at some point. The thread of laughter in her voice would always be part of living with B. She didn't pull away from him, though. She stayed, nestled into his arm like a dove. He had to leave the room, or he'd lose his resolve. Stephen had the sense he was fighting the greatest battle of his life, his own enclosure act. He had to enclose her, keep her, marry her. And he had to make her understand that. I want more from you, he said into her ear. She opened her eyes rather drowsily and smiled at him. His blood licked like fire at the look in them. I'm amenable, she said sleekly. You don't know what I want, he pointed out. She blinked. Couldn't you teach me? I want to be courted, B. He watched her carefully. Not seduced. Wooed. Do I have to consult a dictionary? I hope not. May I escort you to your chamber? She was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen in his life, with her hair tumbling over her shoulders and a faint rosy colour high in her cheeks. It took every bit of self-control he had in his body to leave her at her bedchamber door. But he was playing for keeps. 29. Spousal Relations Candles were being snuffed in bedchambers all over the house. Rooms were sinking into darkness, into the pleasant intimacy that welcomes a lover's step, a silent kiss, a whispered invitation. But Rhys Holland, Earl Godwin, was hardly in a lover-like mood. He stared at the door to his bedchamber, grimly awaiting his wife. And wasn't that an irony, that he should feel such a revulsion of feeling, such a disinclination to even speak to the woman, that he felt like dashing out of the house and saddling a horse on the moment? But there it was. She was a viper, Helen was. She could say the merest thing to him, and it would sting to the bottom of his soul for days. And yet, he told himself again, he only wanted the best for her. Fairfax Lacey wasn't a man to stand by her during a divorce. It would ruin his career, for one thing. She was infatuated with the man, he could tell that. But it wouldn't last. Fairfax Lacey was naught more than a smooth-talking politician, a silver-tongued devil, as his grandmother would have said. He didn't look at her with much desire, either. Rhys had caught Fairfax Lacey, looking at Beatrix Lennox with real interest in his eyes. That was the crux of it. He himself had been a damned failure as a husband to Helene. Not that she'd been any good as a wife. But, presumably, she was bedding Fairfax Lacey, so perhaps it was only with him that she felt so... revolted. It was amazing to find that it still stung years later. Even now, when he saw her, he had the impulse to put on a cravat to cover any stray chest hair that might show. Because it disgusted her. She had said that again and again. Hairy beast, that he was.
Reese grimaced. What the hell was he even worrying about her for? She was a sharp-tongued little devil. Except he couldn't let her make the same mistake again. She needed to find a husband who'd be true to her this time. And Fairfax Lacey wasn't the one. Not with the licorice way he glanced at Lady Beatrix when no one was looking. He never looked at Helene that way. Oh, he was wooing her, teasing her with extravagant compliments about her moonlit hair and other such blather. But he didn't look at her with that smoky longing that a man looks at a woman he wants to bed. Can't bear not to bed, in fact. And yet she was obviously planning to ask for a divorce. Presumably Mr. M.P. thought he could get an act of Parliament allowing her to remarry. But if Helene married Fairfax Lacey, she'd find herself with yet another unfaithful husband. He, Reese, had allowed her to go her own way and find a consort of her own. He'd given her her own life back. But Mr. Proper Fairfax Lacey would never do that. No, he would dally with strumpets on the side, embarrassing Helene in public and private, but he'd never give her freedom to do the same. There was a scratching on the door, and it silently swung open. Reese marvelled for a moment. The doors in Lady Rawlings's house seemed to have been greased. They moved so quietly. Helene looked rather like a silvery ghost. She was muffled up in a thick dressing gown, looking as drearily proper as any matron in all England. Reese had to admit that he was rather glad she had found a consort. The burden of being the only adulterous one in their marriage was exhausting for his conscience. Forgive me for my informal attire, she told him. Her voice was cool, with just the faintest edge that told him that she expected him to be rude, vulgar even. She always thought he was vulgar. So he bowed and settled her in a chair with all the manners he could summon to mind. I've come to ask you for a divorce, she said abruptly. But I'm sure you've guessed that. Has Mr. Fairfax Lacey agreed to exposure as your consort? Perhaps the scepticism in his tone was audible. He will allow me to sue him for adultery. But she was shaking her head perfectly calmly. Oh, no, that might infringe upon his career. Stephen has a very important role in the government, in the life of the nation. We'll simply have to hire some man to stand in his place. Reese didn't have to think hard to know that a writer of comic operas wasn't considered important to the life of the nation. Shouldn't Fairfax Lacey be in session at this very moment, if he's so vital, he asked. Stephen is quite, quite exhausted by the ordeals of a recent parliamentary debate, Helen said, waving her hand in the air. Reese thought sourly about exhausted men and their proclivities to entertain themselves with other people's wives. Ah, exhausted. I see. You wouldn't understand, Reese. Stephen has a critical role in the house. He just finished orchestrating a tremendous battle against an enclosure act. That's when a rich man fences in land that was originally openly used for grazing by villagers. Stephen had to go against his own party. I know what an enclosure act is, Reese said irritably, and I fully understand that he is a worthy man. So it would be better for all concerned if we simply created evidence of my adultery. I don't see any reason for us to go to the tremendous expense of effecting a divorce, Reese said. Despite all his caution, he was starting to get angry. It was something about that martyr role that she played so well, as if he had ruined her life, whereas it was more the opposite. She had ruined his life. Her jaw set. I don't wish to be married to you any longer, Rhys. We can't all have what we want. And now you seem to have the best of all worlds, if you'll excuse a little plain speaking. You have the proper politician for a bit of kiss and tumble on the side, as well as the title of Countess and the very generous allowance I make you. I don't give a fig for the allowance, she said. Her eyes were glacial. No, I don't suppose you do.
He was losing his temper again. Damn it, but she had a way of getting under his skin. Because if you did, you might actually buy some clothing designed to appeal to a man. How the hell does Fairfax Lacey fight his way through that thing you're wearing? He eyed her thick woolen dressing gown. She raised her chin and squared her shoulders. She could have been wearing the mantle of a queen. The allowance, the title, they're nothing. It's a baby that I want, she said. And to Reese's horror, her voice wobbled. Helene and he never, ever showed vulnerability to each other. It was beyond possibility that he should comfort her. A baby? I believe you told me that before, he said, giving her time to gather herself together. Helene took a deep breath and leaned forward. She had to convince Reese. She simply had to. Never mind the fact that she had no intention of marrying Stephen. It took ages to obtain a divorce, and she could find someone else to marry during the process. Have you seen Esme's baby? she asked. Of course not. Why on earth would I venture into the nursery to peer at a newborn? William is the dearest little boy that you ever saw, Helen said trying vainly to convey the stab of longing that overtook her at the very sight of the baby. His eyes are lovely clear blue, and he looks at Esme so sweetly. I think he already knows who she is. Reese couldn't stand children. They mewled, spit, and vomited on a regular basis. They also created any manner of revolting odours without the slightest consideration for others in the room. Moreover, there was something about the slavish adoration in her voice that set his teeth on edge. A baby is unlikely in your situation, he said bluntly. You would do better to avoid the nursery if a mere visit sends you into this kind of transport of emotion. Helene had been smiling a little, but the smile withered immediately. Why not, she demanded. And what precisely do you mean by my situation? Reese was grateful to hear that her voice was not trembling now. She sounded more likely to garrote him on the spot. You would do better to simply accept the truth, he said. I have done so, I assure you. I have no hope of having an heir. Never mind the fact that he'd never wanted one. I think it is far better that we simply accept our situation. And that is? We're married to each other. And, obviously, our marriage isn't tenable. But no putative second husband has presented himself. Fairfax Lacey won't even stand by you during the divorce. Therefore, he's extremely unlikely to marry you afterwards. He would! Her voice was shrill now, but Reese far appreciated shrill over Terry. I doubt it. And frankly, my dear... He's eyeing that wanton little friend of Lady Withers. So even if he did obtain an act of Parliament allowing him to marry you, and I suppose, given his position, he has more chance of success than most men, he'd be as unfaithful to you as I am. Reese rather liked the way he'd summed up their situation. If you find a braver consort, I'd be happy to reconsider the idea of divorce, he added. Bloody hell! She exploded out of her chair like one of those Chinese firecrackers he'd seen in London. How bloody generous of you! You are the most stubborn, disgusting man in all England! I think I'm being perfectly reasonable, Reese said, staying right where he was. Surely husbands didn't have to follow that nonsense about standing up every time a lady did. Reasonable! You would be happier if you simply accepted the situation, he said. You bastard! That caught him on the roar. Don't you think that I would like something more? He roared. He bounded from his chair and grabbed her by the shoulders. Don't you think that I would like a real marriage? A wife I could love, could talk with, laugh with... For a second, she shrunk away from him, and then she raised her head and glared.
Am I responsible for that? No. You eloped with me when I was barely out of the schoolroom. I was barely of age myself, he said. We were fools together, Helen. Don't you see? He gave her a little shake. God knows. I'd love to take back the moment I asked you to elope. I wanted, want more from life than I have. I see Darby and Henrietta together, and I wish— He turned away. There was no point in continuing this subject. He sat down, plopping into the chair with a sense of exhaustion that took his whole being. There was silence in the room for a moment, and then, with a faint rustle of wool, she sat down opposite him. So, she said finally, you see your friend Darby and his new wife— and you wish for a more appropriate spouse. Someone as charming and beautiful as Henrietta, I gather. Whereas I see Esme's baby, and I feel equally envious. My only point, he said, feeling as tired as he ever had in his life, is that at some point one simply has to accept what's happened. I made a mistake, and God knows I've paid for it. You've paid for it, she whispered, incredulous. He could see her small fists clenched in her lap. I'm the one who lives to be ridiculed, to have everyone tell me about your, your opera singer. I'm the one who wants a child and will never be able to have one. I'm the one who can't even attract a man willing to face the scandal of marrying me. Your life is perfect. You have your music and your opera singer, and I don't believe for a moment that you really want Henrietta. She's not at all musical. I don't want Henrietta. I just want... I want what Darby has with his wife. Reese leaned his head back against the carved oak of his chair. Fool that I am. I want a woman's companionship. After that, they just sat there. Helene didn't say anything about the light his comment cast on his relationship with his opera singer, the woman living in Helene's own bedchamber. And Rhys didn't say anything about the fact that Helene herself had admitted that Fairfax Lacey didn't have the nerve to stand by her during a divorce. There had been precious few acts of kindness in this particular marriage, but sometimes silence can be the greatest kindness of all. Thirty, in the midst of the night. It was two o'clock in the morning, and Sebastian had only just managed to wave his mother off to her bedchamber. She had spent the evening babbling of balls and olmucks and other locales at which he was sure to meet an eligible wife. A fertile one, as she kept emphasizing. But he didn't want a wife, not even the fruitful woman his mother had set her heart on. Naturally, he couldn't visit Esme's bedchamber during the day. But now, was it late enough? Surely the child would be snug in the nursery, and that would leave Esme able to receive visitors. She'd been through an ordeal. He had to see her. He walked up the darkened stairs, feeling as cautious as a man rendezvousing with a new mistress. Esme's room was quite light, due to a roaring fire in the grate. Esme herself was sitting in the middle of her bed, rocking back and forth, the baby in her arms. Her hair had fallen forward over her face, and she apparently didn't hear him come in. He closed the door softly. Esme, he whispered. Her whole body jerked, and she stared up at him. She looked so exhausted and drawn that Sebastian swallowed. He knew birth was difficult, but my God, she looked as if she'd been through the walls. And then he heard a thin wail. Esme shot him a look of pure rage and turned to the child. Miraculously, the anger dropped away, and her face turned to an expression of pure adoration. She started cooing at the baby and smiling at him and dusting his little face with kisses. Naturally, the child stopped crying immediately even more so when Esme offered him her breast. Sebastian sat down next to the bed, 
and watched as moonlight washed over Esme's tumbling hair, her breast, the baby's little hand holding her finger as he suckled. Surely it was wrong to feel such longing to be part of the group. But he did. He wanted to climb onto the bed, to help position William at her breast, to... to be there. He seems to be a good-natured child, Sebastian ventured, once Esme had tucked William over her shoulder and was patting his back. Her eyes flashed at him. He's very delicate. I shall have to be quite careful that he doesn't take cold. Sebastian watched William's chubby legs kicking. He is delicate. Esme nodded as William gave a burp. He sounds like one of the lads down at the tavern, Sebastian said. William looked at him with a beery expression. He even looks drunk. He does not, Esme said indignantly. But, Sebastian, don't you think he's the image of Miles? I knew he would be. I just knew he would be. To Sebastian, William looked like most of the babies he'd seen in his life. Bald, round, and red. Yes, he looked like Miles. But then all babies looked like Miles. I have blue eyes, he said, unable to stop himself. Not that azure blue, Esme said. And it's not the colour that matters anyway. It's the way he looks at one, with such a deep sweetness, just like Miles. He's the sweetest boy in the whole world, aren't you? And she gathered little William up into her arms and kissed him all over his face again. Now he has to go to sleep, Esme said, looking expectantly at Sebastian. So he left. She likely thought he would leave the house as well. But no, he would stay. And his mother would have to stay as well, like it or not. If the Ton discovered the whereabouts of the notorious Marquis Bonington, the presence of his stodgy mother would likely dispel some suspicion. Or perhaps it wouldn't. He didn't really give a damn. William slept most of the following day, while Esme and Arabella hovered over the crib, pointing out the pink perfection of his toes and the sweetness of his round tummy. Esme was convinced he already knew who she was. That's a loving look, she told her aunt, when William finally opened his eyes. If you say so, Arabella said. I know it. Do you think William is warm enough? I think his cheek is a bit chilled. She felt it with the back of her hand and tucked his blankets around him even more securely. I'll ring the footman for another log, Arabella said, going to the other side of the room. That was one of the things that Esme loved about her aunt. Unlike the nursemaid, who was annoyingly contentious, and even her own nanny. Arabella never questioned Esme's judgment. Esme picked William up and put his little cheek against her own. It felt like the softest silk in the world. So your mother writes that she will visit at her earliest convenience, Arabella asked, coming back and fingering the delicate embroidery on William's coverlet. I'm so happy about it, Esme said. It was disappointing when she didn't visit during my confinement, but she can't help but love William. Arabella cast her a worried look. Of course Fanny will love William, but I just... Her voice trailed off. Don't worry, William will enchant her. Arabella took another glance at her niece's hopeful face and decided that she had to speak. I'm worried for you, Esme. Your mother has suffered many disappointments in her life, She's not always as agreeable as she could be. I know that, Esme said instantly. She had always been aware that she was her mother's primary trial. But William will make up for all that, don't you see? And of course, I'm going to be just the sort of daughter she always wished for. She won't have to be ashamed of me any more. Yes, I certainly hope that's the way of it. But you don't believe it. I'm afraid that you may be disappointed, Arabella admitted. I shall scream at Fanny if she hurts your feelings. But I just...
You mustn't worry so much. Truly, Mamma has always wished me to be respectable, and now I am. I'm living in Wiltshire like the virtuous widow I am. What more could she want? Fanny has a difficult nature. She spent a great deal of her adult life berating you for one thing or another, and I never approved of it, never. Esme gave her a rueful grin. It's not as if I didn't deserve it. I'm the first to say that my reputation was precisely as black as it deserved to be. But Fanny was disappointed, even before you grew into such a convenient whipping boy. When I was growing up with her, she was always finding fault with me as well. In fact, Fesme, my sister Fanny is a bit of a malcontent. Your grandfather used to call her Miss Tart, because of the way she pranced around the house with her mouth tight, finding fault with everyone. I know Mamma has had an onerous life, Esme said. She was tickling William through his blankets, and he looked as if he might start smiling any moment. But perhaps having a grandchild will transform some of her discouragement, especially if he starts smiling. Smile, William. Smile for Mamma. And he is beautiful. Even Sebastian said last night that— She stopped short and turned around to find Arabella looking at her and shaking her head. A woman after my own heart, Arabella said. I told you that living with a man was far more fun than living alone, didn't I? Esme bit her lip. Sebastian only. Never mind the details. What about Fairfax Lacey? When are you planning to drop that pretense? Not yet. Not until after my mother visits. The only reason she's making a visit is due to Lady Bonington telling her of my engagement. In that case, I would advise that you wait until night-time to entertain Bonington again. Lord knows if Honoratia Bonington found out that her son was making secret trips to your bedchamber, and you still in confinement, she'd likely shriek the roof down. Esme smiled a bit at that. I'm not worried about the Marchioness. It's mother, of course, whom I would prefer not to realize that Sebastian and I have a friendship. Naturally, Arabella agreed. We definitely do not wish for sainted Fanny to discover that you have a man visiting your bedchamber in the wee hours of the night. There's nothing salacious about his visits, Esme hastened to say. Arabella bent over the crib again, and Esme couldn't see her face. My first husband, Robbie, used to look at me the way Marquis Bonington looks at you. I don't think I remember him, Esme said. And Sebastian doesn't look at me in any particular fashion. Robbie died when you were a young girl. You likely never would have met him anyway. How he loathed your father. Were you very much in love? Esme asked. Too much, Arabella answered flatly. She turned around, and her smile was bright. Never fall in love, darling. It makes farewells utterly dreary. Esme didn't say anything to that nonsense, but just gave her a kiss. I can't be as angry at your mother as I'd like to be, Arabella said, with one of her lightning changes of conversation. Because I was so lucky with my first marriage, and she's so unlucky. Robbie was a sweet-hearted man. He died laughing, you know. We were riding in the country, and he was laughing at something I said. He wasn't paying attention, and his horse caught a rabbit hole. Oh, Arabella, Esme said, putting her arms around her. I only tell you because your memories of your father are undoubtedly as clear as mine, Arabella said. That man never laughed a day in his life. Being married to him was a terrible hardship, for all your mother won't acknowledge it. Terrible. I was allowed to choose my husband, as I was the homely sister. But Fanny went to the highest bidder. Don't you think that William will assuage some of her grief? I hope so, darling. I hope so. 31
a proposal. There was no saying when, if ever, Arabella might decide to return to London for the rest of the season. As far as B could see, Arabella spent every spare moment fussing over the baby's clothing and counting his toes. She and Esme hovered over that fat little creature as if it were made of spun sugar. Earl Godwin left. Lord Winnemore finally left as well. There was no one in the house to talk to, given that Helene and Stephen pounded away at the keyboard for hours. Not that it mattered much, because all B could think about was the Puritan, and his wish to be wooed rather than seduced. Wooed, whatever that meant. She headed off down the lane to visit the goat. It was very cold, and the wind was sprinkling small white flowers all over the lane, almost as if it were snowing. It could be a pear tree losing all its blossoms. Bee had almost made up her mind to try to find a book identifying plants. That was how boring she was becoming. When she rounded the bend, he was there. Bee slowed down. Wooing, wooing. She was no good at wooing. She was only good at seduction. Why didn't he understand that? Why didn't he know that she had nothing else to offer? She tramped up beside him and leaned on the fence without bothering to say hello. A large hand curled around her neck. B, he said. Why did he have to have a voice like that? Doesn't the Parliament miss you? she asked aimlessly, trying to take her attention away from that warm hand. It doesn't seem that way. According to the morning paper, they just passed a law giving poachers seven years' hard labour. I keep thinking of an old man named Maidstone, who lived on our estate when I was young. He was such a one, poached in my father's forest his entire life. It was an art to old Maidstone. My father sent me out with him to learn to shoot. I wish I could shoot, B said. My father didn't consider it a ladylike pursuit. Perhaps I'll teach you. The statement hung in the air between them. She finally risked a glance at him, and he was smiling at her. When you're my wife. She suddenly felt the splintering wood of the gate under her fingers. You are engaged already. You know as well as I do that the engagement is a temporary one, having naught to do with love, nor even desire. White petals had floated onto his dark hair. I could never marry you. I thought you understood that. You must have misunderstood. He moved closer and looked down at her. His eyes were flames, telling her something, but the misery in her heart was beating in her ears. Men like you don't take wives like me, she cried. Am I too old? Don't be a fool. He smiled a little. Too rigid? Something like that. It would destroy your career. I don't care about my career. Who will save the poachers from seven years' hard labor? Someone else, he said. I will go home and take care of Maidstone's son, who is undoubtedly poaching every pheasant I have in the world. You can't marry me. It seemed imperative to make him understand. I am ruined, Stephen. Her face was wet with tears, and she didn't even know where they had come from. Don't you understand that? And damn you for making me say it aloud. Why do you insist on being so cruel? I told you, you can have me. Her voice broke with the humiliation of it, and the truth of it. He stared at her, eyes veiled. You could have had me anywhere, she said brokenly. On the billiards table, in the library, anywhere. You're some sort of debauchee, aren't you? You just enjoy tormenting me. You don't even really want me. No. His voice was hard. That's not the case, and you know it be. I want you. He took her shoulders. I want you more than any other man has wanted you. But I don't want only your delectable body, or your mouth, or even the direction to your bedroom door. I want more, Bee, 
and if you can't give it to me, I don't want any of it. She stared ahead, and the goat's sharp little horns were blurred by her tears. I wish things were different, she said. I wish I weren't myself, or that myself was... No, you don't understand. I want you, with all your face paints and all your sultry glances and all your wicked poetry. I want you, just as you are, B. It was probably a tribute to her father that she didn't believe him for a moment. She cleared her throat. That is remarkably kind of you. I am honoured, truly. Of course, I might be even more honoured if you didn't already have a fiancé. But I appreciate your willingness to add me to the list. Stuff that, he said, and his voice was harsh and utterly unlike the smooth cadences that members were used to hearing in the house. Don't be honoured, he said fiercely. Be my wife. I can't do that. She turned and faced him, head high. I care for you too much. You may be exhausted by your position at the moment, but you will long for it after a few months. I don't see you spending your days fishing and befriending poachers, Stephen. After a month, even a year perhaps, you would yearn for your position back. And they'd never give it to you. Never. Not after you married me. I disagree, B. I could marry you and stay in Parliament. But I want to resign. If I grow bored in the country, I'll find something to do. But not Parliament. I don't want to think about votes again. I'd rather think about you. Leave, she said tersely, hanging onto the splintered boards with all her might. Just leave, Stephen. The smile fell from his face. Please leave, she whispered. 32. And Motherly Love, Part 2 Esme's mother arrived on a beautiful spring day, a week after her grandson's bath. Esme looked out her bedchamber window, and there it was, rounding the bend before the road to Chantal House, a squat, ugly carriage that she remembered from her childhood. The family used to travel to and from London in it. The seats were made of slippery horsehair and sloped upward. As a child, Esme constantly slid to the carriage floor, earning a scolding for her fidgety nature. William was sleeping in her arms, his long eyelashes curling against his cheek. I'll never make you ride in a carriage for hours, she whispered to him, and then rethought that promise. Well, perhaps only if we make many stops. Then she turned aside and rang the bell. My mother has arrived, she told Jeanie. I must change my clothing. I'll wear the grey morning gown with a white lace trim, the one with a small tippet, and I shall wear a cap as well, perhaps with a silver ribbon, so it matches. Jeanie looked surprised. But, madam, that gown is half mourning, and so heavy for this weather. Wouldn't she prefer to wear something more cheerful? Surely your lady mother will wish to see you more light-hearted. We don't even have such a thing as a silver ribbon in the house. No, the grey dress will be perfect. Fanny had worn full mourning for two years after Esme's father died. The least Esme could do was appear to have a virtue, even if she had it not. Shall I take Master William to the nursery? Jeanie said, once Esme was dressed in grey, complete with a lace cap, but no silver ribbon. I'll bring him downstairs with me. I'm certain my mother is quite eager to see her grandson. Of course she is, and he's the bonniest boy that's ever lived. She'll likely cry with pure joy. I know my mother would. When Esme entered the morning parlour, she found her mother seated with Marchioness Bonington and Arabella. To Esme's relief, B was nowhere to be seen. Esme had a secret fear that her mother would take affront at the idea of staying in the same house with her sister's dame de compagnie and leave without delay. She could see on the instant that Fanny and Arabella were already twitting at each other.
They were seated opposite each other, and Arabella had the look of someone who has just delivered a magnificent set-down. Fanny was shaking her head sadly, and looking at her younger sister, as if she were addled. Esme hurried across the room toward them. Fanny looked like an exquisite watercolour rendition of Arabella. Arabella's hair was ginger, Fanny's was a pale rose. Arabella's complexion was a tribute to French face paints. Fanny's face had a delicate bloom all her own. Arabella's face somehow just missed being beautiful, but Fanny had been acknowledged as flawless from the moment she'd toddled into her papa's arms. Mama, it is such a pleasure to see you, Esme cried. I've brought William, who is longing to meet his grandmother. All three ladies looked up. Her mother gave her the melancholy smile with which she always greeted her daughter, a perfect blend of responsibility and disappointment. Impulsively, Esme went to her knees beside her mother and folded the blanket back from around William's face so Fanny could see him. He was still sleeping peacefully, as beautiful a child as she'd ever seen. William was the one thing in life that Esme had done perfectly. But her mother looked at her rather than at William. Esme, she said, I must ask you to seat yourself properly. We are not en famille here. There is no need for such boisterous manners. Lady Bonington leaned forward. Please don't insist on convention on my account, Fanny dear. I find your daughter's affection for her child quite refreshing. Esme rose and seated herself next to her mother on the settee. Fanny raised her eyebrows slightly and then finally looked down at William. For a moment she stared at him in utter silence. Isn't he beautiful, Esme said, unable to stop herself. Isn't he the most darling baby you ever saw, Mamma? Her mother closed her eyes and put out a wavering hand, as if to push William away. He looks just like your brother, she murmured, turning her face away and shading her eyes. Her hand stayed in the air, shaking slightly with the strength of her emotion. Esme bit her lip. William doesn't resemble Benjamin so much, she ventured. Benjamin had such a lovely cap of black hair. Do you remember? Even when he was... Naturally, I remember every moment of my son's short life, her mother broke in. You do me great disservice, daughter, to suggest that I could forget the smallest detail of my little angel's face. She sat with her face shaded by her hand, overcome by grief. Esme was stricken into silence. She literally didn't know what to say. William is quite an adorable child, Arabella said. There was a crackling warning in her voice. And I do think that he has a look of his father rather than Esme. In fact, I would say that William is a spitting image of Miles Rawlings. Why don't you look at William more closely, Fanny? Esme's mother visibly shuddered. I couldn't. I just couldn't. She waved her slim white hand in the air. Please remove the child. I simply am not strong enough for this sort of blow. Not today. Perhaps when I am having a better day. Of course, Mamma, Esme said quietly, tucking William's blanket around his face. I'll take him back to the nursery. Give him to the footman, her mother instructed, sounding a bit stronger. I didn't come all the way to this house merely to watch you act like a servant. Esme had never given William to one of the servants, but she handed him over without a murmur. She should have realized how much pain the baby would cause her mother. No wonder Fanny hadn't attended her confinement. The whole event was undoubtedly too distressing to contemplate. As she returned to the parlor, Esme braced herself for the look of disapproval that always crossed her mother's face. But it was, miraculously, not there. Esme blinked and almost stumbled. Do come here, daughter, Fanny said, patting the seat next to her. Esme sat down next to her, careful to not allow her back to touch the back of the settee.
We were just discussing how much your cap suits you, Fanny said. I think you will find that a cap truly eases one's life. It does the necessary work of informing lecherous men that you are a woman of propriety and virtue. They never, ever make indecent proposals to a woman in a cap. Arabella looked at Esme with a faint smile. I've just told your mother that she needn't lend me one of hers. Fanny ignored that. And Lady Bonington has been regaling me with tales of your fiancé's devotion. I must say, he sounds like an estimable gentleman. What a shame that Mr. Fairfax Lacey stands to lose his courtesy title if the Duke of Girton's wife gives birth to a son. The Earl of Spade, isn't he? Of course, the Duchess may birth a girl. We shall have to hope for the best. Mr. Fairfax Lacey doesn't use his title, Esme murmured. But her mother swept on. It would be even better were the Earl to give up his seat in Parliament. The House of Commons is so very... common, is it not? Mr. Fairfax Lacey plans to resign his seat, Esme said. He wishes to spend more time on his estate. Her mother gave her a smile and patted her hand. I'm certain that you can effect the Earl's resignation without delay. I feel quite heartened by this news, dearest. I'm very glad to hear it, Mama. Perhaps you could marry by special license, her mother continued. That would be by far the more respectable choice. No one to gawk, as would happen in a public ceremony. Choice? What choice does she have? Arabella said and there was a distinct jaundiced note in her voice. Whether to remain a widowed woman or marry Mr. Fairfax Lacey immediately, Fanny said sharply. Given our plans to rehabilitate dear Esme's position in society, I tend to think that immediate marriage would not be frowned upon. What do you think, Honoratia? she asked the Marchioness. While I am naturally eager to see Lady Rawlings settled in such a beneficial position— Lady Bonington announced. I do not approve of marriages within the first twelve months of mourning. Esme breathed a sigh of relief. Arabella gave her a wink. You must be eager to find an appropriate spouse for your son, she said, turning to Lady Bonington. Since he has returned from the continent, I know there is no one of the slightest interest to him at this house party— but I'm quite certain that you must have some thoughts on the subject. Esme's mother stiffened. Clearly she had had no idea that her friend's disreputable son was even in the country, let alone in the very house in which she sat. May I ask, she said, her voice shrill. But Lady Bonington broke in. She was magnificently quelling, Esme had to admit. Fanny! There is no one in the world who deprecates my son's behavior more than I do. But I decided he had been in exile long enough. He has naturally attended me here. As a dutiful son, he is engaged in accompanying his mother wherever I wish to be. But this particular household is surely not the appropriate place to be, Fanny sputtered. Given the events of last summer— we do not speak of that, Lady Bonington said, with magnificent hauteur. Fanny snapped her mouth shut. Esme had to hide a smile. Perhaps she could learn something of Lady Bonington's technique herself. The events of last summer were grievous for everyone in this room. Lady Bonington gave Esme a little nod, and then turned back to Fanny. You must understand, Fanny, that I have decided to keep that boy on a very tight rein. Where I go, he goes. I found London entirely too stuffy and tedious this season, and I decided to retreat to the country. Fanny nodded. I agree with you. It is far too early for the Marquis to re-enter London society. But must he be here, in my daughter's house? No one could possibly question his presence, given that I am here, the dowager trumpeted. That is certainly true, Arabella put in merrily. And now that you are here as well, Fanny, 
This party is positively taking on the air of a wake. Your levity is repugnant, Fanny snapped. My only pleasure in making this visit is finding that my daughter has changed so much. She patted Esme's hand. You have become the daughter I always dreamed of. Yes, Esme has been remarkably silent, hasn't she? Arabella put in. Silence is a virtue that few women understand. Believe me, a virtuous silence is a far greater blessing than the kind of impudent chatter that you consider conversation, Fanny retorted. You must ask Esme to tell you about her sewing circle, Arabella said, standing up and shaking out her skirts. I'm afraid that the very sanctity of this room is wearying to such a devout Jezebel as myself. Esme felt an unhappy hiccup in the area of her heart. Fanny had leveled the same disapproving glare at her sister that she usually gave to her daughter. On the one hand, it was a pleasure not to be the target of her censure, but Esme didn't like to see Arabella slighted either. Aunt Arabella was a blessing to me during my confinement, she said after the door closed. I don't know what I would have done without her. Really? Fanny asked with languid disinterest. I can't imagine what that light-heeled sister of mine could possibly do to help anyone, except perhaps a womanizer. I doubt she would have any hesitation helping such a man. Esme blinked. She had never before realized the amount of vitriol that her mother felt toward her sister. In fact, Arabella was quite helpful during William's birth, she said cautiously. I knew you would see fit to reproach me for not attending you, Fanny said in a peevish voice. When you see how much pain it caused me to merely look at a young child, I wonder that you would even bring it up. I didn't mean to imply such a thing. Lady Bonington had been sitting silently, watching Fanny and Esme with a rather odd expression on her face. I will do Lady Withers the credit of saying that she was a source of strength to Lady Rawlings during the bath, much more so than I was. Fanny shuddered. You attended the bath, on Horatia. Why on earth would you put yourself through such an ordeal? Twas your daughter who went through an ordeal, Lady Bonington pointed out. I merely counselled from the bedside. Yes, well, Fanny said in a fretting tone of voice. Naturally, I am ecstatic if Arabella actually managed to summon up an ounce of family feeling. When has she ever thought of me? She simply made one short-lived marriage after another, and never a thought for my wishes in the matter. Aunt Arabella can hardly be blamed for the deaths of her husbands, Esme pointed out, and then wished that she hadn't opened her mouth. She drove them into their graves, Fanny spat. I grew up with a woman, and I've always known what she was like. Esme rose and rang the bell. Why don't I ask Slope to bring us some tea, she suggested. You must be exhausted after your long carriage ride, Mamma. As to that, I've been staying a mere hour or so from here, at dear Lady Pindlethorpe's house, her mother said. The season is just too tiring for someone my age, I find. Lady Pindlethorpe and I have had a perfectly lovely time in the past fortnight. We have so many interests in common. Esme turned around slowly. You mean you have been living at a short distance? But, but you could have come for a visit at any time. Fanny blinked at her. Not until I was quite certain that you had reformed, my dear. I would never risk my reputation, merely on dear Honoratia's assurance. Although, of course, I took her advice quite seriously. No, indeed. I will admit that I had quite given up hope of your reformation, as I believe I mentioned in my letter. I always thought you took after my sister, although naturally I am pleasantly surprised to find you so much changed. Esme's jaw set. I will not scream, she thought. She felt her face growing red with the effort of not lashing out at her mother. Lady Bonington seemed to guess 
because she quickly turned to Fanny and asked her if she would like to stroll among the roses in the conservatory. Only if I need not step a foot outside, Fanny said. I'm afraid that my poor departed angel, Benjamin, inherited his weak constitution from me. I take a chill at the slightest breath of wind. I'm virtually housebound these days, if you can believe it. Esme curtsied to her mother, walked up the stairs to her chambers, and jerked the cap off her head, so harshly that hairpins spilled on the floor. Throwing the cap on the floor didn't help. Neither did stepping on it. Neither did ripping off that horrible grey dress, with its foolish little lace tippet, that worked so well to give the wearer a nun-like air. None of it helped. She stood in the middle of her bedchamber, chest heaving with tears and pure rage. She had achieved it all, the sewing circle, the respectability, her mother's approval, Miles's wishes. Why did success make her feel so terribly enraged, and so terribly, terribly afraid at the same time? 33. In which the goat eats a notable piece of clothing. The irritating man hadn't left Chantal House, even after B had begged him. He stopped opportuning her and made no seductive moves. Instead, he played duets with Helene, which left B embroidering on the other side of the room and trying not to think about the Puritan. She stayed away from him. No more flirtatious glances, no more flirtation, period. Certainly, no more failed seductions. It was late morning, and they were gathered in Esme's morning parlour. Arabella and her sister were conducting a genteel squabble. Esme was presumably in the nursery. Naturally, Helene and Stephen were practising the piano. B sat by herself, stitching away on her tapestry. When Slope arrived with the morning post, B looked in the other direction. It was foolish of her to wish that one of her sisters would write. They had never answered her letters, and she was fairly certain that her father was intercepting them. Surely Rosalind would have written. They were only separated in age by a few years. Rosalind was to make her debut next year, and B wanted so much to tell her. Well, to tell her not to make her mistake. Or did she mean to tell her to follow her example? B kept thinking and thinking about it. On the one hand, it was grievously hard to turn down Stephen's marriage proposal, on the grounds that, by accepting, she would ruin his career. On the other hand, had she married whomever her father had seen fit to select as her husband, she would still have fallen in love with Stephen at some point. She was sure of that. So B bent over her tapestry and surreptitiously watched the way Stephen leaned toward Helene, the way their shoulders touched as they played. What would it mean to him to no longer be the estimable Member of Parliament? Would he be happy? If he were married, would he give up his mistresses, not to mention his supposed fiancée, Esme? Helene received a letter. I am going from pillar to post, she told Stephen. This is from my friend, Gina, asking me to visit her during her confinement. I gather you refer to the Duchess of Girton, Stephen said. At her nod, he added, Cam, her husband, is my cousin. Wonderful, B thought sourly, splendidly cosy. She and the Duke returned from Greece a few months ago, Helene was saying, and now they are living on their estate. Apparently Gina will be having a child this summer. She made a funny, rueful face. B bit her lip as Stephen put a comforting arm around Helene. They had the intimacy of an old married couple. I can't even bear to look at William, although I love him. The agony in Helene's voice mirrored that in B's heart. Nothing more was said, and after a moment Helene and Stephen returned to playing a Turkish march for four hands. B was sick of pieces written for four hands. She was sick of everything that had to do with one prim countess and one proper politician. Abruptly, she got up and walked out of the room.
she might as well visit the goat. She still kept a daily pilgrimage to the ungrateful beast, although she hadn't encountered Stephen again in the lane. He seemed to be avoiding the goat, as well as her. As she tramped down the lane, regardless of the mud clinging to her boots, Bee was actually beginning to think that perhaps she could live in the country. Some sort of wild rose grew over the hedges in the lane. They were pale pink and hung down like faded curtains. For the first time in her life, she had a sense of what happened in spring. A scraggly tree next to the road had broken out all over in white buds. They stuck out from the branches like the knotted ribbons on debutantes' slippers. And there were daisies growing all up and down the lane. Impulsively, Bee started gathering them. Finally, she took off her bonnet and filled it with daisies. It hardly mattered if her skin coloured in the sun. She could powder it white or powder it pink. The sun felt kind on her cheeks. Finally, she reached the end of the lane and leaned on the pasture gate. He was there, of course, the old reprobate. He trotted over and accepted a branch Bee gave him to chew. Bee even walked in his pasture sometimes. He never again tried to chew her clothing. She pushed open the gate and headed for the small twisted tree in the centre. There were no daisies in the pasture, of course. The goat presumably ate them the moment they poked up their heads. But the tree was in the sun and surrounded by a patch of grass. It was when she was sitting against the tree that she realised what she had to do. She had to go home. Go home. Back to her irate father, who wouldn't throw her out again if she promised to be a model of proper behaviour. And back to her sisters. She missed her sisters. She didn't want to play the voluptuary role any more, not after meeting Stephen. He made her game seem rather shabby and hollow, rather than excitingly original. Without really thinking about it, she picked all the daisies from her bonnet and braided a daisy chain, a rather drunken daisy chain that had a few stems sticking out at right angles. It was just the sort she used to make for her little sisters. Perhaps she would ask Arabella to send her home tomorrow morning. He was there, in front of her, before she even noticed his arrival. How you do sneak up on one, she snapped. You are the very picture of spring, he said, staring down at her. Bee allowed him a smile. She rather fancied that compliment, since she was wearing a horrendously expensive Marie Antoinette styled shepherdess dress that laced up the front and had frothy bits at the sides. Suddenly, he dropped onto his haunches in front of her, and she blinked at him. His eyes were dark, and... She reached out and touched his cheek. What's the matter, Stephen? Are you all right? She forgot they weren't on intimate terms, and that, in fact, she'd hardly spoken to him in virtually a week. No, I'm not, he said, rather jerkily. I've made rather a mess of my life. Why do you say that? B asked, taken aback. Because I asked a lady to woo me, he said, and the look in his eyes made her knees weak. Because I asked a lady to woo me, and she very properly refused. I was unfathomably stupid to ask such a thing. B bit her lip. Why? Don't say that you never wanted me, she prayed inside. But there was that something in his eyes that gave her hope. Because I should have said, seduce me, take me, please. B supposed that was her cue to leap on him like a starving animal, but she stayed where she was. Her heart was beating so fast that she almost couldn't feel her own disappointment. Wasn't this just what she wanted? Of course it was. You see, I need her any way she'll have me, Stephen said. His voice had lost all those liquid, rolling tones he used so well. It was almost hoarse. Any time she'll give me. I don't care. I won't make any demands. Bee couldn't quite meet his eyes.
She fidgeted with a ribbon on her parasol, tilting it slightly so that she couldn't see his face. I've decided to return to my father's house, she said, almost inaudibly. He was silent, and all she could hear was her own pulse beating in her throat, and the goat ambling away to the other side of the pasture. Am I too late, then? he said finally. There was a bleakness in his voice that wrenched her heart. She took the parasol and neatly closed it. He would always have a patrician's face. It was the face of an English gentleman, long chin and lean cheeks, laughter wrinkles around his eyes, tall, muscled body. He would wear well. She raised her eyelashes and gave him the most smouldering look she had in her repertoire. He made a hoarse sound in his voice and pulled her into his arms so fast that a parasol flew into the air. Will you be? Will you let me? He was plundering her mouth, and he couldn't seem to finish the sentence. Finally, he raised his mouth a fraction of an inch from hers, so close that she was almost touching his lips. His voice was husky. Will you seduce me, B? Or let me seduce you? She strained forward, trying to catch his mouth with hers, but he held back. Please! The urgency in his voice awed her. I was a fool to refuse you. I'll take anything, any little bit you'll give me. Of course you don't wish to woo me, marry me, but I'll take whatever you give me be. Please. She closed her eyes. One of the proudest gentlemen in the kingdom was literally, as well as metaphorically, at her feet. I didn't mean that, she whispered, clutching his shoulders as hard as she could. It's not that I don't wish to marry you. Hush, he said, rubbing his lips across hers. I know you don't want to marry me. I was a conceited fool to think you'd even consider me. But I don't care, B. Just, just seduce me, B. She could untangle this later. At the moment, she unwrapped her arms from his neck and smiled at him with a slumberous smile of Cleopatra. But what if I lead you to do things that are less than gentlemanly? You already have, he said. This is absolutely the first time in my life that I have begged a young, unmarried woman to seduce me. Oh, well, in that case, she said with a gurgle of laughter. Then she settled back against the tree trunk and, looking at him, very, very slowly raised the ruffled dimity of her skirt. She was wearing gossamer silk stockings with clocks, and her slender ankles were crossed. She pulled her skirts up just past her knee so that Stephen could see the pale blue stocking and its darker garter and then the pale cream of her thigh. She saw him swallow. B, what are you doing? he said, and the rasp in his voice was a warning. Seducing you? Her smile was blinding. He didn't seem to be able to stop staring at her legs. What if someone comes? No one ever comes down this lane, she said blissfully. It leads nowhere except to the goat. And you and I, Stephen, are the only persons who have ever shown interest in the goat. Just as deliberately, she uncrossed her legs and drew them slightly higher. Her skirt fell back against her thighs. And where is the damned goat? he said hoarsely. The other side of the field. Her knees came a little higher, and her skirt slid farther down, exposing smooth, milky thighs. If I touch you, B, there's no stopping this, Stephen said, meeting her eyes. Her heart tumbled in her chest. I wouldn't want to stop you. I never have. He put his hands gently on her ankles. Last chance, B. Are you sure you wish to make love in a goat's pasture? But she was laughing, and her eyes were shining. There was desire there, so that was all right.
and obviously she didn't mind the goat's pasture. So Stephen let his fingers wrap around that delicate little ankle, slide up the faint softness of her stockings. He stopped at the garters and untied them. They left angry red marks on her skin. She was watching him with a half-smile, but there was something uncertain there, too, for all she was such an accomplished seductress. He smoothed the red marks with his fingers. Why so ruthless with your poor skin, he said, as he lowered his head and ran his tongue along the groove in her leg. She gasped and squirmed in his hands. It's particularly difficult to keep stockings this flimsy from collapsing around my ankles. Ah, oh. he had his hands on both her knees now, and he pulled them apart. She resisted for a moment and then gave in. She was wearing some sort of fluttering gown that obediently fell back, as if it had been designed for outdoor games. Stephen ran a finger down the inside of her thigh. He stopped at a burst of lacy cotton, then ran his finger over all the fabric. She visibly shuddered and reached for him, but he pushed her back against the tree and knelt in front of her, between her raised knees, and pressed his lips there, on the inside of a quavering knee, and then let his lips drift down, down smooth ivory flesh. And all the time his finger was running inquisitively over the white cotton between her legs, dancing a little surface dance that made her hips jiggle a bit. He could hear her uneven little whoosh of breath, and it made him feel a steely wave of triumph, and then a wave of lust, so pure that he almost wrenched that cotton down. "'What do you call this?' he asked, and his voice came out hoarse. He put his hand between her legs, firm, and rocked forward. "'Oh,' she said, and her voice seemed very small. He ran his thumb under the frilly border. "'This?' Pantalettes, she said, quivering all over. He leaned forward and put a leg over her left knee so he was straddling her, and then he let that thumb sink, fall into sleek, hot folds. She'd been lying against the tree, as if she were too shocked to move, but that shudder woke her up. She reached out and pulled his head toward her. Her lips trembled under his and opened, and Stephen let his thumb take on the same rhythm as his tongue, although his chest felt like bursting for lack of air, or for the thumping of his heart in his chest. Her eyes fluttered open, and she was beautiful. This close, her eyes had the green of a rock glimpsed at the river bottom, greeny blue with small specks of light, all the more beautiful for being slightly glazed. Suddenly she focused on him. You seem to have forgotten that this is my seduction, she said. Her voice was such a deep purr that he almost didn't catch her meaning. But with one flip of her hip, she pushed his hand away and came up on her knees. Alas, her skirt fell down and covered her legs again. He reared up so he was facing her. Then he very, very deliberately took his thumb and rubbed it over his lips. She gasped in shock, and he felt a throb of pleasure. She wasn't so jaded then. He licked his lips, enjoying the faint taste of her. Stephen, she said. He grinned. But she was pulling at his neckcloth. She seemed to have some trouble undoing it, so finally he tossed it to the side and undid the placket on his shirt. It was her turn, then, to inch that shirt up his muscled abdomen. Her fingers were everywhere, delicate, admiring. The shirt billowed past his eyes and disappeared. Now her fingers were at his waist. But she couldn't seem to undo the buttons there, either. She looked so serious. I thought you'd make my clothes fly off like greased lightning, he said teasingly. But she didn't look up, so he pushed up her chin.
That was only a jest, B. In poor taste, to be sure, but a jest. I... Her eyes were larger, not so passionate now. Stephen felt a pang of pure fear. She'd changed her mind. She didn't want him. He was too old. I'm afraid I'll disappoint you, she said. Never. I don't... I don't have as much experience as you might think, she said, staring fixedly at his waistband as she tried to undo it. The very feeling of her fingers fumbling around his pantaloons was driving Stephen crazy. But once he registered what she'd said, he laughed. I don't care what kind of experience you've got, B. All I want is you. You. He pushed up her chin again. Her lips were swollen with his kisses. Oh, God, B. You're so beautiful. But she wasn't really listening. You see, I did. That is, there was Sandhurst, but it was only once, and I'm afraid I didn't learn very much, especially as we were interrupted by Lady Ditcher. And then I allowed Billy Laslett, but I didn't truly enjoy it towards the end, and so I told him to go. Stephen laughed. Are you trying to tell me that the bold seductress herself didn't find the experience pleasurable? B blushed. No, I did, although I wish I hadn't. Why? Because it would make me almost like a virgin, wouldn't it? Her eyes were shadowed. But I did, did enjoy it up to a point. I haven't liked... Well, that's irrelevant. I took another lover once, too. The last came out in a rush of admissions. So you see, I've had three lovers, but I never gave anyone a second chance, and I'm not certain that I actually learn very much, if you see what I mean. Stephen threw back his head and laughed, laughed so hard that four starlings and a wren flew out of the crooked tree and wheeled into the sunlight. When he looked back, she was still there, blinking at him, looking a little defensive, extraordinarily lovely, and far too young. B, you are over twenty-one, aren't you? he said. I'm twenty-three. Good. Are you trying to tell me that you won't let me have a second round? That one time with lovely B is all any man could hope to achieve. He let his hands settle on her waist. She blushed faintly. No, but he could hardly hear her. Because I want more, B. He lowered his head and brushed his mouth over hers. She opened to him, willing and shuddering. I'm going to take more, he told her. Her eyes closed and she wrapped her arms around his neck. Take me, Stephen. An invitation no man could refuse. He took over the job of removing his pantaloons himself, and threw off his boots and every other stitch of clothing he had on as well. She sat on the ground in front of him, mouth open. He laughed at her. The sun was warm on his shoulders, and under her eyes he had that sense of his body that he only seemed to have with her a sense of powerful muscle and a lean stomach. He came down on his haunches. She watched him in fascination, her eyes looking either at the powerful muscles in his thighs or between them. He wasn't quite sure, but she seemed to like what she saw. That faint blush in her cheeks had turned rosy. I can't believe you're quite naked in the outdoors, she said. She had a hand over her mouth, but giggles escaped. Your turn, he said, and her eyes grew serious. Oh, Stephen, I don't know. I wasn't thinking. She kept squealing. But Stephen was very good at removing ladies' clothing, and so he had her dress over her head in a moment, and her chemise followed. She wore no corset, to his great interest. He left her only that flimsy little garment she called her pantalettes,
a foolish little trifle of white cotton and lace. The sun threw dancing spots over her ivory skin, skipping shadows of dappled colour. Her face was quite rosy. She sat on the ground, with her hands covering her breasts, for all the world like a timid virgin. Though, of course, even an experienced courtesan might never have made love outdoors. He kneeled just before her and put his hands over hers. It's all right, love, he whispered. Truly, no one will come down the lane. It's not that. He peeled one of her hands away from the alluring curve of her breast. They were perfect, rosy-tipped, up-tilted, just the size for a man's hand. He bent his head and drew her nipple into his mouth, roughly for such a sweet bit of flesh. One hand flew away from her breast and curled around his neck instead. He couldn't play this game much longer. It had been too long, weeks of longing for her, watching her secretly, watching her openly, dreaming of her. He swept her up in one decisive moment and then put her down gently on top of his jacket. As he kissed her, he let one hand shape her breast so she strained into his hand, and he let his other hand pull down that bit of cotton she called a pantalette. She wasn't sure about that. What if someone— But her voice was melting. He moved down, kissed her breast in passing, until she squeaked out loud, until she writhed upwards, kept going further down her body, until he found her. Until he had all that sweet, lemony flesh in front of him, and she was moaning, all deep in her throat, and begging him, and begging him, and— She reached out, grabbed his hair, and yanked it hard. B could hardly breathe, because her whole body was on fire, but she knew there was a remedy here. There had to be, and his tormenting her was not going to be the answer. I want you, she said fiercely, having got his face where she could see it. It's your seduction, darling, he said. His lopsided grin made her heart somersault, and she almost forgot and just started kissing him again. Instead, she reached down and wrapped her fingers around him, and that did give her a shred of sanity. He was a great deal larger than Billy Laslett, and a great deal, well, firmer than Sandhurst. For a moment she froze. What if this wasn't possible? Billy had been difficult enough. It was embarrassing to have been a party to that encounter. She'd been phenomenally pleased when he'd stopped bucking about on top of her and taken himself away. But Stephen was smiling down at her, and he seemed to know exactly what she was thinking. He unwrapped her fingers and brought himself forward, nudging her knee out of the way. B couldn't help herself. She arched up to meet him. But he was just teasing her, bringing her that hardness, and taking it away again. She may not have learned much, but she had learned one thing, because Billy Laslett had asked her to. She brought her hands down from his neck, and deliberately brushed his flat nipples with her fingers. He jumped and arched forward for a moment, deliciously hard. How could she ever have thought that— but this wasn't the moment for comparisons. Instead, she gave him the same lazy, mischievous grin he gave her, and leaned forward and nipped him with her teeth. He groaned and drove forward. The rush of feeling was so exquisite that she flopped backwards and clutched his shoulders, and this time their eyes were serious. All right, he said, hardly able to recognize his own voice. And she nodded, clutching him so hard that he was going to have ten small bruises on his shoulders. He drove forward again. She cried out, unintelligible, the sound swallowed into the bright air. But it didn't seem to be pain she was registering. He bent to kiss her, 
and she made startled, gulping sounds, as if she thought he might lose his balance if he tried to do two things at once. He finally managed to coax her mouth open, but she kept trying to speak. What is it? he finally said, huskily. Nothing. Oh, don't stop that. Stephen smiled to himself. He pulled himself even higher and listened to her squeals floating into the meadow. After a bit, he came up on his knees and caught her slender hips in his hands. She gasped and said, No, and then said nothing. So he taught her that if she lifted her hips to meet him, that was very pleasant too. At some point, she really did seem to have something to say, so he stopped kissing her. Do you, she was panting, do you, could you just keep going a little longer? He grinned, a fiendish grin. I'm better at this than I am at billiards, he said. His voice was guttural, deep with desire. She was coming to meet him now, matching him. Her skin was gleaming with sweat in the sunlight. Stephen knew, at that exact moment, that his bee had experienced no real woman's pleasure with those other lovers of hers. She was a virgin, in all real senses of the word. He felt as if the raw joy burning in the back of his throat might explode, so he simply tucked back, concentrating on showing the woman he loved that she didn't know a thing about making love. Great waves of passion kept swamping the joy. Far off, in the distant recesses of his mind, not occupied by the sweet undulations of her body, with the way she panted with surprise and the way her eyes were squeezed tight now, as if she were going somewhere that couldn't be seen, he was conscious of two things. One was that his buttocks had never been exposed to an English summer, and they were definitely beginning to feel as if a sunburn might be in the offing. And the second was that that infernal goat had stolen Bee's dress and galloped to the other side of the field with yards of white lace falling from its mouth. But then even those bits of rational thought flew from him. He dove higher into her body, and she cried out, cries that spiralled, falling away into the bright air. Stephen ground his teeth and said hoarsely, Come on, Bee, come with me. And Bee opened her eyes and saw him poised above her, outlined in the indigo blue sky, her beautiful, proper Puritan. He stopped for a moment, bent his head, and crushed his mouth against her. I love you, he said hoarsely. My bee. She arched up to meet him, heard his groan, lost herself in the prism of sunshine and pleasure that rained on her, spiralling through her arms and legs, driving her against his chest, telling her without words the difference between wooing and seduction. 34. Yours till dawn. Esme, what's the matter? She was even whiter than when he'd seen her last, her face pallid and drawn. There was a gleaming trail of tears down her cheek. Is William all right? Sebastian sat down on the bed and peered at the babe. William looked just as moon-faced as he had last week. Long lashes brushed his cheeks, and he was snoring a little bit. Sebastian felt a funny sensation around his chest bone. He was a sweet-looking child, as children went. He's caught a cold, Esme said, her voice strangling on a sob. Sebastian could see that she had obviously been crying for a long time. He put an arm around her shoulder and peered down at William again. His rosy little lips opened in a snore. There, do you hear it? Esme said. He's snoring, Sebastian said. Did Miles snore? That's not a snore. He's caught a cold. Probably inflammation of the lung, Esme said, tears rolling down her face. <laughs>
Now, I'll only have him with me for a few days at most. I knew this would happen. I knew this would happen. Her voice rose to a near shriek. William stirred. He could hardly move. He was wrapped in so many blankets. I think he's hot, Esme continued, and the broken despair in her voice caught Sebastian's heart. She put a trembling hand to the baby's head. I keep feeling his head, and one moment I think he's caught a fever, and the next he seems to be perfectly all right. What do you think, Sebastian? Well, I'm hardly an expert. He cautiously felt William's forehead. It felt sweaty to him. Do you think he might be wearing a few too many blankets? There's quite a fire in here, after all. No, no, Esme said, tucking his blankets around him even more securely. Why don't you ask your nanny? Sebastian asked, inspired. I sent her to bed. She's too old to be awake at night. The nursemaid, then. Surely you have some help at night. I sent the woman away. She just didn't understand babies. She didn't understand William, not at all. She never forgave me for nursing him myself, and she was always trying to bathe him in the midst of a cold draught. Oh, Sebastian said. He fished in his pocket and pulled out a handkerchief. Esme wiped her eyes. She kept talking about strengthening him, but William is far too frail to be exposed to draughts or to the fresh air. Why, she actually wanted to take him outdoors. She was being grossly imprudent, and I had to tell her so. She sniffed, and a few more tears rolled down her cheeks. And then, and then she said that William was as fat as a pork chop and didn't have a cold at all. It was as if she'd never been around babies at all. Any fool could hear that William was having trouble breathing when he's asleep. William snored peacefully. Sebastian looked closely at Esme and was shocked. All the generous lushness in her face was gone, replaced by a drawn exhaustion and a brutal whiteness. Poor darling, he said. You're all topped out, aren't you? It's just that it's so tiring. No one understands William. No one. Even Nanny keeps saying he's a brawny boy, and I should just leave him in the nursery at night. But I can't do that, Sebastian. You must see that. What if he needed me? What if he were hungry? What if his cold worsened, or his blankets slipped? Sebastian pushed himself back against the headboard, and then gently pulled Esme into his arms. She leaned back with a great, racking sigh, her head falling on his shoulder. He's a bonny lad, he said. Yes. She was utterly exhausted. He could see violet shadows under her eyes. Slowly, he curled an arm around her and eased her back more comfortably against his shoulder. Rest, he said softly. You shouldn't be here, she said, sitting up again. My mother? Well, surely you met my mother at dinner. She's come for a visit. Sebastian had decided not to say a word about Esme's mother. She can have no idea that I'm in your chamber. Rest, Esme. William snored on. After a few moments, Esme's long eyelashes fluttered closed, and her body relaxed against his. Sebastian waited for a few minutes more, eased her back against the pillows, and gently took William from her arms. Esme's eyes popped open. Make sure you hold his head up, she said blearily. Tuck in his blankets. I will, Sebastian said soothingly. Lie down. You mustn't forget to prop up his neck, she insisted. But she was already toppling to the side, her whole body a testament to acute exhaustion. Sebastian experimented cautiously for a moment and discovered what she was talking about. William's head seemed to be too heavy for his body. I hope you outgrow this problem, he told the baby, walking over to the rocking chair by the fire. Perhaps it was just because the child was sleeping. In the light thrown by the firelight, he could see two things.
One was that William was definitely overheated. His hair was damp with sweat, and his cheeks were rosy. But it didn't look like a fever. It looked as if four blankets were too much. He gently loosened some of the blankets, and it seemed to him that the baby was a little more comfortable. The second thing he noticed was that William did indeed look like Miles Rawlings. His eyes were closed, of course, but surely those were Miles's plump cheeks and Miles's rounded chin. Even the fact that William had no hair seemed evocative of Rawlings's balding state. So Sebastian, Marquis Bonington, rocked the baby in front of the fire and thought hard about how much he wanted the child to be his, because he hoped that if the child was his, Esme couldn't deny him fatherhood. But fatherhood wouldn't be enough, anyway. He looked over at the utterly silent mound of womanhood in the bed. He didn't want Esme as a wife, merely because she felt it necessary to give his son a father. He wanted Esme to love him for himself, love him so much that she braved scandal. It was almost comical. How on earth had it happened that he, an excruciatingly correct Marquis, whose ideas of propriety were so rigidly enforced, had ended up asking a lady to disregard social mores, cause a scandal of profound proportions, and marry him? And, more to the point, how was he to get her to that point? He knew instinctively that it was no use asking her to marry him again. She cared only for William at the moment. Somehow he had to bring her around to see him as a man again, and herself as a woman as well as a mother. Sebastian rocked and thought, and William snored. 35. Lady Beatrix Entertains since B had never allowed a gentleman to repeat the experience of bedding her, she had no idea whether she was expected to articulate a further invitation, or whether Stephen would take it for granted that he could knock at her bedchamber door. He had given no sign of his intentions over dinner, but fairness led her to admit that there was little he could have done since he was seated between Arabella and Fanny. The two ladies spent dinner hissing insults around his shoulders and ignoring his attempts at polite conversation. Bee's own enjoyment in the meal was dimmed when she distinctly heard Esme's mother reproach Arabella for allowing Bee to live in the same house with the pure little soul in the nursery. Bee clenched her fists at the memory. Could she possibly marry Stephen? She, with her tarnished reputation and a malevolent influence that apparently extended to babes in the nursery. She dismissed the thought for the four hundredth time. Tonight was just another seduction, not a wooing. And she had dressed for that seduction, or unrest, howsoever one wished to put it. After all, her flimsy negligee was, well, flimsy. And she was painted and perfumed and curled to within an inch of her life. The only thing that seemed to calm her was applying another layer of coal to her eyelashes, or adjusting the candles so that they fell on the bed just so. For a while she lay on the bed in a posture that displayed her entire body to its best advantage, but her stomach was jumping so much that she had to hop off the bed and pace. There was nothing to worry about. The candles were lit, and she was perfumed in every conceivable spot that he might wish to kiss. She'd even placed a glass of water next to the bed, as she'd felt appallingly thirsty after their encounter in the goat pasture. But should she have arranged two glasses of water there, offering him one, or would that look too rehearsed? By the time the knock came on her door— B was more overwrought than she'd ever been in her entire life. One moment, she creaked, flinging herself toward the center of the bed. To her horror, the edge of her trailing sleeves caught the glass of water. It arched through the air, splashing water as it flew, and ended up on the bed next to her hip. Damnation, B cried under her breath. There was another discreet knock on the door.
Of course Stephen didn't want to stand about in the corridor. What if he were seen by Helen, Esme, or, a rather more terrifying possibility, Esme's mother? Enter, she called hoarsely, rolling on top of the wet spot, and positioning herself on her side with a hand propping up her head. Her hair was falling in the right direction, to be enhanced by the pearl blue of her negligee, but she was uncomfortably aware of dampness soaking through the said garment. He walked through the door, looking as urbane and composed as if he often conducted this sort of excursion, which, of course, he did, be reminded herself. Stephen was the man with two mistresses and a fiancé, after all. "'Good evening, lovely Bee,' he said, closing the door and walking over to the bed. Bee cleared her throat. "'Good evening,' she managed, with reasonable serenity. She looked surreptitiously down her body, and was horrified to see that the silk of her negligee was apparently soaking up the water from her coverlet. Just at her hip there was a spreading patch of dark, greenish-looking silk. Quickly she pulled the silk behind her and rolled onto her back, so that her bottom covered the spilled water. "'And how are you, sir?' she said, smiling up at Stephen. He had seated himself on the side of the bed, and was looking at her with a rather quizzical expression. "'The better for seeing you,' he said. "'What was that in his eyes?' B wiggled a little. Her bottom was growing distinctly damp. Who would have thought there could be that much water in one glass? He leaned forward and dropped a kiss on her forehead. My word, that's a very elegant perfume you're wearing, he whispered against her cheek. He was hovering above her. Perhaps she should give him a kiss. She brushed her lips over his, but he pulled back suddenly and sneezed. B sat up, realizing as she did so that she was now damp all the way to the small of her back. If she didn't change clothing, she would be sneezing as well. Excuse me, he said, raising a hand on the bed and reaching into his pocket, presumably for a handkerchief. B shivered. His shoulders and the way his neck rose out of his shirt— who would have thought Stephen Fairfax Lacey was a symphony of muscle under all that linen? She was trembling, literally trembling, to take off his clothes again. She leaned toward him. I missed you during dinner, she said. The naked longing in her voice was rather embarrassing. Why hadn't he given her a proper kiss? He frowned, held up his hand and said, B, your coverlet appears to be rather damp. B bit her lip. I spilled a glass of water. Ah. He bent close to her again and sneezed. I'm sorry, he apologized. I'm terribly sorry to say that I... Achoo! You caught a chill in the pasture, B said, her heart sinking. Not I. He looked at her and smiled. For the first time since he entered the room, B felt a rush of confidence. His smile said volumes about the cut of her bodice. She shifted slightly, just enough so the neckline fell off her shoulder. The look in his eyes was dark and seductive. B quivered all over. Her knees suddenly felt weak, and her breath disappeared. A strong hand rounded her ankle, and the melting sensation crept up to her middle. He was on the bed now, leaning over her. B raised her arms to pull that hard body down on hers, and... He sneezed again. You are ill, B said with anguish as he pulled away again. Stephen almost wished he were. But there was no way he was leaving the room without tasting Bee's perfect little body. It's the perfume, he admitted. Bee's eyes widened. My perfume? He nodded. One moment, I shall... She scrambled off the bed and headed toward her dressing table and the pitcher of water that stood there. She began pouring water into a bowl. Stephen swallowed. The backside of her negligee was drenched. 
The wet silk clung to the middle of her back, clung to the round curve of her arse, to a secret curve that turned inward, drawing a man's eye. He was off the bed in a moment, splaying his hand across that sweet bottom, eyes meeting hers in the mirror. Stephen, she cried, shocked. Yes, B, he said with a grin, his fingers slipping over the wet silk, letting the cool fabric rumple against his fingers, against the smooth skin of her bottom, as he curved his fingers in and under. Silk met silky flesh, and her head fell back against his shoulder. Stephen reached around her with his free hand and scooped water from the bowl. This may be chilly, he murmured, opening his hand on the smooth column of her neck. Her eyes flew open, and she began to protest, but he had her now, wet silk over one breast and wet silk below, and both hands slipping and rubbing. Her head fell back again, and she made that little throaty moan he loved. It sounded different in the bedchamber than it had in the pasture, less thin, more deep with womanly delight. She was liquid in his arms, and the chilly silk was taking heat from her burning skin. She turned in his arms, and her curious eyes, always so vigilant, so watchful, so wicked, were dazed. He kissed her fiercely, and she begged him without words, so he cupped her bottom and pulled her hard against him. But he couldn't concentrate because of the damp perfume, so he pulled the negligee over her head in a moment, took more water, and used his fingers as a face cloth. He started at her neck, at the smooth skin just under her ears, water dripping from his fingers, shaping her body, singing over her skin, licking kisses from his fingers. Over her collarbone, down her arms, back to her breasts, further down. He was on his knees, and the water came with him, cooling her burning skin, until he worked his way up her legs, and there, then and there, his control snapped. B was throbbing so much that she felt unable to speak or move. She hardly noticed when he picked her up and put her down on the wet part of the bed. She scarcely realized that he had shed his clothing. She was too busy, twisting toward him. But then he was pushing her legs apart, and that dark head was there, and she was quivering, crying, pleading. Then he cupped her face in his hands and pressed his lips to hers, and she opened to him, as gladly as she wound her legs around him, as joyously as she surged against him, with as much urgency as she shattered around him. Waves of pleasure flooding to the very tips of her fingers. 36. Because it takes courage to admit a mistake. The following afternoon. Marchioness Bonington was having a most unusual sensation. It took on Horatia quite a while to identify precisely what it was. Not an incipient warning of gout— not an attack of indigestion, not a premonition that rain would soon fall. It wasn't until the gentlemen had retired to take port, and the ladies to take tea in Lady Rawlings's private sitting-room, that Sebastian's mother knew exactly why she had a queasy feeling in the back of her stomach. There was a chance, a slim chance, but a chance nonetheless, that she was making a mistake. An odd sensation, Honoratia considered, one with which she, for obvious reasons, had very little familiarity. Mistakes seemed to generate an oddly bilious sensation in her middle section. She had it every time she looked at Lady Rawlings, who joined them for supper on the first occasion since her child was born. She was astonishingly beautiful, that girl. Her skin had a magnolia creaminess to it, the ripeness on those lips didn't come from a bottle. Overall, though, the Marchioness thought that Esme Rawlings probably gained most of her appeal from her nature, from those clever, laughing remarks of hers, from the way her eyes lit up with pleasure 
when she mentioned her baby. Fanny clearly did not approve of her daughter's nature. She visibly stiffened every time Lady Rawlings laughed. Modulate your voice, my dear, Honoré had heard her snap during dinner. A lady finds little to laugh at in a strident fashion. I'm sorry, mother, Lady Rawlings had said instantly. She was trying so hard to make this reconciliation a success, but Honoratia thought the chances were slim. I find that dress rather unappealingly low in the chest, Fanny announced, as soon as the ladies seated themselves. Lady Rawlings gave the bodice of her gown an uneasy little tug. It's only because my bosom is enhanced by the situation. Yes, you have gained some flesh, Fanny said eyeing her up and down. Perhaps a brisk walk every morning. A diet of cucumbers and vinegar can be efficacious. Dear Mr. Brummel confided in me that even he has occasionally undertaken a slimming project. Oh, I couldn't do that, her daughter said with a smile. Mama, may I give you a lemon tartlet? Absolutely not. I never partake of sweets in the evening. And I certainly hope you won't take one yourself. Honoratia swallowed a smile, as Lady Rawlings quickly transferred the tartlet she was about to put on her own plate to that of Lady Godwin. Why should you not try a cucumber diet? Fanny insisted. I judge you to be in rather desperate need of a slimming plan. It's not advisable for nursing mothers to undertake such a drastic step. Lady Bonington had always counted herself dear friends with Fanny, but as it happened, this was the first time they had encountered each other at the same house party. It was a bit demoralizing to realize that after a mere two days, she already recognized the thin white lines that were appearing next to Fanny's mouth as a sign of temper. Helen, did I understand you to say that you are leaving us? Lady Rawlings said, turning to Lady Godwin. I'm afraid I must, Lady Godwin said quickly, demonstrating that she too had come to understand the signs that indicated Fanny's impending attack of temper. Gina, the Duchess of Girton, writes me that she is expecting a child, and she would be grateful for companionship. I am planning to take a carriage in two days, if you have no immediate need for my presence. Nursing mother! That must be some sort of witticism you thought up to horrify me, Fanny said acidly, ignoring her daughter's diversionary tactics. My stomach is positively turning at the very thought. And she looked it. Honoratia thought there was a fair chance that Fanny would lose her supper. Mama, perhaps we could discuss this at a later time, Lady Rawlings said pleadingly putting her arm on her mother's sleeve. She shook it off. I shall not be fobbed off, and I am certain that these ladies are as repulsed by what you said as I am. Honoratia took a sip of her tea. When Lady Rawlings first demanded to nurse her baby, she had been repulsed, certainly. The very idea of allowing a child to munch from one's private parts was instinctively revolting. But then, she had been in the nursery yesterday while Esme nursed William, and it was hard to reconcile that experience with her own repulsion. While I am quite glad to have utilized a nursemaid myself, she announced, I do not find Lady Rawlings's actions distasteful. Fanny flashed her a hostile look that had Honoratia stiffening. Didn't Fanny realize that she was a far lower rank than she, Marchioness Bonington? Why, it was pure kindness on her part that kept the friendship intact. Be that as it may, Fanny said with frigid severity. The majority of the polite world agrees with me. Are you telling me that the fleshy expanse of chest that you are exposing to the world is due to this unsavory practice, Esme? Lady Rawlings sipped her tea quietly. Yes, it is, Mamma. Honoratia had to admit, Esme Rawlings had backbone. Had I ever been blessed by a child, I hope I would have had the courage to be as excellent a mother as is Esme, Arabella put in.
her sister turned to her with the lowering look of a striking serpent. It was the will of God that you not be given children, and no more than you deserve. Arabella went pure white, rose from her chair, and walked out. There was no sound other than a faint swish of silk, and then the click of the door shutting behind her. That was most unkind, Lady Rawling said, looking straight at her mother. It was unworthy of you. I spoke the truth as I saw it. I would urge you to apologize to Aunt Arabella. She has a forgiving soul, and if you make haste, she may overlook your unkindness. Fanny merely took a sip of tea. There was a suppressed air of triumph about her. Now, she said brightly, you must all forgive us for this unwarranted display of poor judgment. I assure you that our family is not generally so rag-mannered. But her daughter was standing up. You will have to forgive me, she said to the company at large. Mamma, I know you will act as a hostess in my absence. I shall speak to my aunt. And she was gone. Fanny turned to Lady Beatrix Lennox. As my sister's dame de compagnie, she said with a sapient smile. Perhaps you would like to join her, given that my daughter seems to think that Lady Withers might be distressed. Lady Beatrix gave her a stony look and stood up, curtsying. I can think of little that would give me greater pleasure. Now we can be cosy, Fanny said, once the door closed again. I find the presence of impure women to be extremely trying on my nerves. One has such an impulse to help, and yet no help is ever enough. Once lost, a woman's reputation can never be recovered. She shook her head. I fear it is all a question of nature. Clearly, my daughter inherited my sister's disposition. That was the moment when Lady Bonington discovered what it felt like to have made a mistake. She accepted a tart from Fanny while she thought about it. Countess Godwin was a lovely, if rather pale, woman. Yet when she leaned forward, Honoratia caught her breath. In profile, the Countess looked like an accusing angel, a stone statue of St. Michael, standing at the gates of Paradise with a sword. "'I wish you to be the first to know,' she said, speaking with great precision. "'Oh,' Fanny said, looking a bit uneasy. "'I am having an affair with your daughter's fiancé, Mr. Fairfax Lacey. We enjoy each other in ecstatic union every night.' Fanny gasped. "'What a thing to say to me!' she said trilly. "'If it be sin to love Mr. Fairfax Lacey—' "'Well, then sin I,' retorted Lady Godwin. She stood up. "'I expect my presence will make you uncomfortable, so I shall leave.' Honoratia raised her eyebrows. There was something distinctly odd about the phrasing of Lady Godwin's parting shot— and as someone who'd watched many a marriage and many a sinful union, she doubted that Lady Godwin had ever experienced ecstatic union. Still, loyalty was an admirable quality, and Lady Godwin had it in spades. Fanny had stopped looking horror-struck, and was eating one of those lemon tartlets that she never consumed in the evening. They were left alone, two hardened old harridans with shining reputations— and not much else. Neither of them had had an illicit proposal in years. Fanny patted her mouth delicately. I wonder that you chose this house to retire from the season, dear Honoratia, she said. I leave tomorrow at dawn to return to Lady Pindlethorpe's house. I told Esme as much this morning, and now my mind is made up. You would be more than welcome to join me. Wouldn't you rather stay and make further acquaintance with your grandson? It's far, far too painful. My daughter has no understanding of the grief I still bear every time I think of my dear, departed son. And I am very much afraid that my initial qualms about my daughter's rehabilitation are entirely correct. 
I admire your generous nature, my dear, but you are far too optimistic. Are you aware that my daughter has no real idea whose child she birthed? Certainly not, Honoratia replied in her most quelling tone of voice. Surely, surely Esme's own mother wouldn't repeat such a vicious piece of gossip about her own daughter. Fanny took a bite of tartlet. I queried her on the matter most discreetly, you understand, through the post. She did not respond to my query, which speaks for itself, does it not? This tea is quite cold. She rang the bell. As I said, I would be more than welcome for your company tomorrow morning. Honoratia stood up. Fanny looked up, startled. Honoratia thumped her stick, and, sure enough, Fanny quailed with as much fear as any lazy housemaid. You will not say a word to anyone about your grandson's patrimony, she ordered. Well, naturally, I, Fanny said, flustered. I only tell you, as you are a very close friend. From this moment, we are not close friends, Honoratia said, pulling herself even straighter. In fact, we are not friends at all. If I ever hear a breath of scandal about your daughter or your grandson that has begun at your lips, Fanny, I shall ruin you. Fanny stared up at her, faded eyes wide. Do I make myself clear? Fanny jumped, but said nothing. Do I make myself clear? Honoratia said with the snap of a carnivorous turtle. Fanny twittered. I can't imagine why you'd think that I would ever do something as ill-bred as gossip about my daughter's debased circumstances. Then she faltered, seeing Honoratia's expression. I shall not, she said shrilly. Honoratia didn't bother with a reply. She just stumped over to the door and left Fanny there among the crumbs of lemon tarts and cooling cups of tea. 37. Nights of Ecstatic Union And then I said that we spend every night in ecstatic union with each other. Ecstatic what? Esme asked. Ecstatic union? It was the only thing that came to mind. It is a rather odd phrase, is it not? And then I quoted a bit of the poetry B lent me, the part being a sin to love. Your mother was quite horrified, Esme. Helen looked triumphant. Esme choked with laughter. She was sitting on her aunt's bed, arm wound around her aunt's neck. Helen was standing before them like a militant, raging angel. B was curled up on a little armchair to the side. You didn't have to do that, Arabella said damply, blotting a last few tears with a handkerchief. Drat! I've taken off all my face paint. I must look a veritable hag. You look beautiful, her niece said, giving her a squeeze. Fanny really doesn't mean to be so horrible, Arabella said. She's had a most difficult life. Yes, she does, Helen said firmly. I'm sorry, Lady Withers, but your sister is a truly poisonous woman. And I'm sorry for you too, Esme. Esme looked up with a rueful smile. And what a dreadful thing in a daughter to agree with you. But she didn't disagree either. Arabella gave a last sniff. I haven't cried for years, she said. So I suppose I was due for a bout of tears. Fanny's comments generally don't distress me very much. But Robbie and I did so want children. I thought perhaps when he died... Well, I didn't have my flux for months. And I thought that perhaps I carried a bit of Robbie with me. She gave another sniff. But finally the doctor said that it must have been due to grief. She wiped away some tears. What a wet blanket I've become! You're not a wet blanket, Esme said. You're one of the bravest people I know. Arabella chuckled damply.
Well, that's a new compliment for me. Thank you, my dear. Esme's own smile wavered. And the dearest as well. No mother could have helped me more than you have, Arabella, nor a sister more than you, Helene. She met their eyes, and now they were all a little teary. I couldn't have loved a child more than I love you, dearest, Arabella said. Helene sat down hard on Arabella's dressing table stool. Do you still feel a great deal of grief due to not having a child, Lady Withers, if you don't mind my asking? Arabella gave her an unsteady smile. It is not terrible, no, but it is a sadness to me, since I would have been delighted to be a mother. Yet just having the chance to be with William is very healing in that respect. Helene pressed her lips together. I want you all to know that I am going to have a child. Unexpectedly, B, who'd been sitting silently to the side, yelped, What? and then clapped her hand over her mouth. I'm sorry, it's none of my business. My dissipated husband returned to London, still refusing to divorce me, and I have decided to have a child, irrespective of my marital situation. If Rhys wishes to divorce me after the fact, on the ground of adultery, I truly don't give a bean. Would you then marry Mr. Fairfax Lacey? B asked. The strain in her voice made all three women look at her. Stephen? No, Helen said. Stephen has no aspirations to my hand, or bed, for that matter, although he was kind enough to pretend so before my husband. There was a pause. Are you going to marry him? B swallowed and then looked to Esme. Lady Rawlings has precedence. Esme laughed. I surrender my claim. Then I am, B said sedately. A smile was dawning on her face. I am going to marry him. Bravo, Arabella said, tossing her handkerchief onto her dressing table. I knew the man was good marrying material. Didn't I tell you so, dear, she said to Esme. I merely have to ask him, B put in. Helen blinked at her. Hasn't he asked you? Not in so many words. He wishes to be wooed. What an extraordinary thing, Helen said slowly. Do you know, I am coming to have an entirely different idea of how to behave around men. Arabella nodded. If you wish to have a child, you will need to move decisively. That's why I married so quickly after Robbie died. I wasn't in love, wasn't even in my right head, I think now. But I wanted a child. Mind you, it didn't work for me, but it might well for you. Helen nodded. You may not wish to acknowledge me in the future, she said, looking at Esme. I will create a tremendous scandal by having a child. Everyone in the polite world knows that I have no contact whatsoever with my husband. Esme stood up and gave her a fierce hug. You never deserted me, and I would never desert you. What would I have done without you and Arabella these past few months? Besides, I do believe I shall give up some of my aspirations to respectability. Thank goodness, Arabella said, with a world of meaning in her voice. Helen turned to B. I trust you don't mind my saying that you are very inspiring. I mean to copy down that poem, if you don't mind. Perhaps I shall have use for it another day. B grinned. As long as you are not planning to direct your invitation to Mr. Fairfax Lacey, you may use it as you please. How are you going to ask him to marry you? Esme asked, fascinated. B bit her lip. I only just this moment decided to do so. I really don't know. Poetry, Helen said positively. Obviously you must use poetry. Esme clapped her hands. We'll have a small party tomorrow night, just amongst ourselves, and we shall complete the poetry reading that we began.
That means I shall have to find an appropriate poem, B said. I suppose I'd better hie me to the library. She looked at Esme. You didn't read a poem at our last such reading. I haven't such a pressing need as yourself, Esme said lightly. Humph, Arabella snorted. That's one way of putting it. Esme frowned at her. Well, you've got an eligible man visiting your chambers on the sly, Arabella said irrepressibly. You might as well let her make an honest woman of you. Bee's eyes grew round. Which man? Arabella replied. The Marquis, naturally. Helen laughed. Oh, Esme, she said. You are truly infamous Esme, are you not? I most certainly am not, Esme said with dignity. But all her friends were laughing, so after a bit she gave in and laughed as well. 38. The Poetry Reading Mrs. Cable was rather scandalized to find that she was attending a poetry reading. But while inviting the sewing circle, Lady Rawlings had noted that she herself intended to read from the Bible, and Mrs. Cable had decided that encouragement of such a devout practice was a virtue. And, if she was honest, she was finding the presence of the scandalous Marquis Bonington rather enthralling. He was, well, wickedly attractive. Mrs. Cable secretly thought that she'd never seen anyone quite so mesmerizing, those dusky golden curls, and he had such a powerful body. Although she hardly put it to herself like that, in truth, Mrs. Cable had some difficulty dragging her eyes away. There certainly was enough to see at this particular gathering. She was absolutely certain that Lady Beatrix, for example, had reddened her lips, if not worse. Naturally, Lady Winifred was having the time of her life, trundling around the room with her dear friend Arabella. It was quite a sorrow to see how susceptible Lady Winifred was to the lures of the fashionably impure. And Mr. Barrett de Croc was almost as bad. He seemed to be fascinated by Lady Withers, and Mrs. Barrett de Croc had had to call her husband to heel quite sharply. Mrs. Cable looked with satisfaction at her own husband. He was sitting next to her, nursing his brandy, and looking stolidly bored. Mr. Cable had attended the reading only after bitter protest. He did not consider poetry to be palatable entertainment. Lady Rawlings clapped her hands. For those of you who have recently joined us, we have been entertaining ourselves in the evening by giving impromptu poetry readings. We shall have two readings this evening. First, Lady Beatrix will read a piece from Shakespeare, and then I shall read a piece from the Bible. Mrs. Cable felt cheered. She must have had an influence on the young widow. Shakespeare and the Bible. What could be more unexceptional than that? Lady Beatrix walked before the group and stood in front of the fireplace. She was wearing a dinner gown of moss silk in a bright rose colour. Of course, the bodice bared far more of her neck and bosom than Mrs. Cable considered acceptable. But Lady Beatrix looked nervous, which Mrs. Cable counted in her favour. A young lady entertaining a group of distinguished guests ought to be fairly shaking with fright. And, indeed, had she but known, B was literally trembling. She kept sneaking glances at Stephen, but he hadn't even smiled at her. There was nothing in his demeanour to indicate that he had spent virtually the whole of last night in her bed. I have chosen a dialogue, B told the assembled company. From Romeo and Juliet. An excellent choice, Lady Bonington commented. I am very fond of Mr. Shakespeare's works. I don't hold with those who criticise him for frivolity. I suppose you need a man for your dialogue, Esme said. Do choose a partner, B. My goodness, but Esme's eyes had a wicked suggestiveness to them, B thought. It would serve her right if she chose Marquis Bonington, if she stole Esme's supposedly unwanted suitor from under her nose.
Naturally, Esme was cushioned between the two most eligible men in the room. She had Stephen on her left, and Marquis Bonington on her right. But B didn't choose Bonington, of course. She turned to Stephen and gave him a melting smile. Mr. Fairfax Lacey, would you be so kind? His face gave nothing away. He came to his feet with easy grace and accepted the open book she handed him. We'll read from the balcony scene, she told him. Very good, very good, Lady Bonington trumpeted. I've always been fond of Wherefore Art Thou, Romeo? She turned to her son. Do you remember when we saw Edmund Keane perform as Romeo last year, dear? Sebastian frowned at her. He had the feeling that something quite important was happening, and, more important, it looked to be the kind of event that might derail Esme's patently artificial engagement to Fairfax Lacey. Lady Beatrix seemed to be a handful, but the way Fairfax Lacey was looking at her, he was ready to take on the task. Meanwhile, Stephen looked down at B and felt as if his heart would burst with pure exhilaration. She was wooing him. His own darling girl had decided to woo him. He glanced down at the book. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. His eyes told her silently the same things he read. She was his east, his sun, his life. But she hardly glanced at him, the silly girl, just kept looking at her book as if she might lose courage. B gripped her book as if holding its pages would force her fingers to stop trembling. She was doing it. She was stealing him, taking him, ruining him. Good night, good night, she said steadily. A sweet repose and rest come to thy heart as that within my breast. She risked a look at him. The tender smile in his eyes was all she ever wanted in life. She took a deep breath and kept reading until there it was before her. She glanced at the group watching, met Esme's laughing eyes and Helene's steady grey ones, Sebastian Bonington's sardonic, sympathetic gaze, and Lady Bonington's look of dawning understanding. Then she turned back to Stephen. She had no need of the book, so she closed it and put it to the side. If that thy bent of love be honourable, she said clearly, thy purpose marriage, send me word to-morrow. But his voice joined hers as he held out his hands. Where and what time thou wilt perform the rite, and all my fortunes at thy foot I'll lay, and follow thee, my lord, throughout the world. I will, Stephen said, smiling at her, in a way that broke her heart and mended it again, all in one moment. I will be, I will. You will, she asked with a wobbly smile, clinging to his hands. You will. What's that? Part of the play, Mr. Barrett to Croc said. Quite the actor, isn't he? I will marry you, Stephen said. His voice rang in the room. Bee's knees trembled with the shock of it. The smile on her lips was in her heart. She'd wooed a man. His mouth was hungry, violent, possessive, and she nestled into him like the very picture of... of a wife. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen said a moment later. He turned, his arm snug around Bee. May I present the future Mrs. Fairfax Lacey? Esme was laughing. Marquis Bonington bellowed. Good man! Even Lady Bonington gave a sedate little nod of her head, although she quickly turned to Esme. You would appear to have lost your fiancé, she observed. And then, how fortuitous that your mother left this morning. Yes, isn't it lucky, Esme said, smiling at her. Stephen pulled B away to sit next to him on the settee, where he could presumably whisper things in her ear, not meant for public discussion.
Esme straightened her shoulders. Her heart was hammering in her chest from nerves. I shall read from the Bible, she said, picking up the book from the table and walking to the front of the room. It was Miles's Bible that she carried, the family Bible, into which she had written William's name. But she had the feeling that Miles approved, almost as if he were there in the room, with his blue eyes and sweet smile. It is a pleasure to see a young widow immerse herself in the Lord's words, Mrs. Cable said loudly. I believe I have set an example in that respect. You're not a widow yet, her husband said sourly. Sebastian was the picture of sardonic boredom. Obviously, he thought that Esme was merely cultivating her sewing circle, quoting the Bible in the hopes of polishing her reputation. Esme swallowed. He was looking down at his drink, and all she could see was the dark gold of his hair. I shall read from the Song of Solomon, she said. Sebastian's head swung up sharply. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, she read, steadying her voice. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Didn't she say that she was going to read from the Bible? Mr. Barrett de Croc asked, in great confusion. Hush, Lady Bonington said. She was sitting bolt upright, her stick clutched in her hands. Her eyes were shining, and, wonder of wonders, she was smiling. Esme kept reading. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. Abruptly, Sebastian stood up. Mrs. Cable was looking at him. Esme looked at him, too, telling him the truth with every word she read. My beloved spake, and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. He strode toward her, skirting his mother's chair, the settee, Mrs. Cable sitting in rigid horror. For lo, the winter is past, Esme said softly, only for him. The rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth. He was there before her, taking the book away, taking her hands in his large ones. She looked up at him. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. His arms closed around her with hungry violence. A shudder ran through Esme's body as she lifted her mouth to his. How could she ever have thought that anything mattered more than Sebastian, her love, her deep centre, her heart. He tore his mouth from hers for a moment. I love you, he said hoarsely. Joy raced through Esme's body, sang between them. And I am sick with love for you, she said softly, repeating the beautiful old words of the ancient book. Mrs. Cable's mouth snapped shut. She grabbed her husband by the arm and hauled him to his feet. I am appalled, she hissed. Appalled! Lady Rawlings didn't heed her, crushed as she was into that degenerate Marquis's arms. Mrs. Cable could see what had happened. She had lost the battle for the widow's soul, yes, and the devil had won. Lust and lasciviousness ruled this house. We are leaving! She turned to go, and found her way blocked by Marchioness Bonington. I pity you, Mrs. Cable croaked, narrowing her eyes. But perhaps your son is well matched by such a light skirt. I dare say he is, the Marchioness replied. There was something in her eyes that gave Mrs. Cable pause. Surely you wish to give the happy couple your congratulations— before you leave so precipitously. But Mrs. Cable had a backbone to match the Marchioness's. I do not, she said, fixing her beady eyes on Lady Bonington. And if you would inform your dissolute daughter-in-law that her services are no longer desired in the sewing circle, I would be most grateful. The Marchioness stepped back, something to Mr. Cable's relief. He was beginning to fear that his wife—
would actually pummel the peeress of the realm. Oh, I should be most happy to fulfil your request, Lady Bonington said. The smile that played around the Marchioness's mouth so enraged Mrs. Cable that she didn't even realise for several hours that the rest of her sewing circle had not followed her from the room. Alas, it was the demise of that excellent institution. A month or so later, Mrs. Cable began a knitting circle, drawn from women in the village, priding herself on bringing the Lord's words to illiterate labourers. Without her leadership, the sewing circle drifted into dissolute activities, such as attending Lady Rawlings's wedding to the degenerate Marquis. Society noted that Lady Rawlings's mother did not attend, but the smiling presence of Marchioness Bonington and the weight of her formidable power in the tall established the marriage as the most fashionable event of the season. Rather more quietly, Lady Beatrix Lennox married Mr. Fairfax Lacey from her own house, with only her immediate family in attendance. It was rumoured that her only attendants were her sisters, and that they wore daisy chains on their heads, which sounded odd indeed. The newly wed couple returned to London, and by the time that society really noticed what had happened, and with whom, the new Mrs. Fairfax Lacey proved to have such powerful friends that hardly more than a murmur was heard of her blackened reputation. Besides, the Tory party quickly realised that she showed considerable potential as a political wife. Helene, Countess Godwin, travelled to attend her friend the Duchess of Girton's confinement. Through the whole summer and fall, she brooded on the child she was determined to have. By hook or by crook, with the help of her husband or without him. But that's a story for another day. The First Epilogue Plump as a Porker Esme started awake, as always, with a bolt of fear. Where was William? Was he all right? A second later she realised that what had woken her was a chuckle, a baby's chuckle. The curtains were open, and early sunlight was streaming into the room. Sebastian was standing in front of the window, wearing only pantaloons. His shoulders were a ravishing spread of muscles. And there, just peeking over his left shoulder, was a tiny curled fist waving in the air. A cascade of baby giggles erupted into the room. Sebastian was dancing William up and down on his arm. The question of chilly draughts leaped into Esme's throat. She never let William go anywhere near a window. But then, it felt as if high summer had come. Sebastian spun around, and William screamed with laughter. He was sitting on the crook of Sebastian's arm, and he wasn't even wearing a nappy. Esme's heart skipped a beat. She never took all William's clothes off at once. But the baby was clutching Sebastian's hair and squealing. Sebastian obligingly bounced him up into the air again. Esme found herself looking at a stunningly beautiful man, all muscles and smooth golden skin and tumbling curls. And then, suddenly, she looked at William. It was rather like looking sideways and suddenly catching sight of oneself in the mirror without recognising who it is because the naked man in her bedchamber was holding one of the fattest, healthiest, happiest babies she'd ever seen. That was William, her sickly, fragile son. Esme's mouth fell open. Sebastian still didn't know she was watching. He was holding William in the air and laughing up at him. Pudgy little legs kicked with delight. You love that, don't you, son, he said. And every time he jiggled William, the baby giggled and giggled, until Sebastian nestled him back against his chest. It was when Sebastian was kissing William's curls that he caught sight of Esme's wide eyes. He was clearly unsure of Esme's reaction to William's undressed state. He loves it, Esme, he said quickly. See? and he tickled William's plump little tummy.
Sure enough, William leaned back against his shoulder and giggled so hard that all his fat little bits shook with delight. And there were many parts jiggling. He is healthy, isn't he? Esme said with awe. He's a porker, Sebastian said. Oh, my goodness, Esme breathed. I just... I didn't... Sebastian brought William over to the bed. I promise you that he's not chilled, Esme. Not in the slightest. I never would have removed his clothes if I thought he might take a chill. William lay on the coverlet, kicking his legs and waving his arms, gleefully celebrating freedom from three layers of woolens. It's summer, Esme, Sebastian said gently. Roses are blooming in the arbor, and I do believe some exercise will do him good. He rolled the baby over. William squealed with delight and then poked up his large head inquisitively. He is gaining some control over his neck, Sebastian said, looking as pleased as if William had taken a top degree at Oxford University. Esme opened her mouth and stopped. The sun was shining down on the sturdy little baby's body, on his brown hair that was so like his father Miles's hair, onto his unsteady head, blue eyes blinking up at Sebastian, with precisely the sweetness that Miles had given to him. And there, at the very base of his spine, was a small spangled mark, a mark that hadn't been there at his birth, but was indubitably present now. Sebastian, she said quietly. There was something in her voice that made him turn to her immediately. Look. Sebastian stared at the bottom of his son's spine and didn't say a word. What do you think? I think it looks very much like the mark I have at the base of my spine, he said slowly. He looked puzzled rather than joyous. Then, after a moment, he laughed. I was right. He may have suddenly become my blood relation, but I already loved him with every bit of my heart. Esme looked up at him, eyes brimming. Oh, Sebastian, what would I ever do without you? He stared at her for a moment, and then a little crooked smile curled his mouth. I won't answer that, because it will never happen. William rolled over, his naked little arms waving in the air. His mamma and papa weren't watching him wave at the dust fairies playing in a ray of sunshine. They were locked in each other's arms, and his papa was kissing his mamma in that way he had, as if she were the most delectable, desirable, wonderful person in the world. And she was kissing him back, as if she would throw away the world and all its glories merely to be in his arms. William giggled again and kicked the air, scattering dust fairies like golden stars in all directions. The Second Epilogue, in which a Puritan loses his reputation. It was high summer. The air was heavy with dust and smoke, and the streets smelled of ripe manure. The odour crept into the houses of the very rich, even into an occasion as grand as Lady Trundlebridge's yearly ball, where bunches of lavender could do nothing for the stench. Poor! exclaimed the Honourable Gerard Bunge, as he held a heavily scented handkerchief to his nose. I cannot abide the end of the season. Even I must needs think of the country, and you know I loathe the very sight of sheep. I feel precisely the same way, his cousin, Lady Felicia Savile, sighed, fluttering her fan so quickly that it would have ruffled hair less severely tamed by a curling iron. London is simply abominable at the end of the season. She straightened and snapped shut her fan, making up her mind on the moment. I shall leave for the country tomorrow, Gerard. The season is over. This ball, for example, is unutterably tedious. Gerard nodded. Nothing left but the dregs of gossip, my dear. Did you catch a glimpse of Fairfax Lacey and his bride? A doomed marriage, she said with some satisfaction. Alas, 
Lady Felicia Savile was something of a personal expert on the subject. A man of such reputation, marrying the notorious Lady Beatrix. Her high-pitched laughter said it all. Do you know, I believe I saw Sandhurst earlier. Perhaps she will recommence her alliance now she is safely married. Given Lady Ditch's interruption, I would say their encounter left, shall we say, something to be desired. Gerard tittered appreciatively. You do have a way with the words, cousin. Look, Lady Beatrix is dancing with Lord Pilverton. She is rather exquisite. You can't fault Sandhurst for taste. But Felicia had never been fond of musing over other women's attractions, particularly those of women like Lady Beatrix, who appeared to have a flair for fashion rivalling her own. I should like to walk in the garden, Gerard, she commanded. My red heels, he protested. They're far too delicate for gravel paths. And far too out of fashion to protect. This year no one wears red heels other than yourself, although I haven't wanted to mention it. And she swept through the great double doors into the garden, her cousin reluctantly trailing behind her. They weren't the only people to escape the stuffy ballroom. The narrow little paths of Lady Trundlebridge's garden were fairly heaving with sweaty members of the aristocracy, their starched neckcloths hanging limply around their necks. Stephen Fairfax Lacey, for example, was striding down a path as if he could create a breath of fresh air just by moving quickly. B had talked him into giving up his pipe, and while he thought that it was a good idea, on the whole, there were moments when he longed for nothing more than the smell of Virginia tobacco. Thinking of B and pipes, he turned the corner and found himself face to face with... Sandhurst. B's Sandhurst, the man disreputable enough to seduce a young girl in a drawing room, the man who'd ruined B's reputation. Sandhurst was a sleek-looking man, with his hair swept into ordered curls and a quizzing glass strung on his chest by a silver chain. He took one look at Fairfax Lacey and didn't bother with prevarication. I offered to marry her, he said, his voice squeaking upward. Stephen didn't even hear him. He was stripping off his coat. There was a reason why he'd trained in Gentleman Jackson's boxing salon, day after day, for the past ten years. True, he hadn't known what it was, but now he realized. Mr. Fairfax Lacey, Sandhurst squealed, backing up. Couldn't we simply discuss this like gentlemen? Like what? Stephen asked, advancing on him with the slow, lethal tread of a wolf. Like gentlemen? Yes, Sandhurst gulped. You forfeited that title a few years ago, Stephen said, coming in with a swift uppercut. There was a satisfying thunk of fist on bone. Sandhurst reeled back, hand to his jaw. Fight! yelled an enthusiastic voice at Stephen's shoulder. He paid no mind. His arm shot out. A sledgehammer in Jackson's best manner. Sandhurst fell back, tripped, and landed on his arse. Stephen was conscious of a thrum of disappointment. Was the man simply going to stand there and play the part of a punching bag? He watched dispassionately as Sandhurst picked himself off the gravel. There was a growing circle around them in the shadowy garden, calling to each other to discover who was in the fight, hushing to a whisper as the relation between the two men was explained. A voice bellowed from behind Sandhurst. For God's sake, man, pull yourself together! Others joined in, rather like a crowd at a cockfight. Show yourself a man, Sandhurst! By God, you're nothing more than a nursling! A Molly! A... Stephen blanked the voices from his mind and watched his opponent, who was being goaded into a decent effort. He was pulling off his jacket with the air of a maddened bull. I think a knobber, Stephen thought. Yes, and then a left hook. And after that he dodged a hit, feigned right, launched a chop at Sandhurst's jaw.
took one himself in the right eye. Damn, now B would demand an explanation. The irritation he felt at that translated to his right arm, a leveller, and Sandhurst dropped to the ground like a fallen tree. Stephen nudged him with his foot to make sure he was completely out, looked up, and caught the eye of his hostess. She deliberately threw up her fan and said something Stephen couldn't hear to the lady beside her, who laughed shrilly and said, It's what comes naturally after associating with the House of Commons. He was picking up his coat when he felt a hand on his arm. Mr. Fairfax Lacey, said Lady Felicia Savile, her voice sweet as honey. Would you be so kind as to escort me to the house? Stephen bowed. Apparently barbarous, nay, common behaviour, was the way to this gentlewoman's heart. If you will allow me to replace my jacket, he said. Hardly the behaviour of the prudent man of Parliament, Felicia laughed up at him as they strolled back toward the house, quite as if nothing had taken place at all. You will be quite the man of the hour. I highly doubt that. I'm afraid Lady Trundlebridge did not appreciate my behaviour. He didn't feel like a member of Parliament. He felt damn near, exuberant. Felicia shrugged. You are defending your wife's honour. Any woman of sense must applaud you, sir. There was a flutter of warmth in Felicia's stomach when he smiled at her compliment. Perhaps once Lady Beatrix returned to her wandering ways, she could comfort Beatrix's neglected husband. Just inside the ballroom doors, Stephen bowed. If you will excuse me, Lady Felicia, I shall locate my wife. He walked away without a backward glance, leaving Felicia with her mouth all but hanging open. Why had she never noticed how muscled and attractive the man was? She turned to meet the curious eyes of one of her bosom friends. Did you see the fight itself? Penelope squealed. Is it true that he called Sandhurst a blathering blackguard? Felicia's eyes were still a little dreamy. Now there's a man worth having, she whispered to Penelope. He was like a medieval knight, protecting his wife's honour. He flattened Sandhurst. Do you think he means to keep it up? Penelope giggled. Unless marriage changes Lady Beatrix's nature, he's going to be a busy man. Felicia was watching his dark head as he made his way to the other side of the room. She'd be a fool to stray, she sighed. B was growing a little tired. Her shoes pinched loathsomely, and thanks to an overly energetic waltz, Pilverton had left a damp patch from his hand on the back of her gown. She turned gratefully at the sound of her husband's voice, and then gasped. Stephen, what on earth happened to you? But he was grinning. Nothing important. Are you ready to leave, my dear? It's damnably hot in here. Stephen, B said, her voice rising. You tell me this moment what you've been up to. Making a spectacle of myself, he told her obligingly. This fight in public. Shouldn't wonder if my reputation for tolerant debate isn't ruined. He said it with distinct relish, towing her out of the ballroom as he spoke. I think it's time to retire to the country. We can't go to the country yet, B said, stopping and looking up at him suspiciously. The house isn't closing session for at least a week. His eye was growing darker by the moment. Just who have you been tussling with? Don't tell me you actually resorted to blows over that enclosure act. He reached around behind her and opened the door to the library. When she was inside, he leaned against it and grinned at her. Something of the kind, he drawled. Really, B said, rather amused. It's hard to believe that solid, respectable members of Parliament can bring themselves to violence. And then, what on earth are you doing, Stephen? He had turned the key in the lock. I'm not a solid, respectable member, B. I'm resigning tomorrow morning, and I won't stand for re-election either.
there was a sound at his back. Someone wishes to enter, B observed. Stephen! For he was walking toward her with an unmistakably lustful glint in his eye. There was something tantalizing about the air of wild exuberance that hung around him. Did you take a blow to the head? B asked, her voice rising to a squeak. No, he said, and his voice was rich with laughter. There was a bang at the door. It's Fairfax Lacey, he bellowed. I'm in here kissing my wife. Go make yourself useful by telling Lady Trundlebridge. There was a sound of rapidly retreating footsteps, and then the room was quiet, but for the faint hum of the ball continuing on the other side of the house. Stephen Fairfax Lacey, his wife gasped. I'm a madman in love with my wife. He had her now, cupping her face in his hands. I do believe I shall make love to you at Lady Trundlebridge's ball, and ruin my reputation for once and for all. One hand slid to her breast, and that rush of melting pleasure that came at his slightest touch rushed down Bee's legs. He kissed her until she was limp, until he had backed her onto a couch, until she was gasping pink in the cheeks, almost, almost lost. Stephen, she said huskily, removing his hand, which had somehow managed to get under her gown and was touching her in a flagrantly ungentlemanly fashion. Darling, but he was busy. The necklines of Bee's gowns were so useful that he didn't know why he'd ever thought they were too low. They were perfect. She pushed at his shoulders. Something was prickling the back of her mind. Stephen, with whom precisely did you fight? He raised his head and looked at her. His right eye was almost swollen shut, but the gleam of desire was there. He feathered his lips over hers. Stephen! Sandhurst, he said obligingly. B gasped. We were fighting over an enclosure act, just as you guessed. I'm like all those nasty sheep farmers, B. You're mine. I've enclosed you. But, but... Hush, he said, and kissed her again. B looked up at him, and there were tears in her eyes. Oh, Stephen, she whispered. I love you. Can we go home now, B? We've been in London for a month and have been received everywhere. I've tramped off to the house and listened to asinine debates. Our marriage didn't ruin my career. In fact, with the way Lord Liverpool looks at you, I stand to be named to the Cabinet if I'm not smart enough to resign quickly. She smiled at him mistily. Are you saying I told you so? With any luck, I just ruined my career, he said, kissing her. Now, may we leave London, please? Shall we go home and chase each other around the billiards table and start a goat farm and perhaps a baby and make love in the pasture? B wanted to weep for the joy of it, for her luck in finding him, for the bliss of realizing he was right. He was right. She hadn't ruined his career. Oh, Stephen, she said huskily, I do love you. I made you woo me, he said, looking into her eyes. I think it's time that I courted you, don't you think? His arms closed around her, arms that would never abandon her and never let go. Flowers at dawn, he whispered into her ear. Daisy chains for lunch, champagne in your bath. B swallowed hard so she wouldn't cry. I love you, she said again. I think Romeo said it best, her husband said, brushing his lips over hers. You are, indeed, my love, my wife. A Note on Shakespeare and His Wilder Brethren the last words of a wild pursuit were written by Shakespeare and spoken by Romeo. I decided to close the novel with Romeo's farewell to his bride because Renaissance poetry 
is so important to this book as a whole. B uses Romeo and Juliet to propose to Stephen Fairfax Lacey. Esme uses the King James version of the Song of Solomon to propose to Sebastian Bonington. But the book is also punctuated by works far less known than these two famed pieces of love poetry. Richard Barnfield published only two books of verse, which appeared in 1594 and 1595, precisely when Romeo and Juliet was likely first performed. For their time, both Shakespeare's play and Barnfield's poetry were shockingly original. Juliet's proposal to Romeo, not to mention the speech in which he longs for their wedding night to begin, both startled and delighted London audiences. Romeo and Juliet was a howling success. Ten years later, young courtiers were still quoting the play to each other on the street. Its popularity is attested to by the fact that in 1607, a company of boys put on the stage a play called The Puritan, which contains a riotous parody of Juliet's balcony scene. Some lines from that play are used by Esme to poke fun at Romeo and Juliet, precisely as the original boy actors did back in 1607. Richard Barnfield's poetry was, in a different fashion, as shocking as Shakespeare's portrayal of Juliet. The book that B brings with her to Esme's house party was an odd amalgam of love poetry and narrative verse. Amongst the various odes and lyrics Barnfield wrote are some of the most beautiful, sensual, and explicit poems written before the twentieth century. As you can perhaps tell from the reaction Helene has to reading aloud a Barnfield poem, neither Renaissance nor Regency readers were accustomed to expressing in public a wish that my lips were honey and thy mouth a bee. I sometimes receive letters from readers contending that aristocrats living in the Regency period would have acted with propriety at all times, even in the privacy of their own bedchambers. I thought it well to present some poetry written over two hundred years before the regent took the throne. Barnfield may have been one of the first Englishmen to put this desire in print. He was neither the first nor the last to express it. This is Justine Eyre. We hope you have enjoyed this unabridged recording of A Wild Pursuit by Eloisa James. This program was produced by Tantor Media Incorporated. Executive Producer, Karen Jakonski. Text Copyright 2004 by Eloisa James. Production Copyright 2012 by HarperCollins Publishers. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.